Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Meeting to order. I recognize that all five commissioners are present. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Thompson, I think you have the invocation and the pledge. Which one did first? Invocation. Okay. Okay. Um, it's so cool that I get to pray before meeting. This is huge. This really is huge to me. Let's all bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I am so thankful that you have bestowed every, all of us to be in this same room together. They're going to make plans and we're going to do really great things for this county. I just pray that you will always make sure we keep our eyes focused on you and, and eliminate the distractions and always keep a peaceful heart, Lord, because we are all in this together. I just want to thank you for everyone that's here and the work they do and all the people behind the scenes that are real leaders of this community. We are truly blessed with some of the finest people I've met. Be with us through this meeting. Help us to always focus and do the right thing and do always the right thing the right way, not necessarily our way. In your precious name I pray. Amen. 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 Let's stand and honor our great flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I have the high honor of inviting our judicial partners here. And so uh, Judge Lambeth, uh, Judge Allen, if you guys would like to come up, uh, Sean Boone, Perfect. Meredith. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all, Chairman Paisley and uh, Mr. Haygood and the rest of the commission for inviting us here. We promise we're going to keep this to 10 minutes or less uh, because we know you have a busy agenda and we all have courts to get to. Uh, we wanted just to sort of give a COVID update. I, it, it dawned on me as I was thinking about this over the weekend. It's two weeks from now will be a whole year since we've had to completely modify our court system, uh, which just to me is crazy that it's a year already. Um, and we really wanted to highlight a couple of things. First of all, the incredible, and I, I want to really highlight the word incredible, cooperation and help that the county government has given us. I also want to talk just briefly about the cooperation among our leadership team. Uh, there have been some good things that have come out of COVID. Uh, those are two really big ones. The, the fact that we have uh, developed the working relationship with the county and with one another. Um, Brian Haygood is an amazing county manager, as y'all know, you don't need me to tell you that. Um, he and everyone on staff have done everything we've asked and have done it promptly, quickly, uh, and w without any haste, at all, without any hesitation at all. Um, Bruce Walker, you already, re you, I, I remember when I was just here in front of you guys a few weeks ago, Bruce received recognition that night, and I want to uh, let you know again, I mean, the technology changes we've had to make in upfitting all of our courtrooms and even including your we had the, the pleasure of using your commissioner's room for for a couple of hearings um, where the technology was so uh, so necessary in order to maintain our, our um, obligation under the North Carolina Constitution to remain open have courts open and folks to have to get their justice without favor denial or delay which is what we are charged to do um, we couldn't have done that without the technology help and continually the technology help. We're going to have another jury trial starting tomorrow morning up in the historic courthouse uh, where we will be using the technology uh, once again. Um, Joel Brooks has done an amazing job. I saw him uh, here earlier. Um, I mean, I'm telling you, we've had some times to go on the fly and say, I can remember at least twice one of our judges calling me and saying, I just want to report to you, this is already done, but just so you'll know, uh, had a great, both times, there's two different Greensboro attorneys, ironically, who had gotten phone calls in the middle of hearings, child custody hearings, 
that they had been potentially exposed from a client in Greensboro who had just received a positive COVID test. I, I mean, in the you know, literally calling them, doing contact tracing in the middle of a hearing. Uh, and, and the judges both times were able to go ahead and close things down. Joel, in a, at a moment's notice, and his team came up and did a full, complete fogging, as it called, of the courtroom and the whole areas to make certain that, that any virus that might be in the air was, was do our best to dissipate it. Um, and, and, we, and that's just one example. I mean, we, we have had multitudes of times when we needed the facilities folks to help us, including reconfiguring all of our courtrooms. I don't know if you ever walk through the courtrooms, but they're all socially distant. Uh, we have plexiglass. We have, we've always had all the PPE. We've never lacked for that, for, to have the sanitizer, the, uh, sometimes when we've needed them, the gloves for like evidence handling and things, um, uh, the face mask, everything in order to be able to keep our courts operating, and we have been able to. Um, the Michelle Mills and the health screeners, it, that's been a godsend when, when you all were able to help uh, fund that. Um, it just makes feel, people feel more comfortable uh, when they, they have their, their forehead temperature taken and they also ask the health questions and frankly every single day some people are screened out. Some people either have a fever uh, or are not able to answer those questions correctly. Uh, and so we're, we, we try real hard to keep the, the uh, uh, the virus out of the courthouse the best we can. Um, Sheriff Johnson, your people have done amazing work uh, in, in juggling uh, getting folks to and from the jail, doing so in a very safe manner where, where I think now anybody comes in gets quarantined immediately on a new arrest. Uh, we don't see them until we know they've had a, a negative COVID test. That's a lot of logistics going back and forth. And my goodness, what they have to deal with having all those folks living in close quarters at the jail uh, is, is nothing short of uh, miraculous that it hasn't, uh, that we've been able to, to maintain things. Um, I will tell you sort of the genesis of this. Uh, Brian and, and Chairman Paisley have, uh, have attended almost all. We also, the other thing is the, the four of us and many others meet every single Wednesday during lunch lately over Zoom. For a long time we would socially distance in our in our, one of our bigger rooms there in the uh, J.B. Allen Courthouse. But um, we meet every week. These guys have uh, have been part of those meetings and one of the things that came up a couple weeks ago and Judge Allen actually brought it up. We'd all gotten the same email. The, the state put out some statistics on just how far various counties are fo have fallen behind in the past year. We were on the good side of the ledger in a very big way uh, in our courts not falling behind uh, nearly as much as a lot of counties have. Now, that doesn't mean we haven't fallen behind some, clearly we, everybody has, but we are on the, by far the good side of the ledger. Um, so I just wanted to take a few minutes and, and, uh, and talk about those things and then, and then also just want to praise Judge Allen and the district court judges, uh, Sean Boone in the DA's office and Meredith Edwards in the clerk's office because We've had to move courtrooms every week. We've had to share courtrooms. We've had to, to sometimes hold court in spaces that we would not ordinarily. Everybody has been completely selfless in trying to, uh, to work so that we could have the most cases heard the safest way possible uh, during this past year. So I, I just I could not be more proud of Alamance County, uh, of the leadership, county government, and the judiciary. Um, so with that said, I'm going to I'm going to yield the floor to Judge Allen, and then I think uh, Clerk Edwards and, and D. A. Boone may just want to uh, say a few words too. But thank you guys so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, members, uh, commissioners. It's good to see y'all. I've seen quite a few of y'all over the last. Uh, a uh, few weeks on Zoom meetings. Uh, it's good to be here. I do want to reiterate everything that Judge Lambeth has said, and also I want to put in a uh, a praise to to Brian and all the county government and Sheriff's Department because I will sit in court and I'll tell someone your court date next time is courtroom B, but I can't tell you where it's going to be. It could be in physically courtroom B, it could be in the historic courthouse, it could be in J.B. Allen Superior Courtroom C. The bailiffs have been excellent in getting people where they need to go. Uh, also, just to let you know that uh, we are also looking at, I know Judge Lambert uh, a week or so ago presented about the ankle bracelets. Uh, we are also looking at, there's a, a 
uh, Caitlin's Courage, which is ankle bracelets for domestic violence offenders pre-trial. And it's uh, the technology that we have. We're looking at that, and we'll probably start implementing that after we get everything together. I just wanted to uh, let you know. And also, I want to let you know, I, go, I know people all over the state. And the cooperation with Alamance County and all the different entities in Alamance County, we are at top of the sh uh, top shelf. We are, everyone is envious of the way that we cooperate. And I want to tell each of y'all, thank you. And thank you. Thank you, thank you yes. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. I just want to take a brief moment to say thank you very much for the wonderful leadership you provide for our community and the excellent work of um, our county manager, Brian Haygood, Bruce Walker over IT, and Joel Brooks over facilities. We could not have been more blessed with the assistance. It was almost as if they were just immediate partners holding our hands. My office has not wanted for anything that these gentlemen have not helped to provide. And not only does that help us in our daily efforts, but it helps our citizens. Mm -hmm. And that's who we're all here to serve. And the change that we've seen just from March of last year to now March of this year, if we'd only known, but we were all guided through the process through excellent leadership, your own as well as uh, the three gentlemen I've mentioned and other county partners as well, um, Michelle and, and Scott, and I'm sure I'm leaving some folks out, but it's just such a blessing to be here and to be leading in this county, and I want to thank you for your leadership and participating with all of that. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good morning, and thank you for having us. Good morning. Good morning. Um, not just the, the manner in which uh, the county employees and county government has helped, but the demeanor. Um, I have aged five years in one year because of this, um, but I can tell you that uh, whenever the county employees come to do something, they do it with a smile, a humility that is, uh, that is a relief. So thank you, and, and they're all to be commended. Uh, just as far as our court system, just to give you some, some perspective, uh, I had the, a meeting with the, the district attorneys throughout the state uh, two Fridays ago. There are still courts that are not having trials, jury trials at this time, that haven't had them in a year. Mm -hmm. Except for state mandated closings, Alamance County courts have not been closed, I don't think, but for maybe a week. One week. Because we have an attitude of we have to keep the courts open, we have to keep moving, and you are to be, uh, and the county is to be commended for helping us to achieve that goal. Uh, we have, um, in the year's time, only missed one grand jury, and that was the first one after COVID. Beyond that, we distanced, we put the grand jury in the, in the jury lounge, we had everything ready. So cases have not fallen behind, and that's really important, not just to the people of this county, but to those who are charged, because they, they have a right to have their cases moved, and we have been doing it, you have been doing it. So I want to commend you, thank you, and thank the county. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure working with all of you guys and gals, gal, <laughs> and what a wonderful group working together we have. Just want to say thanks. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, they're now going to their respective courts uh, and only just a few minutes late thanks to everything they've continued to do. Thank you. Mr. Haygood, are you going to do the... I am. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, the next item on your agenda is a proclamation in honor of the 30th anniversary of the Women's Resource Center of Alamance County. And at this time, I'd like to call... Uh, Folks, we have folks present from the Women's Resource Center. If you'd like to come up to the podium, and I'm going to read the uh, proclamation, and then we'll get some pictures with you and ask the chair to come down, too. So I'll read the proclamation. Let me set aside a little bit. So it's proclamation honoring the 30th anniversary of the Women's Resource Center in Alamance County. Whereas the Women's Resource Center in Alamance County was formally approved with Articles of Incorporation on March 8, 1991, after having been established earlier by a small group of women who saw the need for the following resources. And, whereas the Women's Resource Center lessens the burdens of women in Alamance County, and whereas the Women's Resource Center provides a center where women may individually learn, grow, and find viable alternatives to their present situations, and whereas the Women's Resource Center provides an atmosphere where women who are committed to overcoming existing obstacles to their success 
and whereas the Women's Resource Center actively supports the development of stable, productive, and satisfying lifestyles for women, and whereas the Women's Resource Center provides supports for women in crisis periods and during periods of transition, and whereas the Women's Resource Center provides a new model for women-sponsored, community-oriented programs in the service of other women, and whereas the Women's Resource Center provides a clearinghouse of information for the women of Alamance County with such services as peer counseling, legal information, issues forums, leadership development, and information about health and housing, and now, therefore, be it resolved, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners congratulates the Women's Resource Center on 30 years of giving to the community and the women of Alamance County. This day, this is the first day of March 2021, Alamance County Board of Commissioners, and it uh, is signed by all commissioners. So, presented to you, and if you will, move with, if you will gather with the chair, we'll take some pictures of you. <laughs> I want to say thanks to all you guys. <laughs> I also want to add, I started practicing law 47 years ago. These guys were not in existence as an organization at that point. The last 30 years as an attorney, I have seen what they have done. The wonderful work. Thank you. strategic planning committee so we're planning for the next 30 years and it's just truly an honor to be the one that stands here to receive this but we stand on the shoulders of the women who started the organization they saw the need Becky Mock many of you know Becky in the community Tamala Gross Martha Smith B. Holt all saw the need for a women's resource center and we're only carrying on their vision and we are so grateful to the county, to all of you that, that serve us. Uh, some people say, Who, you know, what do you do? And it's, we serve the women that you know. A lot of people think it's those women, and they're different. But it's not. It's the people that you work with. It's the women in your church. It's your next door neighbor. It's in your community. It's my own personal story. I am my client. We serve all women in Alamance County, and there's something there for them, either as services, to volunteer, to give back. That's why we're here. And we thank you so much for this honor today. Thank you. time uh, commissioners we also have uh, life-saving awards to be presented by the Alamos County Sheriff's Office <clears throat> read a little bit about what these two great officers did this is a uh, Tracy Coble if you would step on up here sign the shirt this is on the afternoon of March 2nd, 2020, while Officer Tracy Coble was doing visitation, a woman came to the visitation window and asked if anyone knew CPR. She stated that a baby was choking in the lobby. At that time, Officer Coble went out to the lobby area, found the child, and gave him one to hand thrust to the child's back, which dislodged the candy that he was eating. When the candy was dislodged, the baby started crying and breathing on his own. Officer Coble returned to her normal duties of doing visitation. Her quick response and having the knowledge of what to do if a baby is choking, she is being recommended by the Alamance County Sheriff, recommended for the Alamance County Sheriff's Office Life Saving Award. And she is a wonderful officer with the Alamance County Sheriff's Office. Absolutely. For the life saving. Thank you, John. <laughs> it's still real. I can yeah, see it on your face. Mm -hmm. 
This will be one on your uniform showing your great, great expectations and what you've done. Saving the child. That child might grow up as a great man. And hopefully we'll be in an auction somewhere. That's right. Yeah. Maybe even Sheriff will help us so. <laughs> <laughs> Life Saving Award presented to Detention Officer Tracy Ann Coble for your actions on March 7, 2020 in saving a child's life. Thank you for your service. All right. No, please. <laughs> <laughs> Jasmine Lefeva, come on up here. There's another fine officer in Alameda County Sheriff's Office too, I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. On November 5th, 20, at approximately 21, 22 hours, Officer Lefeva entered K Block on third floor to perform a 15 minute security check on an inmate that was on suicide watch. While checking on the inmate, she saw that she was in some kind of distress and called for assistance on her radio. She then went back to the satellite to open the inmate's door to gain access to her. Officer Zativa then noticed that the inmate had a cloth face mask wrapped around her neck with a toothbrush wrapped up in it to tighten it up. The face mask had to be cut off of her while cutting with a cutting tool that was issued to the corporal that came to the third floor to give assistance on the call. The face mask was then cut off of her and medical then arrived to assist in the emergency. The inmate was coherent and then uh, was taken to medical by wheelchair for further evaluation. The inmate was then transferred to ARMC, uh, Alameda Regional Medical Center, to get a protocol for even further evaluation. Due to Officer Reyes, Zadiva performing her job duties as required and in a timely manner as expected she was able to find the inmate that had tried to harm herself thus saving her life that's great this is your life saving pen to be worn on your uniform to show people that you saved the life Thank you for your service. Thank you. It says life saving award presented attention officer Jasmine Reyes Zavalada for your actions in November 5th, 2020 in saving the life of an inmate. Thank you for your service. Someone lives today because of you. Folks like this in our county, how can we lose? Absolutely. Okay, at this point, um, we're going into our <coughs> public meeting uh, regarding the. Can you move down that? I think I'm going to do that afterwards. Mm -hmm. <coughs> They've changed it around. Oh, you yeah, did. Right. <clears throat> but I think we, are, we should do that anyway. You, I yeah, think you're right. Sure, yeah. All right. We're next going into our agenda. Uh, do we have a motion to approve to motion approve to the approve. agenda? Second. Yep. Have a motion to second. Any discussion? There being none. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. Carries unanimously. Thank you.
All right, now, we have a Hydo in place uh, that was changed dramatically October of this past year, uh, thanks in part to Commissioner Carter and the others that preceded us. Um, and at this point, we're discussing the snow camp area. Um, and Mr. Haygood, should we bring our, our planning director up next, or should we go straight into the agenda? Certainly, maybe uh, uh, if Tony could come up to the podium and just kind of refresh the commissioners where we are currently, what's going on right now at this moment. <coughs> Let me say one other thing, by the way. The rest of the agenda, um, and I see it, the registrar, registrar of D's here and so forth. If you want us to call you when we get through the public hearing, we'll do that. So you don't have to sit here for who knows how long, but you're welcome to stay. Uh, we'll do it either way, your choice. Okay, we can, uh, we can just go outside or go to the courtroom. Or, or go to your, your you're, what you're I have. Go in my office if you'd like to. I'm going to his office. <laughs> 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 or we can, or we can call you. Uh, you're what a half a block away. So, 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 so. <laughs> <laughs> Is that where we keep going? It's in a big bag. <laughs> Should we tell them to stay out of the snack? <laughs> <laughs> Too late. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Um, just a little background on the HIDO and where we are with that, or how we got to where we are, I guess. Um, when I came on board in 2018, um, a rock quarry had been approved through staff and through our ordinances. And at that point, it was brought to Commissioner's attention that there was a rock quarry approved. And that threw some information out and spawned some interest in what do we do with that? And is there anything we can adjust to our process is a little bit different. So we started that rewrite and really we've rewritten it three times. We did a draft and it was approved and then there were some concerns that came up so we did additional draft and that's that October 2020 that you're talking about. And then February we also um, updated to pull out solar farms out of the heavy industrial development ordinance. They now stand alone in their own ordinance with their own guidelines. And that all of that went through individual subcommittees, it went through planning board and then it came here. Um, after a legal review as well, legal sat on our committees with us to make sure we all the new laws and 160D were met and everything. So this is kind of the journey we've taken with our HIDO. So currently we have classes in our HIDO ordinance, which also gives us um, buffering and landscaping and everything. Uh, different types of classes have larger and smaller requirements for their buffering. Uh, we acknowledge environmental concerns in that ordinance as well. It goes through the planning board and then it comes here for a public hearing. However, the list of what the site plan requires, what the ordinance requires is a technical list. It's a technical review. When it gets to boards, the boards are really just looking at it to make sure what staff saw, it meets technical requirements that you all see the same thing. It's more of a technical approval. There's no real opinion in that approval when it gets to the board level. So, anybody have any questions? I don't want to bore you, but I'll give you any information you need. If um, if we can, I think we're going to hold you to the very end after the last public speaker, because mm -hmm. I know that I and some of the commissioners have uh, questions about cost and things of that sort, and possibly even other areas. But okay. um, if you can, and I hate to tell you to sit sit around. But <laughs> I'll just hang out. It's fine. It'll be perfect. Thanks so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Albright, do you have any direction for us in opening this meeting? Well, you need to vote to open it, and then after the comment, you can decide whether you're going to recess it or whether you have enough information to take a vote. And then you, well, you close the public hearing and then you enter into your discussions. All right. Commissioners, any comments before we open this portion of the meeting? There being none, do we have a motion to open the public hearing? I'll make, I'll make a motion to open it. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Again, unanimous. Thank you. Madam Clerk, do you have people lined up? Yes, we do have a couple callers on the line and some written comments. Um, we'll start with the callers on the line. 
Uh, and how approximately how many do you have if you know? Uh, six. 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 Excellent. Okay. Yes. We'd like to announce to all speakers that you have five minutes total, uh, and then to be fair to everyone, we will have to stop you after that time limit has expired. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. You're connected to the county commissioners meeting, and this is the portion during the meeting that we're having our public hearing. If you would state your name and county of residence and address and then begin your five minute comments. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes. This is the public hearing portion of the meeting. Could you please state your name, address, and county of residence, and then begin your five minute public hearing comments? Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jane Lee Hicks. I live in Alamance County at 1730 Quakenbush Road. Um, and I moved to Quakenbush Road in Snow Camp almost five years ago when I fell in love with this tranquil rural community. Over the past two years, since the proposed Snow Camp mine made its controversial entrance into our neighborhood, I have discovered how many of, our of my neighbors share my love for this community. We were shattered when we envisioned the impact of what a heavy industrial mining operation would mean to the air and water quality for our homes. Not to mention the fear of a potentially deadly explosion or groundwater contamination from a leak of petroleum products from the 58-year-old colonial pipeline that runs through the mining site as well as many of our properties. Over the past two years, the county commissioners shared our pain as we struggled with a deficient Heavy Industrial Development Ordinance, or HIDO, that provided no opportunity for public notification, comment, or appeal by community members for the impacts of this unwanted and unnecessary heavy industry. In response to our concerns for our health and safety, the prior Board of Commissioners did what they could to tighten the HIDO and ordered a new land development plan study intended to update the 2007 land development plan to address new issues and priorities and to function as the county's comprehensive plan. Stakeholders in the public and private sector were interviewed during this 12-month process and there were a number of opportunities for citizens to participate and provide feedback including online workshops and surveys, which are still available for viewing on the Alamance County Planning Facebook page. Part of the study was the small area vision, which includes a small area plan specifically for snow camp, focused on retaining the rural, agricultural, and residential makeup of our community, especially in light of the pending industrialization in neighboring Randolph and Chatham counties to our west and southwest. We are less than 15 miles from two North Carolina mega sites comprising more than 3,300 acres zoned for heavy industry. Without the protection of the small area plan, Snow Camp is a sitting duck for more polluting industries with minimal regulations to protect our rural, residential, and uniquely historic community. Following a full year of intensive studies, highly publicized community meetings and a planning board hearing, the Snow Camp Small Area Plan was accepted unanimously by the Board of Commissioners at yet another public hearing in November of 2020. We have unfortunately seen where clever land use attorneys who are adept at passing state legislation that favors industry are able to find workarounds our HIDA regulations. For that reason, our community needs the immediate protection provided by a moratorium on heavy industry permits in snow camp. 
of a sufficient duration to provide our new Board of Commissioners and any other community members the opportunity to fully understand and implement the Snow Camp Small Area Plan. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you on this important topic. Thank you. Thank and we you. thank you. Good morning, you're connected to the public hearing portion of the county commissioners meeting. If you could state your full name, address, county of residence, and then begin your five minutes. All right, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, this is Bill Poe, and I live at 1907 Quakenbush Road, Snow Camp, North Carolina, here in Mance County. And you all know me as a resident of Snow Camp and that I've been promoting and urging that our community maintain its rural integrity with its rich agricultural roots and its historical significance within the southwest part of our county for two plus years. I'm speaking today not as a member of the planning board or as a member of any other group that may be heard today. Rather, as a concerned independent citizen of the Snow Camp area with regard, care, and love for my neighbors. Throughout the past several years, while the citizens of Snow Camp have wrestled with the permitting of the Snow Camp quarry, I found myself on both sides of this issue. Landowner rights and public safety for the community as a whole. Both sides have legitimate arguments. Myself, growing up as a farm kid on a dairy farm, I absolutely love and respect the agricultural communities and the families that live and work there. While farming is a business, it's more than a way to make a living. It's a way of life that most will never get to experience or even begin to understand. My whole adult life, I've been involved with both the residential and commercial construction industries. While these industries have been very good to me and my family, I have also seen the destructive nature of these industries, how it can transform communities with unintended consequences. What is in front of our Snow Camp community, our county as a whole, and you as county commissioners is a mechanism, outbid an opportunity to promote controlled growth in and around our communities that would benefit all of its citizens. With growth and business along with environmental concern and agricultural protections, this proposed moratorium to allow into a deep dive into the proposed small area plan and potential agricultural overlays would allow protections from unbridled growth moving forward. The approved land development plan approved in November allowed for language of a small area plan for the snow camp community future small area plans in other locations within the county and additional agricultural overlays of protection. This, is not, this was not only recommended by the planning board, supported by the planning department, but also approved by the Board of County Commissioners. This proposed moratorium that we are discussing today is a natural next steps to design protections for growth in areas of concern and small area plans for the communities and for their citizens' voices to be heard of how and what is developed within their community. The concerns of land planning are legitimate. People can relate to government overreach as one potential concern. This small area plan for snow camp and the agricultural overlays outlined in the approved land development plan are to support landowner rights, not hurt them. The most significant language within the approved land development plan is that agriculture is exempt from challenges of a potential ordinance. The approved land development plan would be part of design controlled growth, not to prohibit growth. Growth and change are a natural part of life. However, growth unchecked can be devastating. This land plan for Snow Camp is not designed to interpret how land is to be used. It's to design growth in the areas that make the most sense and where each community would recommend growth to take place. 
No one is suggesting that this Board of County Commissioners to tell us or any individual on how and what their land is to be used for. This small area plan ordinance would be to protect everyone's rights as landowners. With input of the community moving forward, this plan design would evaluate specific growth for the future. In conclusion, it is time for this ordinance to move forward and to approve this proposed moratorium for up to a year, if necessary, to provide adequate time to develop this land development ordinance. Think of our children's future here in Alamance County and their quality of life. Thank you and amen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Bill. Good morning, you're connected to the public hearing portion of the county commissioner's meeting. If you could state your name, address, and county of residence, and then begin your five minute comments. Okay, thank you. My name is Stephanie Thurman. Address is 149 Clark Road, Snow Camp, and Alamance County, of course. So um, I'm ready to go. Um, good morning, my name is Stephanie Thurman and I have lived at 149 Clark Road in Snow Camp since August 1991. First, I would like to thank the Board of Commissioners for the opportunity to address the issue of a moratorium on heavy industrial applications until the proposed small area plan for Snow Camp can be adequately, about, adequately evaluated and implemented. I realize that the Commissioner's opinions on zoning will vary. However, with two large mega sites within 15 miles of Snow Camp that are already zoned for heavy industry, our community will remain a target for industrialization. It would be an unfortunate development to allow the work that has been done so far on a small area plan for Snow Camp to become derailed or scrapped altogether. Southern Alamance County has always been a desirable place to call home, and you have witnessed firsthand the length to which residents will go to protect its agricultural and rural qualities as well as its rich cultural heritage. I think one of the most important aspects of a county commissioner's job is listening and emphasizing, empathizing with citizens, especially when situations arise that negatively impacts our health, safety, and well-being. And this is not just in a physical sense. Uh, it impacts our emotional well-being as well. As citizens of Alamance County, our county commissioners and the ordinances that you're responsible for enforcing are the only protections we have against unwanted heavy industrial developments and the pollution, noise, and toxins that they create. We have no other options except to put our faith in you to make decisions that are in the best interest of a community at large that has made it abund abundantly clear that it does not want another crushed stone quarry or worse in our neighborhood. We all know that Libby Hodges should have never approved a blasting rock quarry adjacent to the Colonial Pipelines, but she did. So here we are doing all we can possibly do to make sure that something similar doesn't happen again. This is why it's so important to have a moratorium on new heavy industrial applications in place that will give you the time you need to build on the progress made thus far on the small area plan. Short of a miracle, it appears that the quarry is here to stay. And as much as I distrust the county's process that approved it, I distrust the people behind the quarry even more. They do not have our best interests at heart, but I hope that you do and that you will reassure us of this through the implementation of a small area plan and enforcement of the HIDO as it governs the construction and operations of the quarry and other industries like the solar farm behind my house that is number one overdue for its three-year inspection as required by the HIDO, two continues to be an unmitigated eyesore with inadequate screening which is another requirement of the HIDO, and three continues to damage my property with stormwater runoff all of which could be could and should be addressed and hopefully resolved if it was inspected per the HIDO. 
In closing, I want to thank you again for listening. I appreciate your respect for and commitment to the citizens of Alamance County, but most of all, I appreciate your resolve to get this right. Thank you. Thank you. And we thank you. you're connected to the public hearing portion of the county commissioners meeting if you could state your name full address and county of residence and then begin your five minutes thank you Tori good morning commissioners I am Donna Poe and I have lived at 1907 Quake and Bush Road in Snow Camp Alamance County for the past 15 plus years and I sincerely thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning as a concerned citizen and out of care and love for my neighbors. I prayerfully request that you approve a one-year moratorium against any development inconsistent with the proposed small area plan for snow camp in order to protect my community while you continue to understand and implement this plan, which was unanimously approved by your predecessors last November 18, 2020. I had emailed you all over the weekend hoping you had an opportunity to take a look at the images sent showing two massive mega sites just 12 miles away from my home. These mega sites totaling 3,300 acres and zoned for heavy industries are strategically placed along the proposed Carolina Corps 120 mile stretch which includes the making of US 421 <clears throat> into Interstate 685 and will swallow up and destroy southern Alamance, Alamance County as we know it. There lies our answer as to why a blasting crushed rock quarry was planned and now under construction in the middle of cow pastures in our rural peaceful snow camp. Slipped past by a, a flawed ordinance, sealed in secret by anonymous LLCs with questionable characters to say the least, and who else knows behind the scenes and for how long with no regard or care to our health, safety, and property values. It is a nightmare. We need to do something now. We cannot afford to wait. The Snow Camp Mine is just the start of what can happen to our community without protections from the, from the disruption, noise, infrastructure costs, air and water pollution that comes with heavy industry. Tragically, because we are seeing that the few protections afforded by the HIDO are apparently difficult to enforce is why again I urgently request that you approve this moratorium. I also emailed you links for a one-year moratorium restricting heavy polluting industries and renewal of same in Caswell County who are facing a similar situation times five with a proposed rock quarry, two cement plants, and two asphalt plants. Common theme is no zoning. Their commissioners promptly recognized the threat by swiftly enacting the moratorium while they considered their land development options. They are not there yet and as a result continue to protect their citizens with the renewed moratorium now spanning 18 months. Over the past year, our county went to great expense and effort in paying a consulting firm who worked with our planning department in providing many virtual workshops, open houses, surveys, presentations to the county commissioners, the public hearing and approval all on YouTube, and the detailed plan still on the county website. There has been ample opportunity for the community as a whole to ask questions and to become acquainted with the Snow Camp Small Area Plan, which is intended to protect our peaceful rural agricultural heritage and not adversely restrict property rights. The proposed Snow Camp Small Area Plan is a restriction on industrialization of our community in light of pending heavy industry development in neighboring counties to our west and southwest. It is intended to protect both our property and community values. This is why we need a one-year moratorium put in place now in order to protect the citizens of Snow Camp until land development decisions and implementation thereof are agreed upon and finalized. Again, we can't afford to wait. Thank you again for your leadership and care for the citizens of Alamance County. To God be the glory. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. We need a one-year moratorium put in place now in order to protect the citizens of 
Address and county of residence, and then begin your five minute comment. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. My name is Henry Vines. Uh, I live at 3450 Isley Drive in Snow Camp. Uh, I'm a lifetime resident of Alamance County, been here in Snow Camp for over 45 years. Commissioners, I just wanted to uh, say to you today that um, I support the moratorium. Uh, but I think it should be countywide. I don't, I uh, would like to ask you, do you think that we out here for the rest of the county don't need the same protection? As you look forward into the future of area zoning versus countywide zoning, the whole protection of this county is, is imminent. We all need to, a plan that is going to take place. The HIDO that was adopted was adopted in a very restrictive way so that it wouldn't been, uh, be able to impose upon neighbors. As we move forward in zoning, my question is uh, to you commissioners as well as uh, Mr. Albright, with, if we zone the county and it is zoned industry, does the heavy industry uh, ordinance does not apply to that area any longer? Uh, that's the, uh, what I had a concern about is, you know, on the moratorium, this is only stops permits from being issued. And uh, so if, if the county is zoned, uh, is that high to not affect in the areas that are zoned industry? So if it was uh, deemed by uh, the, the residents in the area of the snow camp area that they wanted their property zoned industry which in the meeting that was held uh by the gentleman from uh chapel hill said it would uh, be up to public hearing for each residence to ask for their land to be zoned a certain way or not to be zoned a certain way but the ultimate decision would be up to you the commissioners as to how that area was zoned so my concerns, you know, is about the rest of the county. Uh, I don't think that it's fair that uh, one part of the county uh, gets protection and the other part of the county doesn't. As uh, Ms. Poe was alluding to just earlier, Caswell County has made this for the whole county to protect the county uh, until, you know, they can do something about something. So. I would just ask you to uh, take all this into consideration. And also, uh, it's my understanding that they're asking for years what the comments was, but if I read the uh, packet correctly, it was 180 days. So I'm not sure which way that uh, is going. Uh, also, uh, on you know uh, the zoning area, what would you know what would what had what decisions have been made my understanding it was only adopted to look at the plan as far as i understand you the commissioners have not come straight out and say okay we're going to zone this small area or are we going to zone the whole county it hasn't been <coughs> point blank said i don't know how much time i got left uh, but uh, commissioners, I would uh, ask you to discuss that. And you know, are you planning on taking a vote saying yes, we're going ahead to zone one part of the county, or what? What is what is your intent? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Good 
Good morning. You're connected to the public hearing portion of the county commissioner's meeting. If you could state your name, full address, and county of residence, and then begin your five-minute comment. Hi. Um, thank you for taking my call. My name is Laura Corin. Uh, I live on Snow Camp Road. The address is 8123 Snow Camp Road in Alamance County. Um, I live in the telephone exchange. <laughs> uh, it's on the, uh, the registry of nation, national, national registry of historical places. I've lived here for 16 years. Um, the telephone exchange is unique and is on the registry because it was formed in the, it was built by the community in Snow Camp in the early 1900s when they wanted telephone service and, and no telephone company would come in and supply it. So they got together and they pitched in the money and somebody donated the land and they built the building and the, uh, the equipment was downstairs and the telephone operator sat upstairs and um, and it's still here today and, and I live in it without the equipment. <laughs> um, and I think it says a lot about Snow Camp in that this community got together and, and, and did this together. Um, we might look like a sleepy little town, a sleepy little area, but um, you know, this is a residential community of foreign lands. I took a walk with my neighbor yesterday down Griffin Road and saw five calves in a field with their mom romping. Um, I don't know. I think at the same time that it's durable and it's been here a long time, it's also fragile. Uh, the water, we, we have septic tanks. I can't imagine that that um, you know having um, explosions are, are going to do any good for any of that. Um, and I, I think we don't know until we we lose something and it's too late sometimes. And hopefully that won't happen here. Um, I think there is something unique and wonderful that should be preserved. I agree with the area plan uh, and zoning. I think that's what we need. And we do not need um, commercial and industrial. I think it'll just ruin this historical area. And I, I, I hope you, the commissioners, newly elected and reelected and Congratulations, and I, I hope you you can help Alamance County and and keep Snow Camp for what it's been for all this time and what it should be for future generations. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, could you have her repeat her last name, please? Could you repeat your last name? It's Corin C O R I N. Okay. Thank and, you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's zero in the call queue, and we have several written public comments. All right. You want to continue with those, please, ma'am? The first is from Morgan Simeon, 2001 East Greensboro, Chapel Hill Road, Graham. Last name again. S-I-E-M. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to work together as a community to determine our future. I respectfully request that the moratorium on heavy industrial development applications be set to protect our community for a 12-month period so that we can have time to carefully consider this matter together. The proposed snow camp mine is just the start of what can happen to our community without protections from the disruption, noise, infrastructure, air, and water pollution that comes with heavy industry. With two NC mega sites comprising over 3,300 acres already zoned 
for heavy industry within 15 miles of snow camp. We will remain a target for industrialization that would transform the fabric of our cherished rural and historic community. We live here because we cherish the quiet rural lifestyle available to us here. We do not want to see snow camp become a dumping ground for intrusive and polluting industries simply because lenient ordinances make us an easy target. I know quite a lot of my neighbors and we're all of the same mindset that we want to live quiet and peaceful lives out here. We want our air and water to be clean. We want to enjoy quiet and the sounds of nature, not blasting and heavy trucking. We want to be able to trust that our wells will not run dry or be contaminated. We live in a truly unique and beautiful place. We appreciate your efforts to help us preserve it. Thank you for hearing us and protecting the agricultural, rural, and cultural integrity of Snow Camp from unwanted development. Okay. Next is Richard Hernandez, 639 Roselle Road. Snow Camp should be treated as a historic treasure, not a commodity. Please treat it so. Rick Hernandez, resident since 1974. Ronald Saunders, 1025 Clark Road. Please don't allow any more heavy industrial development in Snow Camp. Please help keep our community safe. Thank you. This is Charlie Causey, um, 1720 Quake and Bush Road. Charlie and Pam Causey. Thank you for this opportunity to voice my concerns and request for a moratorium on all heavy industry, industry applications while Alamance County finalizes the small area plan for snow camp. In November, the commissioners voted to approve this plan for our area but needed protection from any polluting industry that might be in the works and want to slip in quickly before the time clock runs out. We in the snow camp area have lived with this stress since we were blindsided two and a half years ago by plans for a stone quarry in our community. We don't know what else might be in the works. An asphalt plant, who knows? We thought someone was buying up land for a cattle farm, which turned out to be plans for a crushed stone rock quarry by snow camp property investors and Alamance aggregates, both registered in Wyoming. I feel sure that you are familiar with the North Carolina color-coded zoning map that shows why Alamance County is a soft target for heavy industry. I am sure that you know that all counties in North Carolina, except those in the extreme eastern and western parts of the state, have some type of zoning, except for Alamance County, which is moving in that direction. And what places might developers seem to see as the softest target? an unprotected agricultural rural area just 15 miles from two North Carolina mega sites already zoned for heavy industrial use. The proposed snow camp and stone quarry is adjacent to my property on Clayton Bush Road. I have concerns that an asphalt plant may be planned for adjoining acreage on another side of my place. It was purchased by the same developers as the quarry and is across the road from the rear entrance to the proposed quarry area. Snow Camp Property Investments LLC paid double the assessed value of the property. I am holding my breath that I won't get hit with a double whammy, two heavy industries on two sides of my 70 acres. Please protect our rights to enjoy our community, residents, property, farm operations, grass mowing, Snow Camp's way of life in a rural community which is dependent solely upon wells for water. Please help us preserve the cultural heritage that my family has been a part of since the Quaker community was established. Please extend the moratorium on heavy industry applications until the snow camp area plan can be put into place. And this is from Larry Griffin. Dear commissioners, once again, I most certainly oppose any form of industrialization in Snow Camp. My family farm where I grew up 
and still resides since 1940 is a beautiful and historic part of the Snow Camp community. We have the oldest church in Alamance County here and ancestors and people come from across this country and abroad to visit relatives' grave sites. We keep the sites impeccable because we have pride in this community and the people who choose to live here. Such a rich heritage should not be marred by pollution and loud machinery. On our farm, we have Reedy Creek running through our land and is a water source for wildlife and livestock. We drink well water and ask that you not allow anyone to contaminate, contaminate our main source of existence along with clean air to breathe. Please, please approve a moratorium for small area plan for snow camp. Okay, and this is from Mary Leon. Dear sir, please support this plan to keep snow camp free from industrialization. We are a historic, rural, and peaceful community, a state of mind. We would like to keep it that way. Introducing heavy industry to our area would be a severe blow to our way of life, our safety, and our environment. Many residents' lives would be turned upside down by the presence of loud, polluting industry. Their very safety would be in jeopardy in some cases. To allow large, greedy companies to tread on our values and way of life is unconscionable. Making money is one thing. Making it at the expense of others is another and is not the morally correct path. I urge you to do the right thing and allow us to maintain our beautiful little snow camp as it is. Thank you for your consideration. Mary Leon, a 22 year resident of snow camp. Uh, hello, commissioners. As a 25-year resident of Snow Camp, I would like to... Is this a, an additional person? Or yes, just... her name's at the end. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Could you give us that, please? Trisha Moss. M-O-S-S? M-O-S-S. -S. Yes. You. I would like to express my support for the moratorium of heavy industry in our historic and rural community. It's my understanding that the moratorium would protect this community from being a dumping ground for industrial projects until the small area plan is approved later in the year. For those of us interested in being farmers and stewards of this beautiful land, your support would be appreciated. Thank you for serving our county, Tricia Moss. And this is from David and Tina Hundley of 837 Snow Soapstone Trail. Dear Commissioners, as a resident of Snow Camp, I would like to encourage you to vote at this hearing for a moratorium to protect our community from industrialization while the small area plan is finalized. We want to have a voice and would appreciate the County Commissioner's commitment to represent your constituents in your actions. We are proud of our community and want to protect our rural landscape and way of living from intrusive polluting industries. There are already two mega sites comprising over 3,300 acres zoned for heavy industry within 15 miles of snow camp. Please help us keep our community from becoming an industrial magnet. Snow camp seems to be a target for industrialization, which threatens our bucolic agricultural landscape. I am sure that you will recall that in the fall 2019, you initiated a comprehensive plan land development study that culminated on November 6, 2020 with the recommendation of the planning board to implement a small area development plan for snow camp to prohibit industries that are not keeping with our rural residential community. We would like to see this momentum continued in order to fulfill its intent. Again, that's David and Tina. This is from Ricky and Leslie Marley of 1025 Soapstone Trail. I'm sorry, what was that? Oh, Ricky and Leslie Marley, 1025 Soapstone Trail. Okay, it says, we are residents of Snow Camp 
We are opposed to the industrialization of our community that will certainly damage the historical heritage, rural culture, and agricultural agriculture in our area. We fear that the proposed snow camp mine is just the start of what can happen to our community without protection from the pollution, noise, and damage to our roads and bridges that come with heavy industry. With two North Carolina mega sites comprising over 3,300 acres already zoned for heavy industry within 15 miles of snow camp, we will be prime target for continued industrial development that will ir irreparably harm our rural community heritage and quality of life. Our current ordinances and development plans have proven insufficient in protecting our communities from unwanted industrial development. The proposed snow camp small area plan is a restriction on what types of development can be allowed in our community. It does not restrict our rights to enjoy our residential properties and does not restrict farming operations. It, is simp it simply protects the way of life that we have come to love in snow camp. We support and encourage the approval of the proposed snow camp area small plan. The next one is from Sharon Timmons. The community of snow camp has spent countless hours individually and collectively to communicate opposition to heavy industry development in this area. Despite our best efforts and continued presence at the commissioner's meeting during 2019, 2020, and today, we may have lost the battle to prevent a quarry from coming to the area. We remain fearful of depletion and contamination of our water source. The community is on individual wells. Huge quarry trucks competing with the already present logging trucks that travel without regard to posted speed limits or resident safety, the elementary school, noise and dust, and the list goes on, all of which has been well documented at commission meetings over the past several years. I encourage all of you, both new and continuing members of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners to review these recorded documents. At the meeting of March 1st, the Snow Camp community is requesting your approval of a one-year moratorium on all heavy industry applications in order for the county to put final steps in place for small area plan for Snow Camp. Although some of you have recently heard from unknown individuals opposing zoning, some stating this is the first they have heard of it, I surmise you could be hearing from non-residents of Snow Camp who may have a different agenda. I can assure you we have been present at your meetings. We wear no Snow Camp Mine t-shirts and we display signs at our properties reflecting the desire to preserve our way of life in Southern Alamance County. One need only take a short drive around the area to realize the activity surrounding these issues. Snow Camp is a rural and agricultural area. Snow Camp has had a role in the American Revolution, the Civil War, and as a former stop on the Underground Railroad, huge historical and cultural significance in American history. It is imperative this role in history be protected for current and future knowledge, allowing Snow Camp to become a dumping place for intrusive polluting industry seems, seems unconscionable. Please be assured I am very much a resident of Snow Camp. I love my land and my community, but I am concerned I may not be being heard by my elected, account, elected county officials. In summary, I wish to express my opposition to further heavy industry development in Snow Camp and Southern Alamance County. My support of a one-year moratorium on heavy industry applications and my support of the small area plan for snow camp. Again, that was Sharon Timmons. This is from Dr. Gary Ulickney. Hello, my name is Gary Ulickney and I live in snow camp. 
I am here to voice my support for a nine month moratorium on heavy industry, heavy industry development until a small area plan can be developed that protects the safety, quality of life, and property rights of all Snow Camp residents. We should not approach this as a zoning proposal because I don't think anybody wants to dictate how tall your grass is, where you can shoot your gun, or where you can put a mobile home. We need to look at this as land development, as a land development plan that provides a well thought out roadmap for developing snow camp while protecting its agricultural and historic heritage. Yes, people should be able to sell their property, but not at the expense of neighbors who would be forced to live next to these intrusive and polluting industries that would dramatically affect the quality of life that brought them to snow camp. Not to mention the devastating effect it would have on their property values and ability to sell that property and escape the noise, dust, and threats to water quality. More importantly, it would be a crime to see this peaceful, beautiful community turned into a dumping ground for heavy industry. Every landowner in Snow Camp has property rights, and one of those rights is the opportunity to participate in and have a voice in what their community should look like. We live in a democracy based on the will of the majority, and it is important for the commissioners to hear those voices before making key decisions. This is exactly what didn't happen in the current quarry fiasco, and the recent modifications to the HIDO don't solve those problems. You have already voted to approve the development of Snow Camp Small Area Plan. The question now is, what does that plan look like? Answering that question will take time, study, and compromise. Again, I urge you to vote tonight for at least a nine month moratorium. Thank you. Again, that was Dr. Gary Whitney. And this is from Bruce Nelson. My name is Bruce Nelson. I am an Alamance County resident, homeowner, and together with my family own businesses in Alamance County. I strongly urge the commissioners to vote in favor of accepting a nine month moratorium on any development inconsistent with the previously approved Snow Camp small area plan. I am not a resident of Snow Camp. I strongly believe that decisions that impact land use, community design, transportation systems, water, and air quality should be based on the specific desires, interests, and opinions of a representative representative group of citizens within a clearly defined small area and not a regulatory body that makes one set of rules and regulations for the entire county. One size does not fit all. The planning board, county commissioners, and the Snow Camp Small Area Plan Group have spent considerable time, energy, effort, and financial resources to develop an acceptable process for future growth and development in the small, clearly defined areas of Alamance County. All have been visible and transparent except the owners of the mine and their legal representatives. Why their lack of transparency? What are they afraid of? And what are they trying to hide from the public? This battle is for residents of Snow Camp to have a say into the types of future development within their small community. It is a battle between the interests of a big, well-funded developer with expensive law firms and a small group of highly involved and concerned local citizens. It is a battle between the good of the few versus the good of the many. This process has been underway for well over a year. Why now, at seemingly the last minute, have hundreds of callers started to voice objections to this plan and process? Why have they been so publicly silent? Could it be the hidden owners are now investing even more of their vast financial resources to undermine the hard work and concerns of so many local residents? The, this entire process is and has always been about long-term county growth and development. A nine-month moratorium is not an unreasonable time period 
to allow for more time to further study and discuss the vitality of this critical issue. Unless, of course, the objective is for the mine's hidden owners to make further investments for the sole purpose of generating substantial profits for the few. The mine owners have demonstrated virtually no compassion or caring about the concerns of local residents who live near the mine. Totally unregulated growth can have potentially disastrous impacts on the very fabric of our rural communities. The proposed Snow Camp Mine is but one example of a regulatory process that on hindsight was flawed. Vote in favor of a nine month moratorium, please. And that was from Bruce Nelson. That was from Bruce Nelson. Snelton. Nelson. 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 Sorry. <laughs> Nelson. Nelson. Okay. Okay, next we have Timothy and Celeste Mulrooney. Good morning. We are writing in support of the moratorium for the heavy industry applications. We need to be able to have our small area plan for snow camp structured plan in place so reviews of permits can be done within a plan that does not destroy our community. The quarry has encroached on our community and caution needs to be taken to avoid any further disruption to our community without a structured plan in place to determine the benefits of a permit. Many in our community are not affected by the quarry as it, as it is over there, but over there is our backyard. Literally our backyard, we have a common boundary line with the quarry. This quarry has been a learning curve with initially we were approached by realtors to sell to an unknown buyer. Now that buyer and use of the purchased land is known. We are subjected to noise, dust, and the possible fear of blasting near the fuel pipeline that runs near the edge of our property. We have been residents of Snow Camp since 2008. We have a vested interest in keeping our community safe and rural. We have our own business and I also teach at the local community college. We are here to stay. As commissioners, we trust you have the best interest of the residents as your focus. Thank you for your time. Again, that was Timothy and Celeste Mulrooney. Next, we have Lorinda Reinhardt. Hi, my husband and I wish to express our support for extending the heavy industrial moratorium to nine months or a year while the snow camp area plan is implemented. Many changes have come to our peaceful rural community since we moved to our 29 acres with our infant son in 1991 but nothing threatens our way of life, health, water, property values, and peace of mind, as does the lack of protection we have to guide growth and limit intrusive heavy industries like the crushed stone quarry going in around the corner from us. The Snow Camp Small Area Plan was developed through community meetings and surveys to guide how residents want to see our area grow. We had a similar countywide community destination 2020 plan that was buried by a few loud, narrow-minded voices that did not represent the majority of residents. The same thing is happening again, leaving our area wide open to destructive and incompatible industries to take over our small rural community. We are all neighbors and one person's property rights should not supersede another's. This plan will help guide Snow Camp to grow in a healthy, responsible way that respects and benefits everyone as well as preserves its lovely, close-knit rural character. Sincerely, Lorinda and Chris Reinhardt. Okay, next, this is from Elizabeth Ulickney. 
Hello, my name is Jane Ulickney and I am a resident of Snow Camp. I am writing today to voice my support for the Snow Camp Small Area Plan. In addition, please consider extending the moratorium beyond 180 days. This will give enough time to get it right so our community does not become a magnet for other heavy polluting industries like the crushed rock quarry just down the road from us. Thank you. And that's Elizabeth Jane Ulickney. Okay. Next, Rita Williams. The proposed snow camp mine is just the start of what can happen to our community without protections from the disruption, noise, infrastructure costs, air, and water pollution that comes with heavy industry. With two North Carolina mega sites comprising over 3,300 acres already zoned for heavy industry within 15 miles of snow camp, we will remain a target for industrialization that would transform the fabric of our cherished rural and historic community. We do not want snow camp to become a dumping place for intrusive polluting industries in our county. We are very concerned about protecting the agricultural rural and cultural heritage of Snow Camp. The current heavy industrial development ordinance is difficult to enforce and does not adequately protect our communities from un unwanted development. The proposed Snow Camp small area plan is a restriction on what types of development are allowed in our community. It does not restrict our rights to enjoy our residential properties. It does not restrict farming operations, and it does not regulate grass mowing. It simply protects a way of life that we have come to love in Snow Camp. We do not want our beautiful rural community to become all industrialized and look like the big city. We chose this way of life because we love it and do not want it to be filled with excess smog and pollution from these big industries. We love being able to take a nice quiet stroll outside and listen to the birds and crickets sing. The Snow Camp Mine should have never been approved by the city and it needs to be stopped along with any further development. And we approve of the Snow Camp Small Area Plan. Sincerely, Eugene and Rita Williams and Tabitha Williams. Next, we have Ann Allen. Located on a long country road between Graham and Snow Camp is the Three College Observatory, which was completed in 1981. At this time, the decision was made to locate one of the largest observatories in the southeastern United States at this location because of its rural area. Since 1981, population growth has exploded in the surrounding area complete without outdoor yard lights. These lights do distort the pleasure of the viewers. I believe that Snow Camp, which is with its rich history and fifth generation farmers that farm here and the new farmers coming coming in will be the will be lost with the completion of the rock quarry and any further industrial development. Therefore, I am all for the Snow Camp Small Area Plan to protect its local history, farmers, and yes, the observatory. Well water is extremely important for our families and livestock. I fear the quarry is going to diminish our availability of our water to extreme measures. The citizens of Snow Camp do not deserve this. At one commissioner's meeting where I was in attendance, Amy Gailey, commissioner chair, said that we could sue the quarry if our well water was disrupted. That comment was totally dismissive of the citizens of Snow Camp. This comment by Ms. Gailey made me feel like no one was listening to us and made me extremely confused and angry. I still am, and that's from Ann Allen 9300 South Fort Bethel Road, Snow Camp. Next, we have Cheryl and David 
um, Stevenson. Dear commissioners, thank you for all you do to protect our snow camp way of life. We do not want snow camp to become a dumping place for polluting industries in our county. We need you to protect our agricultural, rural, and cultural heritage of snow camp. The proposed snow camp mine is just the beginning of the destruction that can happen to our community without protection from the disrupt disruption, noise, infrastructure costs, air, and water pollution that comes with heavy industry. Our land is not meant to be used in this way. With two mega sites comprising over 3,300 acres already zoned for heavy industry within 15 miles of snow camp, we will remain a target for industrialization that would demolish our cherished rural community. This just can't be allowed to happen. The current ordinances do not protect our communities from unwanted development. As you know, the proposed small area, snow camp small area plan is a restriction on what types of development are allowed in our community. The plan does not restrict our rights to enjoy our residential properties, nor does it restrict farming operations. And those, and those, and for those not aware, it does not regulate grass mowing. It simply and importantly protects a way of life that we have come to love and cherish, snow camp. We have lived here 27 years and want to spend the rest of our days in the peace and quiet of snow camp community. Please do what you can to protect our community and our home. With kind regard, because I can't talk, kind regards, Cheryl Braswell and David Stevenson. Next, we have Debbie Sanders. Hello, my name is Debbie Sanders. I live at 8900 Snow Camp Road, Snow Camp. It truly makes me upset to even have to send this email. I was brought up to believe that elected officials should be above reproach, but this phrase I assume went away with our forefathers. Along with phrases like, in God we trust, or Civil War statues, which we've seen torn down. I had hoped we had learned a thing or two from not only what is going on, not as going on in D.C. in recent years, but also what has happened in the southern part of Alamance County in the last five years. It seems the county commissioners are once again turning a blind eye to the very people they swore to work for and help. This snow camp, snow camp small area plan was voted on and approved back in November. It was to help to develop sensible guidelines to control things like pollution, air and water, noise pollution and heavy industry. Now it seems a few phone calls and we start backtracking. I'm sorry, but what happened to people doing what they say they were going to do? This whole country has gone wishy-washy and I for one and am happy my grandfather is not here to see it. It's like if anything rocks the boat, we turn a blind eye. That's how I feel the quarry situation was handled. And this is just another county commissioner's meeting, turning a blind eye because someone yelled a little too loud. Let me give you a scenario. You work 31 and a half years and you decide to retire and move back to your hometown. You buy a home with a few acres. You think you're going to enjoy the golden years with a few cows in the pasture, maybe some chickens, yes, a dog or two. You've already have some acreage here that you bought from some family a few years back. You're ready to sit back and enjoy retirement, and then you learn you're in for the fight of your life. You find out this quarry has underhandedly bought land all around you in a bogus name here from another state. Now, just before they start up this nice, neat little quarry, you and your neighbors hear about it. No one contacted you. No one contacted your neighbors. Then you find out the people with the quarry are not meeting deadlines or qualifying for all regulations. So you and your neighbors go to bat for yourselves the only way you know how. Yes, that's right. We, we go to the county commissioners 
and for years they give the No Snow Camp Mine Steering Committee the nicest heartfelt sympathy you've ever seen. But you know what they did? Nothing. When asked about an appeal, we were told they would look into it, which didn't happen. The commissioner's lawyer could care less what happens on this end of the county. Now put yourself in my shoes. I lived in the city and I wanted to retire where I didn't have to have sidewalks, concrete, dump trucks, smokestacks, skyscrapers, condominiums, and pollution. I honestly don't mind driving to town once a week for groceries or making my trip to town count. There are two sites not 15 miles from snow camp that are already targeted for heavy industry. If the county commissioners go back on their word again to not do the small area plan, which was voted on with no opposition, it will be just one more time they have left the residents of Southern Alamance down. Please, please consider up to a one-year moratorium to protect the citizens of Snow Camp from more unwanted development. Thank you for allowing my thoughts to be read this morning. Sincerely, Debbie Sanders. Next is John Campbell. Good morning. Commissioners, you have my respect. Every week at these meetings, you weigh the pros and cons of decisions that affect tens of thousands of people for 10 to 20 years into the future. You get to shape the community in some ways. Sometimes you get out of the way so the community can do what it wants. You have agreed to take on this role for a short period of time as a way of serving. It is a large responsibility and I can tell you, tell you take it seriously. And I say you have my respect for being for being willing to serve. This is a public forum discussion, discussing a public issue. As a commissioner, you sit before all of the people with your name on the desk. Everyone knows who you are. I think I'm going to speak to this issue. I need to state my name and affiliations. Everyone needs to be able to know who I am, if my voice is going to be valid. I am John Campbell, local farmer, resident of Snow Camp. I live on Snow Camp Road. I have a business, Dinner Bell Farm. In the clearest voice possible, I want to say, the Snow Camp Small Area Plan is a good idea. It is helpful to people who live in Southern Alamance County. The Small Area Plan needs nine to 12 months to be reviewed and set up in the right way. The Alamance County Commission agreed to a moratorium on heavy industry applications last November, so the small area plan could set up without having any unwanted heavy industry slip under the wire. I want the commissioners to support the moratorium on heavy industry applications. Alamance County will grow with development in the next three decades. We are poised to have a mix of farmland and residential neighborhoods. I can say with confidence that everyone who lives in Snow Camp now or buys a property in the future will not want to live down the road from heavy industry. This is clear to you too, correct? Even the person who wants to sell the family farm does not want to be down the street from the heavy industry when they sell their property. The commissioners can get out of the way on this one and let the people shape their neighborhood, support the moratorium, allow the small area plan to work thank you and that was again that was john campbell did he give his address he did not he said he owned dinner bell farm i got that <clears throat> okay next we have laura nigro can you spell that n-i-g-r-o of graham oh okay Dear County Commissioners, I write again as a resident of Alamance County to help spare Snow Camp from becoming a dumping place for intrusive, polluting industries. Since relocating here from Durham County exactly a year ago, I have grown increasingly alarmed at the development mushrooming all around us. <clears throat> Before our very eyes, it is changing the once relatively quiet, open area where we chose to make our new home. Regarding Snow Camp specifically, 
I understand that the current heavy industrial ordinance is difficult to enforce and does not adequately protect nearby communities from unwanted development. Without an intentional customized plan, Snow Camp will remain a target for asphalt and cement plants. Building out such large industrial sites, there would transform that community's unique nature. I further understand that while the proposed Snow Camp small area plan restricts the types of development to be allowed in that community, it does not restrict anyone's rights to enjoy their residential properties, neither does it restrict farming operations nor regulate grass mowing. The SAP simply protects a way of life that snow campers and others like me have come to cherish about the area. The snow camp small area plan was approved by the commissioners at a public hearing last November in response to the two nearby mega sites. Please put an adequate moratorium on all heavy industry applications to protect this community from industrialization while the small area plan is finalized. Again, that's sincerely Laura Nigro, Graham, North Carolina. And that is all the written comments I have. Oh, oh, Bruce is there. saying there's another call. Someone called in late, but they still called in the time, so we have one more call. Was it after the uh, closure of calls? There was no call. Yes. All right. Ward, how do you want to handle that? Do you want to accept that call that was called in late, or would you rather not have it? Well, I think we're still in the public hearing. Let's go ahead and allow them to speak. Yeah. Ms. Thompson, do you agree? Absolutely. I, I agree. think they should be heard. I agree, Mr. Chairman. All right, everyone agrees. Let's go ahead. Okay. Good morning. You're connected to the public hearing portion of the county commissioner's meeting. If you could state your name, your full address, county of residence, and then begin your five minute comments. Uh, yes, my name is Ron Stenhoven, and I reside at 2709 Quakenbush Road in Snow Camp, Alamance County. And good morning, and thank you for holding this hearing. I'm here today to urge you to vote to put a moratorium in place on new development in Snow Camp not consistent with the Land Development Plan A until this plan is fully implemented. There are, managed, there are many families in Snow Camp who share the vision of managed growth in our community. The current restrictions on heavy industry is difficult at best to enforce. I anticipate many violations coming from the permitted blast mine once they begin operation. And one might ask, what plan does the County Board of Commissioners have to ensure compliance? An ounce of prevention is worth a ton of enforcement. Please vote yes on a moratorium. Thank you. Would you have him spell his last name, please? Oh, it's S-P-I-N-H-O-V-E-N. Thank you, Mr. Spinhoven. You're welcome. Who's this folks now? And there are no other calls. No other public hearing calls in the No other public hearing calls. Okay. Thank you. Do we have a motion to close the public meeting? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All against signify by saying nay. It's unanimous. We're closed. And I note we have 28 callers uh, and or emails and letters. Thank you. At this point, we have public uh, our uh, comments from the commissioners. I'll open the floor. Okay. <laughs> Um, I, I have a question concerning Stephanie Thurman's talking about the solar farm. Um, it's overdue for a three-year inspection. Who does that inspection? Tony, do you? 
speak to the Because uh, I know we are, North Carolina is really a, a big time solar farm. We're very popular for that. We are very popular just because of the way our land lies yeah. and rolls. Um, the snow camp, what do we call them? I think Southwick was the name of their solar farm. So they were permitted, approved prior to me getting here. They've done their installation in our lot producing power. And we did back in, I want to say early 2019, we had some concerns from Ms. Thurman about landscaping on that property. Mm -hmm. So, and the mm -hmm. landscaping buffer that had to be put in. Certain areas of the land were extremely wet, so some of those trees didn't survive. So they did have to go out and replant those trees. I can look into when the renewal is. It is their responsibility to come to us when it's time for the renewal. If we're made aware of such as this, that the renewal hasn't happened, then we can send them a notice of violation that they haven't renewed and get that straight with them. So the solar farm people are responsible for any kind of landscaping or anything like that? Yes. And part of that renewal is when we go out, we walk in and make sure the landscaping is still alive. They're always responsible for keeping that alive during the whole project. Okay. I just have real serious issues with buffers what people i think you should have to walk through a buffer because you can't see through a buffer and some buffers i've seen it's like four bushes and i mean i know whatever can qualify as a buffer but i i, I don't know and uh and i just have a question we hear about this pipeline all the time this is colonial pipeline is this pipeline a, a recipient of the pipeline that the president just killed all those thousands of jobs no, for? No, it, run, it runs uh, southeast. It runs from Alabama all the way up to Jersey. The Colonial yeah. Pipeline. This is totally it's, different from the one that's yep. in the west. It's not in the uh, middle, middle part of the country. Well, that's not on the hit list. It, uh, the, the Keystone runs from the middle of the country, Oklahoma, up to Canada, yeah. and back down to Texas. Okay. All right. Thanks, Billy. And, um, and, and someone was talking about voting back in November. I know this is when all of us newbies come on. Vote on this in okay. Yeah. If we're voting on this to have this plan that we're talking about, the small area plan in Snow Camp, because this is not a strength of mine. I feel like I'm just clueless on this. This moratorium that I, I want, I just, I just want everybody to be happy and it be safe and everybody, because I'm sitting here looking at Aaron Brockovich in 1993 with the, the gas and all that and $330 million lawsuit where people were dying from cancer that of these chemicals that were in the water. I mean, prevention is the key, not intervention. And um, and I, I'm just I'm just curious about what was that vote for? Like, what did that mean as compared to why we're looking at a moratorium? Okay, so I think there are some language misuse. Com just bring it all together. And I'm probably the biggest one here. That's why I'm asking no, 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 these I'm questions. Not specifically speaking of there. Even the public, I believe, they're using some words interchangeably that mm -hmm. in my world don't work interchangeably. Right. So let me help. Um, the land development plan is a comprehensive long-range plan required by state law. That plan last updated 2007, which means all the information actually in numbers started in 2005. So the data was really old. Okay. So everybody was wanting to do some type of land use planning. Well, we needed a long-term comprehensive plan in order to write the short-term plan to meet that. So we started the land development plan process. At that time, the quarry was very hot for the county and the commissioners decided let's do something very special for Snow Camp and do a small area plan that simply concentrates on them and give them a little more attention and step up their plan a little more detail. So they got the small area plan for Snow Camp. So that actually drew out and it's in the land development plan. I have a copy of it, so I want it, but it drew out kind of where your commercial, industrial, residential, agricultural areas would be in just snow camp. So they got a very close in look. Where we're at today, that's a long range plan of what it could look like mm -hmm. in the future. Where we're at today is writing an ordinance that can make that come to life and give me what would be acreages of land, uh, how big your land has to be, put a house on. And if you're an industrial zoning district, what else is allowed? Will you allow a small business? Do you allow the rock quarry? Do you allow it by special permission? If you're in a residential zoning district, do you only allow single family homes? Do you allow duplexes? Do you allow mobile homes? That's where we're at. We're down to the parcel by parcel layer where we're at the 30,000 view there. We're down to the ground for okay. what we're looking at now, going piece by piece of all these parcels. So very different, these two things that we've done. We've completed the long range view. If we wish to move forward at this time with the 
very current, very basic ground view to each par each parcel is where we're at. Is that what the board wants to move forward with right now? Because that will put restrictions on properties. It will guide people on the types of development that they will do or ask permission to do something different in a rezoning. Your rezonings always come to commissioners for final approval, that's state law. So if they want, you have a whole list of all types of land uses you can think of and you shove them in whatever zoning district you have, whether you have four, five, six, whatever comes out about that. And then from there, if you what you want to do doesn't fit in the zoning district that you have, you apply to the planning department, we do our own paperwork, we run it through the planning board for recommendation, and then we land with commissioners to make a final decision to change your zoning district. Totally different than what the people have now. They don't have to ask for that. They follow the ordinances we have. They're all technical reviews. If you want an exception to most of our ordinances or some kind of little forgiveness, then you come to our boards. That's not what the new process will be with them. You still have that, but in addition, you have the request to resign. Okay, please be patient with me because I this is this is really big. Okay, Miss Poe mentioned that 12 miles from her house is going to be the two mega site things about 3,300 acres, and it just a light bulb went off about how convenient that is with all that development to have a rock quarry there hey i'm for gravel i got a gravel driveway and i need a new load myself right now as we <laughs> speak i got potholes but that's you know that's the first time i've heard that as far as the vicinity as far as how close i mean we're north carolina i think we're we're really just all that because everybody wants to come here we're, we got so much we got the mountains the piedmont the coast i mean i'm very proud of our state and we're a big business state and i hear about this and, and let me ask you a question like th this tanya okay say i'm in and this is silly but this could be real i'm up in union ridge and i'm hunting and i shoot the ground and just like on the beverly hillbillies all comes up because <laughs> this can happen all right can can i have you know some old man to come in there and have like the oil rigs that you see down in texas i mean this is you've got to think big like this because anything can happen anything has happened you see what i mean so that will go through one of our ordinances as we have it now if you make no changes we have an ordinance that gives some technical guidelines the high has a technical list of what we're looking for and then we move forward and you all will see it at the end, but all you can look at is technical. You can't see it's a good idea there or it's not a good idea. You all don't have the powers like that in the ordinances that we have because zoning gives you those powers. And well, just one more small question and I'm done. Okay, this moratorium for however many months, and I'm looking at Clyde for this, is this moratorium going to stop this rock quarry? Mm -hmm. Like we're going, they're going to pack their suitcases and leave? No. no. Uh, Commissioner, what the moratorium will do is, if the board approves it, mm -hmm. will stop heavy industrial development in this area of where the Snow Camp Small Area Plan is going to be considered. And <clears throat> from what Ms. Cattle has told it, it takes a, a little bit of time to meet with folks to de further develop the zoning for the area. And the comments that you've heard this morning, they talk about their concerns with water quality, with noise, with pollution, with another industry coming in um, while this is going on. Uh, and if the board finds that, that is the case, then you need to prepare a statement saying, here's why we as a board believe that this moratorium is appropriate. And you could just cite the comments you've heard today and on your based on your own knowledge um, it's a complex issue it's going to require a lot of study a lot of meetings with landowners down there i don't know how many parcels are we're talking about mm, roughly thirty thousand we've so got a little over ninety thousand in the whole county so about a third of that the way it's done you you have public meetings public hearings could take six months could take a year uh, to get it done so that's what the moratorium is for. So you'll, you'll need a statement. You'll need to adopt a statement that says all of these things. And I have given you a copy of the law mm -hmm. with the four things you have to show. You ha have to also say, here's the date of termination. We're going to adopt a moratorium, but it's not going to last beyond this date. And here are the actions and schedules of events that we're going to do. Uh, while the moratorium is in place, you can talk about local meetings with the planning department, 
um, and consultants. I mean, you've already conducted a series of local meetings to come up with a plan, and um, you'll just be repeating that, but be focusing on the snow camp area to address these concerns. But while this moratorium is going on, the rock quarry is going to go to business. Yes. Like it's going to be business, and, and the moratorium can stop Acme Asphalt or Bob's Cement Plant from not com from coming in there, correct? That's correct. But the moratorium is going to be blasting. It's, I mean, the, not the moratorium, the quarry is going to be blasting. It's going to be doing exactly what it bought this land to do. If they, right. if they meet the requirements for the operation permit, yes. That's the second step. So they've been given permission and authorization to construct, intent to construct is what we give them. Then they get all their construction stuff done that matches the site plan that we approve. Once they get ready to actually operate, they come back to us and say, here's your as built. We built it exactly the way we said we were going to. Please come out and take a look at this. And we go out, we walk it, we do the site plan review, and then we give them an operations permit. They can't operate until we do So for practical purposes, Commissioner uh, Thompson, it takes a while to build buildings to set up equipment, uh, I'm not sure there'll be an operation at the end of this year because mm -hmm. the Rock Corps is a huge operation. The ones I've seen have enormous heavy equipment they have to install and uh, they have to put a road in, they have to have their gigantic trucks uh, in the quarry, they have crushers, they have screeners and all of these things they have to put in place where they have agreed to place. So that takes some time. Meanwhile, this moratorium prevents any other heavy industry from coming into snow camp. But are y'all here? I'm, I'm not really hearing but a couple of other things. I'm hearing what's going down the road for me, what I'm going to be hearing, how this is going to disrupt where I've been living for years in snow camp. And I, I'm not hearing, I don't think anybody cares about anything except not wanting this quarry in their, in their area. That's what I'm hearing. The moratorium is like a delay for anything else to come in, but it's not going to stop this quarry. And what I'm hearing from the hearts of this community is they do not want the quarry at all. And that's what we've got to be adults to say here, that the quarry is there, and it's going there, and it's there. Because I'm hearing out of the hearts of these people that they don't want the quarry at all and we can't stop that right well, the reality of that is that the the quarry still has to get the final approval of the operating permit and they have in order to get the operating permit they have to pass a satisfactory examination of the construction to make sure that everything that was required by the county and by the state has been adhered to well i bet this is a a big chunk of change and these people haven't bought this just to see if they could get this passed. I mean, we, we're all, hey, let's step back and look at this. I'm just hearing the heart speak of these people. They don't want this quarry at all. That's what I'm hearing. And a moratorium is going to protect from some other things, but at the end of the moratorium's last minute on there, that quarry's going to still be there. And that is the problem for these folks. I get it. I really get it. Well, some of the ones I've spoken to down there have, have reconciled themselves to the fact that in all probability, the quarry mm -hmm. will be operational at some point. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are still some who don't want it. Well, many who would, would prefer that it not be, but um, based on everything that's been done to this point with the state's input mm -hmm. and controls that they have, um, if they adhere, adhere to all of these issues, then are all these uh, requirements, then they they may become operational. I don't know when. As, uh, uh, I don't as, have a time frame on that. I don't think any of us have been given that. Well, that's that. The base of this is just fear. I how mean, much, how it's going to change their life? I can respect that. So. Tanya, how much time do you think we will need to implement the small area plan? So the small area plan was approved with the land development right. plan. We're looking for the ordinance to back that up. That's right. That's a discussion to have. So we've thrown out six months. Six months will be a minimum effort. Six months is including our public outreach. Uh, as our consultants have written that up for six months, would only include one public outreach meeting and then one meeting with planning board and one meeting with commissioners. If we want more than that, it will take longer. Those are kind of minimum efforts put forward. 
So those, that time frame is only built in those meetings. Now, what the way we did the land development plan was we did virtual outreach, and when it came down to the very end, we were able to do some in-person outreach as well. Got to say, we had better results with the virtual, but there are certain people that don't do that, and they need us to come out. Mm -hmm. This will be, we develop a map, and everybody gets to see their individual parcel on the map and what we're playing, what our thoughts are on it. It's important to each person, I'm very sure. So it depends on what the commissioners are comfortable with, with how many meetings and how much outreach it could add to that time frame. Well, one of the complaints I've heard from a, a number of our citizens was that they were unaware of the hearings that occurred last year. I know we had a number of hearings in the county last year, but apparently um, for, for various reasons, they were unable to determine that those hearings were being held. And so they weren't able to get involved. I think, uh, from what I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, a, a moratorium will allow, and, and the implementation of the research to accomplish the small area plan into an ordinance will give us more time to do some more public hearings, maybe make a stronger effort to make sure that our citizens that, for other reasons, weren't able to learn about it can have input. In particular, as since we're going parcel by parcel, we should be contacting individuals about their particular parcels, am I correct? Uh, we don't contact on the individual level, but um, there's notice given in the paper. We do Facebook, we did some YouTube live things, we post in the general store, we post at the post office down there, we post in several local places down there as well right. to try to get people to get input. I, th I think one of the individuals actually told me he saw the comment or saw the posting, but he didn't know what it was about, so he didn't pay much attention to it. And uh -huh. I said, "Well, you probably should we have." We had people take our postings down, and we had almost weekly go down and put more of it. So we were trying um, to stay on top of that. But <laughs> I'm, to, to defend that, when we did rezoning for the school systems, we we advertised it. We we roll call we did we did it all the time and we had um no, certain district right. yeah we did some, we had certain zones that parents would come in certain handfuls you know but you got almost 23,000 students so it's a commitment thing to get involved with your county and and if it's not in your backyard you don't see a reason to get involved until it is in your backyard that's human nature we do that with everything and um so and a lot of people do not have they don't do this they don't do this right here mm -hmm. we've seen that with the health department when it comes to scheduling things like that you know you have to realize everybody that lives in elements county has a different way of finding out what they want to find out and um different levels well that goes to the heart of another issue we've been dealing with in the commission as well and that's access to uh um, mm -hmm. digital communications mm -hmm. in rural areas of the county we have spots where even with a hot spot mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think that's what it's yeah. called even with a hot spot you can't um, you can't get a signal so if you can't get a signal you can't go online if you can't go online you can't get the various social media to hear about these things so we've got to do it the best effort possible if we're going to go through this process to make sure that all of our citizens both for and against the process have a chance to have input but folks I tell you for the last two years I've worked with what I believe to be four of the most compassionate and conservative individuals in Alamance County right here on this board. And when we got to that point last year in November when we voted for this, I think we wanted to move forward with this planning. We want to put the, we want to go through the process, but we want to make it make it possible for everybody to be heard. Mm -hmm. And if everybody wasn't heard, then we want to give them that opportunity. But one of the concerns that I had brought up too was what protections on self-determination of property rights will a small area plan have for citizens anywhere in the county? Is there a way for an individual who owns a farm today and, and loves farming and wants to farm it, but second, th third generation from where he is now, his family wants to do something else? Mm -hmm. Kids gone to college, gotten jobs in other areas and they want to sell the family farm and reap the benefits of the investment they've made in that property and what protection do they have what protection is there protection we can provide to them at that point in time to make a decision about how that property 150 uh, 200 whatever acres might be being 
uh, sold and they have to they have somebody come in and wants to buy that property and I they have a specific use that. intended for that property be quiet she's trying to help you I told it to be quiet a long time ago um, um, what protections in a plan can we come up with to allow that sort of decision to be made in the future all right so the state law gives us a lot of variation on that if maybe they're farmland right now we set on agriculture or something even in agriculture we make the decision on what else do we allow do we allow a 20 acre subdivision do we allow 30 acre subdivision what do we want to allow in there as well without special permissions or without rezoning it's not that you can't get there it's a process to get there once you write the zoning ordinance how how easy do you want it to be or do you want some steps do you want to have your hands on it as a board to say if we'd like to make those decisions if somebody's got 200 acres and they want to divide up to you know a bunch of small like lots we like to be a part of that or we're, we're okay with us not being a part of that those are decisions to be made as we write that ordinance. so there's a lot of flexibility in that well, I, I kind of think, guys, that we're at a we're at a critical point for Alamance County. I mean, when you look at us right now, when you look at that map that David Owens put up on the wall up two weeks ago, we are surrounded by counties that have already decided what they're going to do, we're the whole and we're kind of the target for somebody coming in that doesn't. We're, it, I, I look at that and I kind of think we are the tail on the dog. Right now, we have counties on that surround us we're their tail when they wag their tail what they want to have happen can come into Alamance County and we've got to try and come up with a way to protect the rights of our citizens who want to have self-determination about what they want to do with their property and at the same time protect the citizens who want to have privacy and clean water and right to get out and walk without having to worry about getting run over by a dump truck or dumped on by a dump truck so I mean and we have a lot of things to deal with and let's hear from the other three commissioners before we summarize I'm, I'm not summarizing okay I'm making <laughs> a statement <laughs> I apologize um, <laughs> I just I, I just think we're at this point in time that we need to, to be thinking about moving forward but I I wasn't summarizing for the, for the commissioners I was making a comment and so I'm open to hearing what the rest of you have to say about it <laughs> thank you question, question yes, from Mr. Albright um, am I correct that there's some time for a moratorium that is presumptively unconstitutional generally it's been a if it's over a year it becomes questionable okay so, so we're going to consider extending it to the moratorium outside of six months we would, we would probably not want to go past a year unless there is some really compelling need for it and from what the planning director has just stated uh, she believes it could get this done within six months eight months um, and you've heard testimony this morning from the citizens saying nine months to a year um, it's a very complex issue what you're discussing what you're considering and you you need to develop a statement that encompasses that that will that will survive any scrutiny from someone that wants to question the scope of the moratorium okay this kind of is how are we defining the small area that we're <laughs> attempting to consider that that is in the plan in the land development plan there's a map that shows you all what they were proposing in small areas and the small snow cap small area plan is defined in there that is the only place it is defined and that's been made available well yes public? that's been out on the websites for probably a year almost maybe a little less um question about the process so is it your office that's going to look at parcel by parcel uh, and make a determination about the land use best suited for that particular parcel? Right. We look at the parcel starting with tax data and then anything that seems to throw a flag we need to visit and well most everything's going to get visited in person anyway to see what they're actually using a piece of property for. We don't want to go out and just do some kind of generalized zoning and then we're automatically creating nonconformity. So that's not our goal. Uh, so we want to make sure what they're doing matches what the zoning is so that we at least first get them so that will be our job okay and then how do you define that, that areas 
the definitions for the particular areas you're going to look at? I mean, how, at what level of detail are you going to assign a particular land use? So like the zonings, the land development plan speaks to four or five zoning districts. And as we look at property, we'll kind of give us a lead on whether we go with the four or five. Uh, I feel like agricultural and residential maybe were lumped together a, good a little bit. We may have to divide those out a little bit. Um, Might it make sense to keep them together? Well, keeping it together could restrain some residential development depending on how much subdivision development you would like. But if you do agricultural and residential separate, you could do more of a protection of agriculture all by itself if you only turn it to that and allow fewer uses to protect farmland and protect things that come in around the farms. Or it could be used to allow more uses. Depends on how you define it. Depends on how you want to do it. So that's going to be part of that process is defining, establishing a land use table of all the land uses you could think of. Right. And there are always will be things that don't. We put a caveat in there for that. And then how many zoning districts? And once you start laying that out, it's we feel comfortable with four or no, we feel like we need five. So if I'm a resident on 30 acres in Snow Camp, um, currently it's I'm just using it to live on. I might, I might farm, I might not. It gets zoned as residential. How, as a citizen, do I interact with the process to say, no, 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 I want to farm on this in five years. I want it to be zoned agricultural. Oh, How do well, I farming farming's always exempt anyway, so they're good. But if they want to do something else totally different, they want to put a store on it later or right. a local community store right. or something. Those are discussions when we go out in person and have a map or something, they kind of tell us their future plans and say, well, if we write the business district onto you, what residential uses do we allow because we don't want to create that nonconformity to start with because right. they're living on it where it's the minimums that we would allow that if we allow it kind so of a citizen has a conversation with your office to to not only make a determination about what you're currently using your land for but what you might use it for in the future and that those conversations would go into the plan itself as it's developed they yes those would show up as we move along things could modify themselves as we move through the process from what we see something as and what tax already has it distinctly done, done for and then what it actually could be or is that process happens by discussion with them and then there are public uh, fora to allow for additional conversations with community right that's how long, um how long does the planning department think it would take to have not only sufficient amount of public fora for conversation but also to allow your office to meet with individual citizens regarding the use that they're currently using their land for and potential future use. So I think as we have it planned out right now, six months would allow me one public hearing with our public, public meeting with um, people in the area and then one meeting with planning board and one meeting with commissioners. I'd like to expand that. I'd rather have at least two with the public, one to get started and one to get finished right. after we talk to everybody. And I think planning board commissioners each need one to get started and get finished. How long would that process So I think we would add maybe 60 days to that to make sure I can get everybody's meetings in. So go okay, from six months to eight months. So you and then give me 30 months. days up front to make sure I can get the consultant signed on and get through our contract process. Does 30 yeah. days up front mean 90 days total? Uh, I mean, this 90 days 90 in days. addition to that initial six months so would be nine, comfortable. So you'd be comfortable with a nine month moratorium? I think that would be a good number. How much would we expend on a nine-month moratorium? Do you so, think? if we go off what we're based on now, we've been given a fifty thousand dollars estimate for a six-month time frame with only three meetings. So, if I doubled that, it's going to be a little over that fifty thousand. I uh, don't have exact numbers for what each meeting will cost, but it's usually more than a thousand, less than two thousand per meeting. Are you saying a hundred thousand? No, no. You said double. You said fifty, and then well, if you double that. No, 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 go 50,000, and then if we double the meetings, the amount of All meetings right. I have, I'm going to put six in instead of three, what they've already adjusted. So less than a couple thousand dollars per meeting would only run me about $6,000 more. So we're not talking about a huge difference, but there would be an increase to make sure we are comfortable and we have the amount of meetings that we would like. So you think between, between 50 and 60,000? Very fair, yes. And who does that go to? Who no, are we paying that? Consultants get paid to do that. Oh, okay. They're the ones that helped us write the land gotcha. development plan. Stuart was the company that we used. That and they've been in it with us the whole time. We all went digital together. I mean, it was a journey that we enjoyed and endured. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure they didn't help participation. Zooming, you know what I mean? As far as not, I know well, you went out as much as you could, but remarkably still. Remarkably better participation virtually than we've ever had yeah. in person for any of the plans that we've done over you know, 20 years. 
So that was surprising when we brought all the plans and stuff to people. We'd have an average of, I don't know, 20 to 30 people per meeting, whereas when I was virtual, I'd have over 100. Wow. wow. So it was a big difference for us, and it's a world we had never been in, so we didn't know what to expect. <laughs> yes, sir. More questions? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hanson? Oh, sure. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to have a general question and get a little more specific as we go down. Okay. Does zoning override any ordinance? Any ordinance that we put up here, if we go in to do countywide zoning, does that ordinance get taken away? Is that ordinance done? Is that uh, ordinance? It depends on what you write. Now, so the zoning matter. ordinance for Snow Camp will take care of any hydro or whatever we written into. All those uses should be written in theirs. But it doesn't go away for the rest of the county because they don't have that. So it just depends on how we write it. So if we wrote that ordinance, we wrote zoning in such a way it would supersede it could because mm -hmm. it would take those ordinances and write them in a different way so they would be the reason i ask is um it seems that your ordinance has taken solar out so solar farms have been taken away they have their own ordinance have their own ordinance mm -hmm. so that is going to be separate from our hido we're going to have our hido with solar gone Yes, except that we're writing a unified development ordinance that has to be completed this year by state law. All of them will come together and come combine again. Yes. Okay. Because we don't have anything else to do, we're going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> How many different land regulation <clears throat> ordinances do we have in place right now? So for development purposes, I think we're about at 25. We have 25. like 60 ordinances all together, but for unified development ordinance or development regulations, we're going to be unified. We'll pull all these together. Yes. Good. Okay. That was my. That was one. Very close to draft. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I'm done. Oh wow, I appreciate that. Well, I actually had my commissioners that I'm on the board with. They're uh, much smarter than I am, and they're very astute in their questioning. So they took away a lot of my thunder. So I'll ask the chairman. I'll get to go first next time. <laughs> I bet you really think about that oil. Which I was going to find in your head. That's the only thing I know anything about. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> Okay, that was that was my number one question. How many ordinances do we have? You've indicated roughly 60, is that correct? 60 altogether, but things that come together in that unified development ordinance don't include, include things like what the sheriff enforces and air patrol and stuff like that. Just mm -hmm. development ordinances, I think I'm at 25. And tell us particularly about the subdivision ordinance, which is already in place now. Okay, so our subdivision ordinance is really basic. Uh, if you've got well and septic on a piece of property, your minimum lot size is 30,000 square feet. You start going down from there if you get community well or you get water and sewer from somebody. We do have, the city's not so much, but we have some private groups that come in mainly from Orange County that provide some water sources. Very little sewer comes this way, that's much harder to build. So from there, you also look at watersheds. Mm -hmm. A lot of the county is in some type of watershed. You have two levels. The worst being critical watershed, that throws your minimum acres up to two acres. Your balance of watershed is at just at one acre. Minimum lot size for any development, anybody that puts a house in. So if you have 30 acres, you don't have to divide off to put two houses on. You just have to make sure that you're equaling the two acres per house. So you get four acres that can't be touched. The other 26 can. Our subdivision ordinance currently doesn't require you to subdivide off to put a house on a piece of property. You can have two houses, three houses, however many you need. Building code will step in at three houses and start requiring sprinkler systems on those if you have start getting multiple houses on a piece of property. Um, we also look at just um, mainly when you draw in your subdivision, when you come in here with something new, right? If you actually want to build 14 lots, it's just a small subdivision to us. And 14 lots, you can do a private road on anything up to 14 lots. You go past that, we're looking for some major road improvements to pavement. And currently, through building code and fire marshal's office, our roads, if you hit 30 lots or more, you've got to have a 26 foot wide pavement, <coughs> which gives you a 60 foot right of way. Traditionally, it's been a 50 foot right of way with a 20 foot pavement. But their laws have changed and some appendices that have been um, approved through this board several years ago has increased that. So then after you hit the 30, and then you have a trigger that require two entrances, depending on how many units you have. So it gets beyond planning into all the other pieces. So planning handles what is called a technical review committee. And every time we get a submittal on something, we take them to the committee and we meet twice a month. And the committee right now, we're meeting by Zoom, but normally we have the developers and everybody sitting at the same table. And we all give our comments to the developer and talk through 
what they see and what they could alter and things like that to help meet our standards. So those, all these developments, even commercial development, we're throwing into TRC, because even solar farms, they have a fire requirement where fire trucks can get in and be able to reach with um, their hoses far enough, less than 200 feet. So, but that's why we bring all these people together because everybody's got different rules. Gives our developers the opportunity on the front end to hear everything and know everything that the county's gonna throw at them. And they can decide if it's feasible to move forward because that's a, minimum investment to get to a TRC. It's just a light site plan drawing. There's not a whole lot of engineering or anything done yet. So that process happens with everything that comes through as well. So if I've got a track of land and I want to put as many houses on it as I possibly can, I've got to have, <coughs> excuse me, access to each and every one of those to a 60 foot right of way. Well, it depends on the minimum. development you're going. If you're going over the fifth, over 14 lots and you have to build a road, it could require you that 26 foot. Some people do, you know, 14, 15 lots, they have enough road frontage on the state road, they don't have to build anything. So it just depends on what you're doing. So you have to have access to the public road though? Or a private road. Mm -hmm. All right. But a private road can't come off a private road, so that's a complication too. Mm, a private road can't come off a private road? Right. Correct. Just one. That's, that's one of the many reasons I quit doing title searches. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I try yeah, to keep up with all that. <laughs> okay. Um, how long has the planning department studied this issue, and particularly snow camp? Uh, specific to Haida? Correct. I'd say about two years. It was late 18 when all this came up to us. All right, so you've already put a lot of time and study into this. We have. And you know, the, you heard from some people that live on Soapstone Trail. That's the old quarry that stopped mm -hmm. being used and became a lake. And that's, I think, a half mile or so from the current Trump. one we're looking at. So we, John and I just drove that last about two weeks ago. There's a little history down there that quarrying has been along for the ride for a little while. Yeah, a lot of those areas, once the quarry closes, become very attractive areas and land development, houses, uh, and so forth. All right, one of the callers talked about land values. Uh, I know that there's a, a track of land just off the quarry site uh, that's being sold for 700, and, I think 17 acres, and the selling price is $750,000. Have you seen an increase or decrease in, pro uh, in values of property since we've been talking about the moratorium and or the rock quarry? So I'm not the best person to talk about values. Jeremy Atkins is probably the best person, but what I can tell you is from a building perspective, we're continuously getting building permits out there. We're new construction has not stopped or hesitated in that area. So we haven't really seen a concern with that. That house is under contract, by the way. Yeah, I talked to the realtor yesterday. Are you moving? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody has a lot of money. So. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Um, You've looked at well water and the, uh, let me back up. The type quarry that's gonna be, and I know we're not talking about the quarry in this hearing, but uh, it's gonna be a granite mining operation. Is that correct? As far as I know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I haven't heard any difference, yes, so we'll go with that. All right. And, and earlier at some of your hearings and so forth, they were showing all kinds of blasting and what, that's not what we're talking about in Alamance County because they're not blasting the side of a mountain off, correct? Right, the level of blasting of course is regulated by the state, but we're not in that high intensity area. This is in fact internal blasting as opposed to external blasting. Mm -hmm. That's our understanding. All right. uh, is it likely to have any impact upon the well water? So we're not finding anything that says there would be. However, in my experience, when we had a coal ash spill in Rockingham County, everybody's well water was a concern. The state did step in and required some well testing within a certain distance of the spill, but we luckily had no issues. So that um, that becomes something higher than us and becomes really served by people that know a whole lot more about wells than the planning department would. And the state regulates well permits and well waters and everything, and they step in to regulate that. All right, but we don't have the coal ash issue here. We don't have a coal ash issue here, but if you have a contamination of any type, that's who comes in to help you. They are notified of an emergency situation and they bring their people in to help. But the rock quarry wouldn't cause that type of contamination, would it? As far it? as I can tell, we haven't found anything that would say it would. Correct. All right. You were talking about qualifying for farming, and that, uh, Mr. Turner, that was also your question. Um, <clears throat> if I own, and I don't, 
if I owned hypothetically a 20 acre track of land and I have not been farming it, what would I have to do to qualify that land to be treated for tax purposes and otherwise for farming? So you get a farm agricultural number from our cultural extension and there's some qualifiers at the state level. The, I think there's five ways you can do that. And then once you get that farm number, it gives you come over to the tax department and you can get a present use value with them. And then by, for planning purposes, whether you have a farm number or not, if you've got some kind of farm use going on that you can prove there are some farm exemptions and then you can go to bona fide farm with that farm number that you can do you can about build a lot of things excluding electrical power and residents on a piece of property you can do a lot with farmland that you can build your own and do your own work kind of thing and we can't take out farm use on property because as a county and state they're always exempt but that's not in your jurisdiction yet they have to get the farm number is that correct yes they just bring it to me but that's kind of their process of how but they get it define what i'm asking for is how do they qualify for that farm number well, the state has regulated that to the nth degree. The farm number is if you have tree preservation, if you can prove a certain amount of income or a certain amount of acres that are being planted. There's several different ways they've done that and they've changed that law a little bit in the last year or two. Mm -hmm. So I'm probably not as confident in that as I used to be. But the agriculture extension has all the details for them on what they can qualify to get that farm number. But my point is it's not easy to qualify and obtain that number. No, you can't put a plant in the backyard. Exactly. <laughs> Although some did used to do that. You pretty much have to qualify in one of the many ways is financially how much income do you have off the property. Is that correct? Right. And that for tax department they need to see it. It's pretty much I think you have to do for about a year or so to establish that. So it's not a slow process and it's not a guarantee that you're going to obtain that. Right. No guarantees. I know the previous board, and I know you have four new members, but uh, also talked about precinct areas. Um, if we get into the county precincts, there are 38 precincts in Alamance County, how would that, and I, you've provided to us maps of the snow camp area, <laughs> but let me define that even more. The snow camp area is not the fire district, correct? Right. And it's not a single precinct? It is not. All right. Um, as defined now, it's um, part of part a good chunk of Patterson Township, maybe all of it, uh, and a good portion of uh, South Newland. Does it also extend into North Newland? Do you, do you I've got you copy here. I'll have the uh, township now. I've got, I've got it. District uh, voting district. It looks like it might. Okay. So here you go. Have snow camp yeah. Can you put on my precinct map where the rock quarry currently is? Oh, well, the precinct map is going to be a little bit more difficult, but we can figure that out. It is right near Silva, so it's probably going to be in that North Newland precinct. All right, can you just put an X there? We can definitely count that. <laughs> the roads on here, it's a little bit harder to feel. We're not that far from Silver, so I'm going to put an X where I'm semi comfortable. That's where I'm going to put it. <laughs> Draw your X a little larger so that we can hand it around. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank <laughs> well, you. I've covered like 20 miles right there. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm going to hand that around to all the commissioners uh, with the precinct yeah, map. Um, how much awesome. difficulty would it cause you if we uh, restricted this area to the um, Newland precincts? It looks like it's almost at the dividing line where you put your X yeah. between South and North Newland, but not in Patterson at all. But you're suggesting restricting zoning to that? The zoning for that or the the, uh, the Hido, no, not the Hido, excuse me, uh, the moratorium. Um, I think that probably, it doesn't need the advertisement, but I guess we can make that discussion that if that's what the board wishes to do, I don't know. I don't think that we would take and have an opportunity to be further east or west of that where uh, our snow camp line moves to have any kind of hydro applications in the near, near future. But I haven't looked into that, so I haven't heard any discussions of that. I guess my concern is I've heard for so many farmers out there that don't want zoning at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I know they did not call in or send emails in. Uh, but having said that, I'm trying to 
at least define the area that it doesn't it's not such a massive area that would involve so many farms um, at this point the idea of the moratorium is to really study and develop a plan is that correct right mm -hmm. all right so even in the study could we not then redefine the area that's a question we could mm -hmm. that there's nothing saying we couldn't it's just our small area plan wouldn't match our zoning and that's doable that's something we just have to look at and see how that would fall out but if we because our study's been really concentrated in the whole area right but if we do a moratorium we could redefine during the moratorium period the geographic area we almost could do sub areas of the small area plan i think is how we kind of look at it <laughs> and one of the comments made john to the that we heard today was concerning the uh number the the, the 3300 acre site in in uh, randolph Randall. county okay mm -hmm. that's going to be including the precinct between mm -hmm. newland which is it goes home Patterson. Patterson. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it's going to be over here. So people that are in snow camp that we're talking about that are going to be in both these precincts. Or actually all three precincts. True. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a fear. I mean, Chatham County obviously has a very large, almost small town itself development coming up near our county line. But Randolph County has that industrial park that could felt they anticipate will develop and it could push people into Alamance County for living at least. So maybe even some transportation needs there from uh, companies in the industrial park. Just for the general public what we're talking about is Alamance County obviously is surrounded uh, on our southern and western borders by two different counties and that and Rockingham I think is where that industrial park Randolph, Randolph County excuse me Randolph County is where the industrial park is currently sited or located. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to hand that around so that you folks can see it. Can I ask a question, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Your comments, I'm wondering, you're suggesting that we continue a moratorium over the whole small area plan, but that in the process, we make a determination on whether we create sub areas where we have some level of zoning and or no zone. Either that or we reduce the uh, moratorium uh, area. I think either are real possibilities. Uh, that may, as, uh, as the planning director has pointed out, may require more advertising and postponing any action today or, uh, and so, of course, we don't have to make have a vote today on the moratorium. We can postpone that to our next March meeting or, uh, or we don't have to have it at all for that matter. All right, today's hearing was to get input. What I'll do with that is totally up to you. There's nothing that says you have to make a vote. But wasn't the whole point of this area is to make sure other big industries do not come in near this hot spot that we're talking about? Right. What, that's what I'm hearing through all the voices that we've listened to today. Right, and here's some of some of the like this soap stone, soap stone area is going to be a little further away from the Randolph County line but some of the people that talk today are closer a little further west than that X and closer to the Randolph right. County line and there's the, because there are fear of that industrial park and it's been around for a little while but it certainly is showing potential to get developed well then just all of a sudden boom it happens it, it, I mean, it, it just happen very quickly. they mm -hmm. just slide in from the sky literally that's what it seems like all right, I've talked to, um, I've talked to, I, I don't have a clue how many people, uh, and I've read many, many, many emails and uh, <laughs> listened to voicemails and, and whatever. Everybody has an opinion. <laughs> and a couple of the folks talked about the snow camp drama, which obviously with the COVID and the fire out there and so forth, has gone away mm -hmm. and I know the answer to this but I want everyone to know what impact if any would zoning have upon the snow camp drama we would make sure when we zone that we zone it appropriate not to exclude it or to make it non-conforming or to turn it somehow turn it into something totally different we want to keep it the way it is right we're not looking to change things we're really when we do zoning we're trying to go in and zone what's there so that everybody can continue the way they are if someone has a potential future growth there that they've got on the mind, we can work with that. 
but it's to keep it from anything out of the ordinary or strange or something that doesn't fit the area from coming in. You're, you're going to have, no matter what you do, when we added the health clinic down at Sylvan, we had um, parents to leave Sylvan because they were afraid of what was going to be coming in to that health clinic. I mean, it's just the, it's the way you look at things. And that health clinic is just an amazing place. The school's healthier. The community's healthier. It's right there. It's just the change of getting over that hump of looking at something that's different than what you don't used to having. And I'm just curious if you can just make me a statement because I got far, Farmer Dave calls all day long Saturday, fifth generation farmer that's down the road from all this. And I think the biggest thing I'm hearing from zoning out that way, which is where I'm from, is ain't nobody going to tell me what to do with my land. And I, I think that's exactly right because you're paying for that land. That's, you, that's where you walk and work and everything else. So if whatever kind of zoning this looks like because one thing leads to another, and we were one of four that's left in the state, so we all know what's been talking about. Can can no matter why we zone that, can we tell him what he's going to do with his farmland? It's like 300 and some acres. Right. So what we'd like to do is to protect his land is more what I see zoning as. I'm not trying to tell people, but yeah. we give them a list of land uses in the district that they're in. Give them lots of different opportunities. But should he choose to do something in a different zoning district, he simply goes through that rezoning process. It's not a forever, you have to stay like this. It's just an opportunity to move into a different district and you do have to ask permission for that. But he's got his land and he farms. And he's always going to be exempt because state law doesn't allow for you to regulate farming. Okay, so that's a big statement. Farming stuff is gimme. That's in any district, just that's for ever, well, it has <coughs> changed that all, but for us, that's just given in any district, you're good. It's all the other things that we... Well, I just think communication can kill us. It really can, because if it's, you're not hearing the whole story, or you're not hearing the story at all, except from somebody down the road, their opinion, it can, st that's a forest fire waiting well, to happen. Well, we've heard this morning, there's obviously been a lot of mm -hmm. talk and some mixed up words, so right. we don't want that to happen where anybody's confused or hears the wrong thing. Okay. Uh, we do, we do try to help yeah. At the same time, that same farmer and his son and daughter don't wish to continue farming, mm -hmm. it's really going to put a restriction on what they can do with the land, isn't it? Depends on how we write it, but yes. Any, exactly. It depends on what the board wants to do. If you want to be more relaxed with it, you can allow a lot of uses, even right. in the agricultural world. Or if you, you say we really all want... All industry or everything else. Yeah, you can do whatever you want. I don't know that we allow everything because that kind of defeated the purpose of zoning, but <laughs> if you <laughs> really want to protect agriculture and keep it very simple in the agricultural zoning district, you can do that too. It, it allows you to do whatever you're comfortable with. The biggest concern I've heard from farmers is what I said a few minutes ago. They get to the, at some point in the, in, the, in the cycle, the family gets to a point where the, the heirs no longer intend to farm the property. They no longer want to rent it and let somebody farm it. They want to sell it, get the proceeds of the farm value, and move on. And they find a buyer, and the buyer wants to do XYZ business, either residential development, uh, commercial whatever and the neighbors oppose it when it comes up to be rezoned from agriculture to whatever mm -hmm. and I think what they're looking for is some protection Am I right John right. they're looking for some way to protect them from that future decision and from what I understand and this is the the negative side of the whole zoning issue when when you've got neighbors on two or three sides of you that don't <coughs> want whatever you're proposing or whatever is being proposed by your potential buyer and they come to us and oppose it, then it's going to become a government decision about what happens. Am I correct? It truly is. It's from get-go, it's government decision. Right. The persons making the decision have to decide beyond what the neighbors are saying, does it fit the area? If it fits the area, then you don't have a good reason not to vote again just because the neighbor doesn't want another subdivision or want something around them because that neighbor could sell theirs off and want the very same thing just in five years or so and everybody moved there for some reason you built a house and your neighbor should be allowed to too maybe so that's the decision that sits with you all we're, when it comes down to it kind of like i said a few minutes ago too we're, we're kind of on the horns of a little level you want to protect what's there and provide as much rights as possible to the people to do what they want to in the future
that's difficult to achieve. Absolutely. That's what we do every day, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it, it takes planning, it takes discussion, and that's that's really what the next step in this process is. That's right. I'll have to figure out what you want to protect, what your goals are, yeah. and well, how we can do something to make that happen. With one more question before we get deeper. Uh, you said the consultant would cost approximately fifty to sixty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. What additional cost will be uh, incurred during the moratorium, and then what additional cost will we have if, in fact, we enter the zoning ordinance or plan, um, and how will that affect your staff? That's a really good question. That's like ten questions in one, but I already have figured those out. So good. what we have to do, we we will give. By law, we're only re required to put in the paper when we're zoning, right? Uh, let me, Whatever, let me indicate, I forewarned her about the question. Yes, so. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, so did I, John. <laughs> so we're only by law required to do uh, a paper notification and then like put it on our website and those kind of things. I think even before we went beyond what state law requires, we can send out some postcards and things like that, and that would be on the county. That would be county's cost. You know, we have our in-house printer, which helps with that. But the post office doesn't give us any breaks, so whatever that costs, we just have to pay for. And any extra meetings or extra um, types of things that people might need or additional printing of maps and things, we have the capacity here, but there is a cost associated with that. Um, our consultants allow you know, a maximum of however many copies they're going to do, and that's it. But we can redo anything. There's a cost of counting with that. Now, if we decide to do some zoning, you know, planning is a very minimum staff. We have a planner, we have a planning technician, and we have me. And so if we're moving forward with some regulations and some things where it's going to stir up people and people will need to come in and see us more often than us process more things, we're going to need to look at our staffing levels to be sure that people get accommodated in the way they need to be. So that actually is something we're projecting for budget purposes to see what that's going to look like. Unsure what our anticipated needs will be, kind of putting that on the back burner, see what would happen. But we will need some kind of capacity. We've never had that before, but that will also increase code enforcement on the code enforcement side, which is also handled through planning. So I pretty much have one person dedicated to code enforcement right now, and that works. Uh, but that's not a full time, it's probably a 50% time commitment for that one person. If we increase that, then we have to look at where our needs are. Okay, so currently, as a staff level, I might have between five and ten hours a week between the three of us to do something else, which is why we're bringing consultants. Because if you let me do the writing, it could take a while, like 18 to 24 months, because you just don't have time to do all that. But so we have very little capacity to take on much more on our staff level. For a county this size, to have a staff of three in planning is very small. But it depends on our future needs and what we're looking at actually implementing. What about facilities? Or do you have enough space to have the people where you're located now? You know, we've got some opportunities there where we can move and slide and shake a little bit and add a couple of little spaces if we need to. We get much bigger than that. No, no, we'll have to look at something else. But we have some ability where we're at. Now you said a thousand words. I want two numbers: a moratorium number, additionally, in addition to the sixty thousand, and what's it going to cost in the future? A uh, moratorium number really isn't going to change much. When we're writing the zoning ordinance, it's strictly the mailings and printings is all I have to worry about. Once you get that zoning in, I think your staff person is your cost. See, the, no, no, the moratorium period may be another $10,000. Oh, that'd be a gracious point. Yeah. All right. Uh, and what it's about with staffing and everything afterwards if zoning is in place? I think we need to add a planner one. I have a planner two now and I have a plan technician. I need that mid-range mid educated person in planning and then I can teach them the ropes. We need to add that staff person in there. And so is that two people? One additional person what we have now. And what kind of range are we talking about? Counting salary and uh, all the I can do government. salary. I don't know the plus minus benefits part. Just to hang it, would you have a guesstimation? Uh, what's your salary? And somewhere between one? forty and forty-five. That's what I think. Uh, sixty. Yeah, you're close to sixty thousand dollars with benefits total. That's the salary and benefits of the employee. Is that like a forever person or a temporary forever person? person? Okay. And you think that just one more person could do all of that? For the area that you're proposing now, yes. If we go to countywide, we have a new discussion. Uh, discuss. <laughs> uh, I think we would need one more planner or planner two with a little bit of education and then uh, a little bit of experience walking in the door 
and that's pushing a forty-five to fifty thousand dollar range plus benefits. So about seventy. Mm-hmm. She think snow camp area only probably seventy thousand dollars additionally, and countywide one hundred fifty. Probably so. All right. Because we've got computers and we've got a couple other things we'd have to include in that. So that kicks it up another ten thousand, but. <laughs> That's a Bruce call. I don't know how much okay. this thing calls. <laughs> he takes care of us. That's all I know. <laughs> okay. This is that, those are the questions I have. The other. Mr. Chairman, you brought up one, uh, one other question in my mind. Yes, sir. How is the planning board involved in this process, if at all? Uh, the planning board sees everything before you do. So they'll walk through the process with us. We'll do like two meet and greets, like, same as y'all at the beginning and then towards the end, and then have their meeting of a recommendation. And do the same thing with but they'll see it. Everything comes to them before it comes to you. Listen, all right, before we, uh, before she says, you know, forget us. <laughs> now, what, what other questions would you have as a county attorney of her that we might need to know? I think she's answered uh, every question. She's talked about citizens participating in the local meetings. Um, the date of termination, how much time she needs. She's talked about the application of this only to heavy industry and the reasons why we need it. So she's she has provided you with information for all four required statements that you have in the statute. I don't I don't have any other questions from her. All right. And I've uh, between you and Mr. Albright and Mr. Haygood and Tanya and so forth, uh, We've had really good direction um, as to um, yeah, the, the statements. By the way, that's in the uh, packet that was handed out to all the commissioners. Um, and you've got, I've forgotten what page it's on. It's under moratoriums, um, North Carolina General Statute number 160D107, and specifically um, the uh, a through D section of that, and they're spelled out. And thank you for such a good job. Absolutely. Oh, you're welcome. Whatever you need, I, I can tell you whatever I know. But whatever you need to know, I'll try to help you with. Hey, would thank you mind you. staying for just a little while while we can clean this? Do you want to stay one? here or have a seat? Have a seat. I'll have a seat. I'm gonna get a beverage. <laughs> and we thank you again, commissioners. Mr. Chairman, I, I think we can't leave this meeting without without putting in place some type of moratorium. We had more than 25 people call in unanimously asking for one in the Snow Camp area. I think a moratorium allows uh, us to further study the zoning implications of this area to include not zoning some pieces of that area. If, if that's what the planning board, the planning uh, department, and we decide in consultation with the citizens of the area. But I think we do need a moratorium. Um, and then I think we can we can, the devil in this will be in the details. And I think we, the moratorium, especially if it's nine months, provides us an opportunity to, to further look into this and make appropriate decisions. Mr. Lasher. I couldn't agree more. I think what you said is perfect. Um, I think we have to, uh, my only concern is the folks that I spoke with do not want zoning. The folks who picked up the phone and called me are don't trust government. They they don't see that they, they see that government could be not the solution here. And I tend to agree with them. I tend to agree with it. I don't I don't really trust government to um, not change in midstream. But that being said, I almost feel like what you said is what we need to do. We need to use this time to go through this moratorium, take the time and study the issue, let folks who maybe didn't phone us in today or send us something to uh, look at it. Because this, this, is, this is serious, this is big. Um, this is uh, gonna affect our county going forward. And I just wanna make sure, and I like what Tanya said, and that's, I guess that's where I probably need you to sort of like pinpoint because I, I think what you say is like I'm on the agricultural board as well 
And I think I like the fact that the farmers are are good to go. Now I'm just wondering if this moratorium, as long as it doesn't affect those folks, I'm good to go. And I don't believe it will. I got a question about something you just said, Craig. Um, can we spot or specifically exempt some farming properties from being zoned other than agri well I mean if they're zoned agriculture they're zoned <coughs> from being done with any anything else but that doesn't exempt them at the point in time at which they want to do something else with the property right it's a hard one yeah I mean, it just I don't know if you can put the language in there to say that <coughs> yeah I'm picking heads and I'm picking tails so you can have holes in your zoning and when you look at the cities there's holes sometimes where they've done where they haven't because um, people haven't actually been brought into the city limits or whatever. Um, not recommended from a planning perspective because if you're going to do the one, you do to the other. It's equal opportunity when you talk about planning. And why did you leave the hall? Did you really mean not to plan that area? Why didn't you plan that area? So that's kind of an idea. It's, it's done and you'll see it if you look at the municipalities, but not very common. Not a good idea. Let's right. that way. Let's talk about the legal issues with the uh, Spot zoning, I assume that's what you're talking about. No, that's not what we're talking about. Right. Um, spot zoning would be a very different zoning, like a heavy industrial zoning in the midst of residential. So mm -hmm. spot zoning is not illegal, but highly unrecommended um, from a legal perspective. Well, that's perspective. what you got right now, right? A spot in the middle of a residential. <laughs> well, <laughs> skip the zoning. Right. Well, just, well, just, but no <laughs> rules. <laughs> skip the zoning. We have yeah. a use. We have yeah. a use inside of an odd use. But having a hole in a zoning area is different than spot zoning. It's yeah. just blank. You don't push either ideas, so you're not wrong. I know in law school, Mr. Turner and I both had courses on spot zoning, particularly, uh, and, and the no no's regarding that. Uh, but I've not heard of holes in zoning. Uh, There's donut holes in a lot of places where you zone all the way around it with something in the middle that's not. All right. Something that's been there for a long time, such as a textile mill. Grandfather. Sort of be like grandfather. And all of a sudden, it's not there anymore. The use would be grandfather. Well, I have a friend who owns a property in Graham that they've owned for two generations. Mm -hmm. uh, and Graham City Council rezoned them but said, Your grandfather. Oh, was if you use the same business that's currently occupied in there. Well, that's, that's the definition what, of grandfather. Okay. As long as you keep on with what you're doing, how you're doing, and forevermore, you're allowed to do it. Well, that was a question that came up to me at this weekend when somebody has a home and they want to build another home on, on some rural property and the, it's not multifamily but there's a, I can't remember how many acres there was now is it 10 to 15 acres or something like that but they want to put a second and maybe a third house on it um, is there a prohibition on them being able to do that if they're not for planning. Once you get that third house, you got some building code issues. But you got the subdivision orders and the compliance there. Subdivision is only for when you're actually cutting the land up. Though. If you're just wanting to put multiple houses on one piece of land, I don't have any. Like it's a family land. and they want to build. Yeah. Several generations. Oh, they're not dividing the land up. I'm sorry. Right. I just understood. So if you're putting multiple residences on one piece of land, subdivision rules don't apply to you. Other than if you're in a watershed, you still have to protect so many acres per house. But if, until you actually start cutting them up. You know, some vision orders really well, that goes apply. back to a financing issue. Then you better have some dirt exactly. in the house. The banks don't to like get it financed. Yeah. yeah, you better have some cash because the banks don't like all yeah, that. You, they can't take it all if right. they have to come take something. And then you get into dividing well water and you know, set all kinds right. of issues. Wells can be shared, septics can't. Yeah. Well, from from the timing perspective, we've heard nine months. We've heard twelve months. Would it be better to go with 12 months and make sure that we don't have to come back into this and say in nine months we need three more months to get it done and go through? Would that require another public hearing, right? Now you're getting into Caswell County, and Caswell County did a 12 month moratorium. Right. And now they've just extended theirs out for another six months. They're, yeah, they're writing some stuff up there. Right. Um, with the idea that we're entertaining sub airing our small area plan already during this process that's going to add time my marching orders from what i was looking at was take care of this snow camp area now i'm hearing i might be dividing that area up and i've got to evaluate what that looks like too so 
that might that's going to add a little bit of time to sit down and do that. Well, as I'm, much I'm as just one of five votes. I right. am not but the board. If you threw <laughs> that in, the year would cover that. No matter what direction we end up going, the year I think would cover that if we come back to where we are now. But that would give us cushion. Well, Mr. Chairman, if you finish within 10 months, you can end the moratorium. Once you've got your ordinance for your small area plan, we can vote to end it. Yes. yes. I'm bored. I would prefer a nine month to what Caswell County did. I think because of what Mr. Albright just, just talked about, alluded to, uh, a nine month would be better than a 12 month. Would you agree? If we want to terminate it at the end of the moratorium. But he said we could terminate it before the end of the moratorium. Oh, sure. We, yes. So yeah. if we did 12, we could terminate it at nine. Yeah. But yeah. if we do nine and want to extend it, then we've got to go through another public hearing to extend it, correct? If everything's completed and you pass your ordinance. But if it's not. <clears throat> if it's not, then you need more time. Right. That means another public <clears throat> hearing and another. Yes. I to think extend we do 12, it. and then we've got it all packed in. If we need to, if we if we're done in nine, we're we're done. If we're not done in nine, we don't have to go through this again. So, all right, would you have a preference? I'm just the elite, I'm just the simple soldier <laughs> that advises the board. I'm not. Nice I'm not, cop out. I'm not elected, and I can't I can't give you. That uh, I think through all this, you do it tomorrow. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve. This has got to be accepted that no matter how long this is, and we look at this, that rock quarry is there. <coughs> it's, it's there, and they're going to be, that's, that's there, and I think that's the biggest hump that um, I think our callers and people that wrote in have, have got to accept, and I think that's hard. That's very difficult, but I think that is the most definite thing in this conversation. Jim, I, I've got a proposed uh, motion and a proposed statement of, all, of justification to go along with it if the chair would want to hear it. I think that's appropriate, yes, sir. I move that we implement the moratorium for 12 months on the small area plan for the entirety of the small area plan based upon the following justification. One, the need to protect the rural agricultural uses of the Snow Camp area and the historical and cultural significance of the Snow Camp area. Two, the unanimous comments of over 25 citizens of, of Snow Camp that are in support of a moratorium. Three, the possibility of dividing the small area plan into sub areas that may or may not include zone. And four, based on uh, Ms. McCaddle's comments here today and the planning department's need to further interact with citizens of the area to discuss current and potential uses for their property and the need for public discussion on all of these issues. A second. All right. Your comments. You want to discuss it first? I don't, I don't, I don't have any more further comments. All right. Well, we have a motion and a second. Are there other comments? I, that's a heck of a motion <laughs> as far as having to repeat that. I think it includes everything you can imagine. Yeah, I think it follows the, the uh, general statute. Mr. Albright, you concur? I agree. He has uh, covered all four requirements. Correct. I totally agree. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Did we get a second? All opposed signify by saying no. Unanimous. Just want to remind everyone that this is a moratorium. This is not zoning, and we are looking at zoning, but we are. This vote had nothing to do with zoning the county or further prohibitions with your land at this point. It is a moratorium at this point only. Okay, that covers the zoning portion. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is now roughly 1230. Um, would someone like to make a motion I'll that make we a adjourn motion for lunch and then come back at 2 o'clock? That's up to you guys. 
I'm, I'm, I'm we have a motion. Question. Does anybody else says. concur? Hmm? We'll say, have to say it. <laughs> Do you okay. second that? Sure. Okay. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Uh, in discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? We're adjourned until 2 p.m. Call the meeting to order. At this point, you know, we don't have a, a clerk yet. Let's hold up just for a minute. Madam Clerk, I think we're at the public speaker session. She's not here yet. Okay. I think we can proceed, Mr. Chairman. If you would no, like no. to, we can go ahead and I think we have one call. Is that one correct? call for agenda item. Excellent. Gonna, yes, yeah. if you could go ahead and take the call, that'd be great. Okay, public speaker. Hello, you're at the Board of Commissioners meeting. Mask is speaking. Oh, this is Henry Vines. Oh, hi, Henry. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. Good. You can go ahead and make your comment. You, you have three Good minutes. Evening. Okay. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Henry Vines, and I, I live in Stowe Camp, 3450 Isley Drive. I just called in regards to the, a couple things on the agenda, and uh, that's the budget amendments that are being proposed. Uh, one being the cards that are being offered to be given away. I would like to ask why we can't just sell those and add that money back to the county. You know, it's, that is county taxpayers' money um, and could go toward, you know, uh, much needed funds for the county. Um, also, um, I wonder on the savings that we occurred on the um, J.B. Allen building at the courthouse. That J.B. Allen come in at 26% less uh, than had budgeted and the other one's at 16% uh, for the courthouse. I wonder, if, you know, this sure went out for me and, um, and uh, it's $96,000. It would be nice to have that money go back into the general fund instead of spending it before we ever realized the same and uh, i would just appreciate uh, y'all's consideration on that and also you know these continued budget amendments that keep spending money uh i know four of you uh, have campaigned on being conservative and uh, mr turner he hasn't had that pleasure of campaigning yet uh but um I would appreciate y'all taking the conservative look at this and you know trying to save money in, uh, in order to give maybe give the taxpayers uh, a property tax decrease for the next year. Thank you for your consideration and uh, goodbye. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you, Henry. Are there any other callers? I said there was only one. No more calls. All right. Any commissioners' responses, if any? There being none at this point, uh, we need to approve the agenda. We've already done that, have we not? Yeah, the consent All agenda right. is next. We have the consent agenda. Motion to approve. Any comments? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? It carries unanimously. Next discussion, heavy industrial development orders. We've already done that. Is there any further discussion on that at all? There being no further discussion, register of deeds. Mr. Barber. You skipped. We did the whole thing. This is on the consent. That's on the consent. 
No. Okay. Got one there. You look red. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm David Barber and I'm uh, Register of Deeds in Alamance County. Direct your attention over here. I've got some uh, points or PowerPoints, I think you call them, I'd like to make. Uh, this is a motion uh, to uh, give um, uh, the uh, Register of Deeds to free up $70,000 from um, a fund that we have. Uh, that's allocated for a computer uh, enhancement uh, for the office. It doesn't come out of the budget itself. It comes out of revenue collected by the count by the Register of Deeds for uh, uh, for times like these. And just a little bit to recap, if you don't know, or some of the people listening or watching don't know, uh, the Register of Deeds um, located here in Graham. It maintains records including birth certificates death certificates, marriage license, and real estate deeds all associated with Alamance County. And we provide access to these records as efficiently as possible to uh, our citizens or whoever wants them. Uh, most people access these records online and in order to access them we use software, a software system to help organize, and organize them and to allow searches of our records. Uh, we've used um, uh, Logan system, our present system, since 2013. We've had some problems with them, and I've listed those. Uh, it's not user friendly. We get a lot of complaints about um, accessing it. Uh, we get um, they're frequently down, out of service, and we have to get um, someone from Logan to put them up again. It's difficult for our staff to use. their delays in repair, and this has been going on for some time. <coughs> Um, we're proposing that we switch from Logan to Cot. Uh, Cot was the system used originally by Alamance County from 1973 until 2013. You can see up there, it's a company that's been around a long time. A quarter of the counties in North Carolina already use it. It's a leader in innovation and service, wide array of services for citizens. We consider it very user friendly, easy to use. They have a good service record. Uh, and they're planning, uh, we're planning to go ahead at the Register of and, and Deeds and do new things. We're going to, we're moving toward a system where you can use your credit card to get anything you want at the uh, Register of Deeds. We're not there yet, but this is coming. Uh, so we're going to be catching up with what they do in the private sector. Um, as I said before, there's a statute. I've listed the statute there. This money does not come from the county budget. It doesn't uh, cause uh, taxes to go up. This is a money that's set aside. The county controls it, but we need the action of the county commissioners to free up some of this money. So this <coughs> money will come in free up and allow us to switch over to the um, uh, COT system, which we had a very good experience with. Uh, the transition will take about 90 days. We're setting right now for June the 4th, which is a Friday, for it to be fully implemented. Uh, and the future improvements, the COT software usage will bring improvements, better customer service, fewer internet complaints, quicker actions, and we can move forward with the beneficial changes we're proposing for the future. I have with me today a, a representative from COT, uh, Mr. Jonathan Register, is up here from all the way from Newborn, North Carolina. <coughs> And I've been dealing with him, and the, uh, he's been dealing with the IT department and the uh, county attorney, and we've got everything basically in place to go forward, go forward with this. We're just uh, waiting to see if we can get approval today by the county commissioners on this motion. Any questions? Was it just a personal preference to switch to Logan from Cot and now back from Logan? Wait a minute. You had Cot originally, and you switched yeah. to Logan? Was it just a personal preference to go back to Logan, and then now you're going back to Cot? I mean, what happened to Logan? Just personal preference? I would, I would, I, I tried to outline this in the motions. It, uh, when I was here, it was Cot. After okay. I left, a decision was made uh, to go uh, to Logan, and there's a there's a discretion among the Register of Deeds in Alamance County in the, in the state of North Carolina to move back and forth between software providers. Mm -hmm. I would say our experience with um, uh, Logan the last few years has been one of uh, bad service and lots of complaints okay. and they're not innovative 
Um, and uh, so when I, I was elected, I, re I know the, the, the uh, service and the relationship we had with COT was very good. So I'm trying to move back to uh, what I think was a superior system. I can't address exactly all the issues that happened when it was switched back, but I can tell you why we're switching to uh, COT this time. Well, the software, do you do the maintenance or do you do the maintenance? So we provide updates to okay. the software. Okay. We'll, we'll update the software. Okay, I'm good. Ms. Thompson, I might also add, uh, having done way more, too many title searches in my legal career, uh, m many, many more than I would like to have, and with the estate work and everything else I do, we visit Mr. Barber's office on a regular basis, and I have a preference. Uh, I'd yeah, like to see the move. I, I've seen the good and the bad. Uh, and well, thanks, the system thank you, you had thank previously you, was good. Uh, I look forward to returning if this board approves. Okay, thank you. I'll make a motion to approve the I got one question. Oh, excuse me. I got actually two questions. Uh, Mr. Barber, you said that this particular item is not in the budget. Why? Uh, this item, there's money that is set aside uh, for this. It's not in the budget. It's in a computer enhancement and automation fund, which is described in the general statute that I referenced. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of money in there. How much? Uh, about 800000 right now. Okay. So this would come out of that uh, 800000 And that money can only be used for computer enhancement. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be used for other things to preserve records and update books and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a statute that really existed in all 50 states. Some of the states, like Virginia recently in the last few years, has, in budget crisis, gone back and claimed that back, but we haven't done that yet uh, in this state. So that's the only thing it can be used for. Okay. Um, how, much, how much are we paying per month for the system you currently use? It's a little complicated. We're paying about $7,000 a month for that. But when we, we move to, uh, and he can address this, when we move to his system, we pay paying 3500 mm -hmm. But that's a little misleading because for the 7000 uh, in our contract with Logan, they provide the hardware. So we're put, uh, getting the hardware. And now, as uh, the gentleman from IT can tell you, and we've had, they will be providing for the, the hardware, and we will be paying them, uh, you know, leasing, like everybody else in the county does, hardware from them. So it'll be you kind know, of roughly the same, but the, the the duties will be divided. Okay. And uh, but they'll be responsible for the service and keeping everything up and the software and, and all like that. And we'll be getting, I think, superior service with our own county IT department. And you said this contract starts uh, June fourth, is what you're shooting for. Well, there's a provision in the existing contract. We're going to get out of the, uh, the that contract. Was my next question. And uh, uh, Mr. Albright knows about this. Oh, it was signed for like four or five years a couple of years ago about uh, what the previous register was here but there's an out clause in it which says that you can give 60 days notice and you can get out of it we're asking for 90 days notice just simply because it's it's kind of complicated we've got our IT department and we want to make sure there's enough time but there's a provision in the contract which is standard in most of these contracts that any party can get out if they give uh, 60 days notice. So we're exercising that and I'll draft a letter and send it off this week to that effect. Perfect. I'm good. And Mr. Albright, you're comfortable with that that notice and so forth? Yes, it's in the uh, it's in the Logan contract. Mm -hmm. I explained that to the Register of Deeds and we've also amended their contract with my usual language. So we're good. Excellent. I can remember when Mr. Webster was talking about getting everything put online. Mm -hmm. Is that done? And so where is all of the hard copies still stored in your building or is that stored somewhere else? Yes. <laughs> oh, we know each other. Don't even David Barber. Um, I mean, do you have a site where you store all your stuff that maybe you're not using like you were? Or does it still stay there? I'm just saying, do you have both located in the same We have, we have uh, the, the fiscal books there, plus yes. we have it stored uh, off-site. All the backup is stored off-site. Okay. Where is off-site? Um, is it secret? It's <laughs> classified. Huh? Okay. I'm not exactly sure where it is. But, the archives has a copy. Well, okay. the, ar the archives has a copy too, but our 
uh, when we when we get them, they they'll store it in uh, Ohio. Yeah, really. mm -hmm. So there'll be a back, there'll be a copy here. There'll be a backup in Ohio in our data center, and we're also going to host the search so the internet goes down here and still be online to the general public. Okay. Okay. Funny. <laughs> Okay. I liked your answer, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Is it, we have a motion on the floor? Yeah. Is it been approved? Mr. Carter wants, wants to uh, make a motion. We have made a motion, motion yes. Second. second. Do we have a second? Second. All right. Any further discussion? No. All in favor? <laughs> All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Excellent. Passes unanimous. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> All right. Okay, Mr. Mr. Health Director, I think you are next. Tony Loji. All right, Chairman Paisley, Vice Chair Carter, Commissioners, good afternoon. Um, so I'm going to start out as I always do, and I definitely want to give a big shout out and thank you to the men and women at the mm -hmm. health department and all our volunteers and municipal partners that are out there on the front lines and helping us vaccinate the community. I want to give a big thank you to ABSS and the CTEC staff who uh, allowed us to be guests at their facilities for the month of January and February to uh, do primary dose vaccinations. Uh, we pretty much took over their parking lot in their second floor and so we're very much appreciative um, of, of uh, them helping us in that effort. Um, third one is a big shout out and thanks to Joel Brooks and his staff for helping us get up uh, Eric Lane up and running. A lot of work took place uh, during the month of February for Eric Lane to come online um, and he was the driving force, he and his staff were the driving force to make that happen. And then last I want to thank Bruce and his IT staff um, especially over the weekend, they work nonstop for us, and I will tell you why in the last slide. So a little teaser trailer there. All right, so to begin with, we have our updated count. This is as of midnight last night. Um, 31 cases came in. Uh, that gives us 398 active cases two weeks ago when I reported. Uh, we were at 618 active cases. We've had 237 deaths. Um, and two weeks ago, we were at 228 deaths, so that's an increase of nine. Um, our weekly average of cases coming in are currently at 49 cases a day that are coming in. Um, and then two weeks ago when I was here, I reported 69. So we've seen a 20, 20 case decrease uh, per day. Our percent positive, I know that's hard to see, is at 7.7%. Um, that's down from uh, 8.7, which was last week, and then 8%. Uh, when I was here in front of you um, two weeks ago. Um, if we do a rolling average of that, so meaning we're not taking a snapshot by week by week, but we're overlapping the weeks, it's about 8.3% of percent positive rate. Weren't we lower than that for a, at one point? Weren't we down about 4.9 or 4.5? The state, the state that was down, state. down no, they're around 5% statewide right now. Yeah, so we've been in that, that 8 to 7% 7, 7 range. Um, so our new cases per 100,000 population over 14 days is down to 502. Um, this is down from 800 when I reported uh, two weeks ago. That's good. Yeah, so continue to decrease. Outbreaks, we have eight nursing homes in outbreak, eight residential fil um, care facilities, so that's a two decrease from two weeks ago. Zero congregate living, so that's one decrease from uh, two weeks ago, and then uh, one correctional. And then our clusters, three child care, they should be coming off the list this week. Knock on wood, there's no more cases in those child care. And then K through 12, there's zero clusters. Good. Yeah. So our COVID cases, so this is from January to current day. Um, we've had 51 deaths out of 5,590 5, cases. From our long-term care facilities, 25 deaths out of 225 long-term care facility ca cases. If we back out the long-term cases and just look at general population, uh, 26 deaths over 5,365 cases. So long-term care facilities over to total deaths, um, 25 out of the 51. So almost a 50-50 um, uh, split there. So this is really what we're gonna be watching over the next couple months. Um, cases in long-term care facilities, especially as folks get vaccinated, hopefully there will be a decrease of that occurring. Um, age group, um, about uh, 
from 75 or 65 and older, it's been uh, 48 deaths. So that's been the majority of the, the deaths in that, in age, that age difference. All right, this is our state data here. Um, so first dose is administrated to Alamance County residents, 22,045. This is 13% of our total population. If we pull that out and just look at our vaccination population, which is 18 and older, um, that brings up us to 17% of that pop vaccine population vaccinated. Um, so we're almost one fifth of the way there, one way to kind of look at it there. Um, when we look at just our 65 and older group, 55% um, of our population here at Mats County, 65 and older, have been vaccinated. So definitely moving up. Uh, with that piece, one thing we're watching is saturation. Come on, we continue to watch our call center volume um, to see we've seen it slow down a little bit. So we might be reaching saturation with that population, but we're going to continue to monitor and see how that goes. For our second dose percentages, um, second dose in Alamance County, 11,889. When we look at just what the health department has done, um, first dose, our total allocation, 11,945, but we've given 13,000. 203 shots out of that 11,000 allocation. Mm -hmm. Second dose is 9,195 um, allocated, and we've given 8,254. Quick question: You may have you may have said it. I don't, and I didn't just didn't catch it. Did we know how many teachers have been vaccinated so far? Uh, I'm about to, about to hit that on the next slide. Yeah, okay. Talk a little bit about that. Excellent. Thank you. All righty. So uh, we moved into uh, group three. Um, for the teachers on February 24th. Um, there are strength in par partnership. We've been working with Cone Health, Piedmont Health Services, Total Care Pharmacy to be able to start vaccinating our school and child care group. Um, just last week, we were able to offer 1,762 uh, vaccines to this group. Now, not all 1,762 necessarily came to us for a vaccine. Um, some folks went elsewhere. Some couldn't make their appointments, um, but uh, we were able to offer that to at least that, that group. Over the weekend, we vaccinated more than a thousand um, educators and, uh, and childcare, um, not just the health department, but Cone, Piedmont Health Services, and our pharmacies. I don't have a total number because I don't get to see Piedmont's um, data or, or um, total care pharmacies, but we estimate basically what we did was we partition, partition the list out and said, you guys take this chunk of folks, we'll take this chunk of folks, Cohen, you take that chunk, um, and they start working on the list. Uh, our weekly allotment continues to be around uh, 1570, so that's how many vaccine doses we get each week. ARMC gets about 1170, and then about 500 is, is given to other community partners for Piedmont Health Services and our local pharmacies. Um, Greensboro is about to get a federal site um, at, four site, at Four Seasons. They anticipate doing about 3,000 doses a day um, at that site, and that is slated to begin sometime in March. And then as you may have seen, if you watch in the news, Johnson & Johnson was approved and has emergency use authorization. I don't know what it looks like as far as how much is coming into the state. Uh, my hunch is Johnson & Johnson will be used for mass vaccination events. That way it's one and done. But the good news is that will hopefully free up some vaccine for us on the Pfizer and Moderna side. So stay tuned. I hope to hear some positive news on that. We'll hopefully find more tomorrow. We have a state call um, with, with the state and local health department. So hopefully we'll have some more information. I know. Johnson & Johnson just one shot. You don't have to come back for the second. Yes, sir, that's correct. One shot. Yeah, and double tap. <laughs> And when do these typically arrive? So from my understanding, Johnson & Johnson started shipping last night. Um, and so, again, I don't know what's coming into the state or, how, again, how they kind of partition that out. Um, but we'll find out tomorrow, I'm sure, on our state call and, and have further information. So on they'll that. give us a heads up on which kind of shots we're getting? Or? Correct, yeah. So I'll find out on Thursday, typically, Thursday evening. Um, we'll get our allocation, how much is Pfizer, how much is Moderna quite possibly how much is Johnson Johnson. But again, my hunch is that's just going to go to those mass vaccination sites and we'll continue to get Pfizer and Moderna, but maybe more. So. so we'll have that update for our Friday call. We'll have that update for our Friday call. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully, I, hopefully I have some good news. <laughs> um, so this is our providers that have registered to be able to receive vaccine. We're now up to 16 uh, providers here in the county. Elon University is one of the newest providers that just came online. So 
as soon as we have vaccine to be able to, to give out, the states have vaccine to give out, there's more folks that can help us get vaccine distributed moving forward. There was an interesting article in the day's paper about the uh, occurrence of COVID on college campuses and said it's really, really down. Um, even in even with college students and the way they congregate, is that about the best way to put it? <laughs> <laughs> we, we, yeah, we've been in touch with Elon, and they've been very proactive. Um, you know, I know they had the little the early on little little um, troubles there, but they've been very proactive, uh, making sure that that uh, COVID does not continue to spread in there. Yes. We're less like Wake Forest, uh, Wake Forest fraternity in the four four falls in <laughs> yeah we don't want that to happen <laughs> all right so this is our, our new eric lane site um this is the entrance here to eric lane with the nice um signs is vaccinate elements in partnership with cone and this is where folks would enter into the building here um that top left picture there um is what the building looked like um before we we moved in um, the, the middle and the right picture there are, are all um, the work and uh, all the hard work that the folks did to make this happen. So this is our check-in area and our medical screening area. Very safely done. Folks are six feet apart, very socially distant, and they're escorted throughout the building as they move from station to station. We have wheelchairs on site for folks that uh, might have some mobility issues. In a worst case scenario, they can't come out of the car. We, again, we'll go out and vaccinate them in their car. Um, so up top left again, this is our vaccination room. Again, very bare. Um, this is what it looks like right here uh, with the uh, screens put up. And this is where the folks go to get their shot after they've been screened and checked in. Um, this is a combination. Again, you can't tell who's code and who's the health department for the most part when you're in there unless you see their name badge. Yeah. But that's, that's pretty much it. This is our observation area. So top left again is before we moved in. and. But the uh, right hand side there is um, folks observing, wait, wait, wait in their 15 minutes, possibly 30 minutes, um, and then they go to checkout and they're all done. Um, it, has, it has been very smooth transition. They are not on site very long, um, 30, 30, 40 minutes and they are out the door. Um, so it has worked very well since we opened up on Saturday. This is our command room here. And so the cool thing about this, if you see that TV screen in the middle, the city of Burlington um, hooked us up with some cameras for our second site over at Stadium. So we not only have radio communication with them, but now we have eyes on site. So it's just a benefit for us to be able to see what's going on over there in case any hiccups occur. Um, so we're able to manage both sites. All right, this is the, the big announcement piece that Bruce and his staff have been working on all weekend and testing it out and make sure um, it works well. We now have www.vaccinatealements.com and you can schedule an appointment online. It opened up today at 0830. And of course, just like our call center, which is still in place as well, um, all appointments are taken until into full. Um, so once they filled up, then of course it, it, it shuts down until we have more appointments available. Um, so big kudos to, to Bruce and his staff for making that, that uh, happen for us. Um, so now we have both the phone center and online ability. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I want to thank you and Bruce. That uh, online component, as the age brackets get more, it's going to be extremely important. Thank you, buddy. Mm -hmm. I agree. Just a. Uh, Commendation to you and your staff and, uh, and folks at Cone. A uh, number of us were up here at Queen's site on Saturday. Uh, I, I, I couldn't have imagined a smoother process. And, and talking to the folks as they were in the recovery and leaving the building, I, I didn't hear a single negative comment about about folks' experience. It was truly seamless whether you, you were there for a Cone appointment or a health department appointment. Uh, so, I, I mean, really great job to you guys for making that happen. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I know I spoke to a lot of the people who were there, and a, a huge number of them were teachers. Yep. So I was really tickled to hear that we got our teachers get out there and get them vaccinated so we can get them back into the schools. Who did all who did all that tape on the floor, like all that laying out? Who thought of all of your floor plan stuff? <laughs> yeah, so that that was a coordinated effort between um, our planning team, mm -hmm. um, Alex Rimmer, 
um, the cone planning team, Joel. Um, we were actually joking on, on Friday because they had the last minute stickers to put down. And it, it was exercise, right? You had to bend up, stick and peel and mm -hmm. press. And so it was quite the amount of exercise to get all those stickers <laughs> down. But, uh, I mean, that's a well. huge plan, yeah. a vision. I mean, it really is. Thank you. Well, I have to say, I was over there when y'all were doing the original walkthrough, and it was like you were falling over each other to try and figure out who would do it first. <laughs> and everybody was trying to get into the act. Uh, all the agencies that were involved were, were just doing whatever they could do to make this work. I'm just really proud of what we have going on in Alamance County. I just want to say not only thank you to you and your entire team, but if I have a question in the middle of the night, both Brian Haygood and Tony are always there, always answer the phone. I don't think you guys sleep, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Just want to say thank you. Tony sleeps at the help department. <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit, too, we can throw Clyde into that because when he, when he, even when he's cutting down trees, he answers his cell phone. So. <laughs> or cutting up dead trees, or falling trees is what it was, wasn't right. it, Clyde? <laughs> and for that matter, Tanya. Mm -hmm. I've, I've called her way too late and she's right there so <laughs> thank you all Tori thank you Dad. I, I, I said Tanya I meant Tori <laughs> so I, <laughs> you're really blessed Steve's here to correct me <laughs> thank you sir thank appreciate you. it and admittedly Tanya too oh I've absolutely called her since range times and she answers the phone so okay Brian, are you doing the next one or is Adrian? Uh, Adrian Day is joining us by Zoom and will be doing a presentation about uh, COVID impact on DSS services. Thank Good. you. Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't hear? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. Thanks for having me. So last Tuesday, we had our DSS board meeting and Commissioner Thompson um, felt like we needed to share some information regarding um, child welfare and adult services and our family justice center data um, and what impact COVID has had on those numbers and so of course keep in mind behind every number is a family or a child or an elderly uh, adult or disabled adult or for FJC there's a victim who is in need of services so Bruce do you have the PowerPoint up yes yes Okay, so I'll jump right in with the um, first slide. So we'll start off by looking at um, child welfare. And so of course when COVID hit, the stress on families um, increased tremendously. So we had, of course, um, parents who lost jobs and, and parents who then became um, full-time teachers and trying to navigate um, being, being teachers and having children at home. So that, that stress level went up. But by mid-March, um, schools were completely virtual, so students were at home. So two of our biggest reporters are um, educational providers as well as um, medical providers. And so when COVID hit, both of those populations lost, eye, lost contact with, with our children. Um, and so what we saw was we saw a tremendous decrease in our numbers of abuse, neglect, and dependency reports. Um, so by, by April and May, our reports were down by 45%. And um, so what, what we also saw is that when we looked at um, June and July and August, um, you, can, you can see that we don't have those numbers reported there. And that's because during the summer months, um, we don't see as many um, reports for child abuse, neglect, or dependency because school is out. Um, but as soon as school started back in August, we started to see an uptick. But by um, October, as you can see, our, our numbers started our numbers started going up um, significantly. And then by December, that gap that used to be 45% was down to 23%. And so that let us know that, that teachers and um, physicians were starting to call in those reports when they um, saw things or they suspected things. We also had a, a great push to let people know we started getting calls of just inquiries. Um, is this abuse? Is this neglect? And what we would always say, and, and the way we always advise um, the community is, if you suspect something, call it in and we will make that determination of whether it's abuse, neglect, or dependency. 
Um, the other thing that we saw is the severity in our cases um, and the seriousness and the complexity of our reports. So we saw um, a 32% increase in our investigative reports. Those are our most serious allegations. So those are truly your physical abuse, sex abuse, human trafficking, those cases. So when we saw those cases, um, we also started to notice that even though the number of reports that we were um, taking in uh, were lower, lower our, the number of children coming into foster care remained consistent. Um, and so that really just kind of spoke to the complexity and the seriousness of the cases that we were getting. Um, so the other population that we lost contact with were, are our Lynx children. Those are our children who are in that age group from um, 13 and up, but specifically our older children who are older youth, I should say. We call them youth, they're actually adults, 18 to 21. Um, we generally have um, meetings every month, but once COVID hit, we were unable to have those face-to-face -face meetings. And so um, at that point, um, the youth, they weren't interested in having virtual meetings. And so we lost contact with some of them. Um, but, but I must say our social worker does a really good job getting out there, trying to make sure that, you know, he can find them and, and that they are doing okay. We also saw, like, like most places, we saw an increase um, in our COVID exposure among our staff. And so that, of course, had um, a direct imp impact on the services that we provide. Um, we had a situation where um, staff were providing services to um, one of our uh, children. And um, we had um, a little over 30 social workers who were quarantined at one time for a two week period. And so that had an impact on um, families who had children in foster care because at that point we didn't have staff who could do those visits um, with, with families um, that children, uh, that they're, they were normally having um, every week. Um, next slide, Bruce. So, so then we look at um, adult protective services and we saw similar um, trends in adult protective services. So you know when COVID hit, um, our, our elderly population or our disabled population, they um, were not going to see their physicians on a regular basis. Um, that's typically our uh, largest reporter for um, elder abuse and um, neglect and then exploitation. So, so they were isolated and so we, we didn't have eyes on that population. Then um, you also think about, so our um, elderly and disabled who are in facilities. So at that point, relatives couldn't go in to visit their loved ones in facilities. And so because of that, we weren't getting those abuse, neglect, or exploitation reports. So we, we saw that decrease. Um, the increase that we did see was in unclaimed bodies. I don't know if... Um, many of you know that DSS is responsible for unclaimed bodies. Um, at the morgue, and so generally we we may see um, five, four or five unclaimed bodies within a year. December was our highest month that, that we've ever seen. Um, we actually had uh, eight unclaimed bodies in one month in December, and we had five in one week. Um, so that was, and they were all COVID related. And so um, that, that was an increase for our staff to actually handle as well. And likewise, um, the same with um, Child Protective Services and um, Child Welfare, we saw um, our adult services staff being impacted with COVID and, and being quarantined. And of course, that had some impact on services. Um, the one thing I'll tell you about, um, actually all three of these um, areas that I'm talking about for DSS, and that's Adult Services, Child Welfare, and Family Justice Center. Um, if someone comes into the building or if we get a report where there's a home that's COVID positive, we have to respond to, to that location. So before staff go out, they actually call CECOM to see if that address is flagged. And if it's flagged, our social workers have to put on um, our, their PPE and they have to go into those environments. And um, we, we've not stopped doing that throughout COVID. Next slide. So Family Justice Center um, is the final area that uh, we'll look at today. 
And if you'll see um, to the slide to the left, um, the red line represents unduplicated clients served by the FJC. Um, and so we, of course, saw that number drop from 1,300 in 2019 to 904 in 2020. Um, the yellow line represents the number of visits to the FJC, and so that may uh, represent duplicated clients there. Um, and then, of course, the brown number are return clients within the same year. And so if, if you can actually just look at the graph and see that in all three of those areas that we had a decrease um, due to COVID. The one thing that we did notice uh, for Family Justice Center is the number of emergency restraining orders um, remain the same. And so really what this showed for us, we, we really talked about this data and what does that look like? But I think the thing that uh, we gather from this is that it, it just really shows a great collaboration with our um, court system and our law enforcement. Those services did not stop during COVID. And um, so the clients who needed those 50 Bs and those restraining orders were able to, to get those services. Um, final slide, Bruce. So just you know, wanted to make sure that everyone knew, our community, you all know, that um, we have been providing services. Uh, we've made sure that our assistance programs have been accessible. We've actually even made them more accessible. Um, it used to be that you could not apply for certain services online, so we've moved applications online. Um, we have uh, we have apps where um, you know our citizens can upload information to us. They can uh, text information to us, supporting documents, maybe wages or uh, birth certificates or things like that that we may need. Um, of course, we are still, we continue to be in the public protecting and supporting our community. Um, and, and we're doing the same for our staff, making sure that our staff have some flexibility. Um, as, as you all know, um, of course today changed because uh, students are in school, but prior to that we were able to, and thanks to Bruce's staff, we were able to transition our staff um, home. We have quite a bit of staff who are able to telework and be there for uh, their children who are trying to navigate school virtually. Um, and we will continue to do these. And that kind of concludes my presentation. Any questions from you all? Board members, any questions? Well, I'll just add, because Adrian, thank you. I was in tears after listening to that thing because I know, I know I, I just prayed that ABSS, and I know they will have all their prevention programs that they normally launch periodically times during the school year, that they're going to be up front with the reports that can possibly come in. I've talked with the sheriff about how it's just going to just go boom because children have been isolated. They've been locked in homes that have domestic violence, and we've seen the high increase of those cases with all the isolation, the stress on families. Uh, alcohol sales are up almost 40%, mm -hmm. but somehow that's essential. I'll never understand that one. But um, anyway, um, I just wanted to also highlight that you don't have a full staff either. You're down 20-some people that everybody else is having to cover for, and you always go out. You're like EMS, you're like law enforcement, you have, and the health department, you have not, you have had to make it, and you've done well, and thank God the lives you probably saved. And about restraining orders, it's, um, it's a known fact that it's usually a minimum of seven times of a domestic violence altercation happening before that victim either can find some help or has the nerve to take those steps to go because of that, I hope that things will change. So the Justice Center, when I met with Sky Sullivan, who's a rock star of a director over there, was talking about how, you know, their numbers are down because everybody's locked up, literally. And um, it's a real seriously dangerous time for families in crisis with COVID. COVID has been um, a demon in so many ways other than a sickness. It has just gripped families and broke them and um, crime sure hadn't stopped, that's for sure. So um, I just want everybody to know that DSS, I mean, when she told me about the bodies, I had no idea, unclaimed bodies. Our county offices do so much more 
than what we just think they do. Health department with, I mean, child support and, I mean, oh my gosh, it's just so many things and we really need to work with everybody as much as possible to support you guys because where we're at home ordering something or, or going by and picking up our groceries out in front of the grocery store, that person's still in that grocery store packing that stuff and your workers, your, your CPS, any of them, are still going out and like adult um, being on the senior services committee oh my gosh the services have had to stop that would normally be the purpose for a senior to get up and go we all have to have purposes Canodal center all kind of places like that that's their real life that gives them something to do that works with other people has fellowship churches have changed everything but not you guys not the health department not law enforcement not EMS and fire you've stayed strong the whole time and I can't there, thank you doesn't get it it just doesn't I'm just so honored to be part of you and to hear however I can help you as much as possible but this is true about we hear this about teachers all the time how teachers will come here and they'll they'll work here and they'll train here and then another county will grab them because of the the supplement, of course, we're in the top 10 of the state now, Amos County, we're rocking it. But it's the same way with social workers. We get them started and then they'll move to adjacent counties and make a higher wage and everybody's got to make money just to sure living. But we got to have it here so we don't lose great people because we have got to get depth in our agency that are here for a while, just not temporary. So thank you for your leadership. I, I think you're awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd also like to say, um, Miss Day invited me over early, I think maybe the first week I was in office uh, for the second time, and I did a tour. Uh, what a great shop they have over there, and what great leadership she is providing. So any of the commissioners that have not done that meeting and tour with her, I would really encourage you to do that. I would too, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Commissioners? Okay. Well, I got Mr. a question Atkins. for the Sheriff a second. Okay. Mr. Atkins, come on up. In the meantime, Thank Mr. You, Mr. Johnson, if you want to beat him to the podium. <laughs> what? <laughs> come on. I said I had a I question I for you, Sheriff. Um, you were at the public, or you were at the uh, press conference for, I believe it was Davidson County, where that young 14 year old girl was uh, kidnapped. kidnapped mm -hmm. or, um, and I think. From what I've heard, uh, in Alamance County, we have protections on the software that our children get from the school. So the, we the kind of now. situation that we do now, we do we, now. We didn't want it to happen because they were going to sites uh, that the firewalls. They did not have the firewalls there, but I understand it has been changed. Okay, and we do now. But it was over ten young ladies that was corresponding mm. with this individual, with the same one from Alamance County. One was supposed to have been picked up the day the girl was abducted in Lexington. Wow. That just blows my mind. I can't figure out how somebody does that to a child. Well, just understand where there's one that gets caught. Oh, yeah. Who knows how many's behind that person waiting Absolutely. to get caught. It's just, it's just the devil. Aren't we one of the few counties that have a program to investigate this sort of Absolutely. Computer. How many counties Y'all allowed know? me to get three human trafficking officers through a federal grant. And then we have our, our own uh, human exploitation unit that they're involved in. And the cases they're making is unbelievable. You might point out that was just in the last couple of meetings, so mm -hmm. that we approved yes, that and you have put exactly that in place right. already. And they, we put them and they went to work. Thank you. Nice. Uh, thank y'all. Y'all oh. gave us the ability to do that. I think other counties are actually coming to us with some direction on that, aren't they? Yes, sir, they are. Good. We're not. We're bigger than number 10 in a lot of ways, aren't we? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're number one in my heart. That's why Amen. we're Palomance 8. That's right. <laughs> well, we got the number one sheriff, so we got to be number That's right. Number one sheriff, number one. I don't know about it. <laughs> you, you just can't say this enough. Parents, you have got to have this talks with your kids. I mean, right. who wants to have that kind of talk? But. Yeah. I'm telling you, you've got to have those talks to your kids. You are dealing with the best in the world at destroying your children, and they they don't stop at nothing. They can't get one kid, they'll try another. It's all the time. This is all they do and think of. 
and um, there's you can't build enough jails to put these people in it as far as I'm concerned because once something like this happens <laughs> to your kid <laughs> you can't fix it there's only therapy there's everything so don't ever let your kid get in that position of being harmed like that it is lifelong it is lifelong and thank goodness in this county we have Sheriff Johnson his three new deputies uh, and the programs that he has placed in in our we have allowed him to do and he has just done such a good job thank you thank you but my people are doing the work <laughs> and that's hard, a hard job Absolutely. especially the ones that have to watch the videos I mean it's mm -hmm. it's just mm. Thank you for doing that video too. Oh, it's my honor, my pleasure. And now our largest speaker, oh, you're seven feet tall, is that correct? <laughs> our tallest speaker, yeah. You know, Jeremy, we start talking about things and all of a sudden you just kind of slide right in. I'm very quiet. Psychic. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm spying on you. You don't know this, but I'm spying on you. The whole way through the meeting, that little camera right there. <laughs> And actually, it's, it's wonderful because I can kind of keep up with what's going on. And uh, Bruce has been good after the, the last meeting. I had not reckoned with the delay if you watch it on YouTube. And I said, well, I'll just watch it from my office if they need me. I can go upstairs. <laughs> and by the time I could hear that uh, there was a need for me to come up, it was already way past. I'm running up the stairs out of breath. And Bruce said, you know, we can fix that. You can be live. <laughs> so uh, that's very helpful. Well, I'm coming before you today. This is one of our routine things we do every year. This is the tax lien advertisement. Uh, that's where we put uh, delinquent amounts on real property in the newspaper. And we don't do that to embarrass anybody. We do that as really as the first step towards our foreclosure process. We're putting the world on notice that these taxes are not paid. <clears throat> So North Carolina General Statute 105-369A requires the tax collector to report to the governing body the total amount of any unpaid taxes for the current fiscal year that are liens on real property. Upon receipt of the report, the governing body must order the tax collector to advertise the tax liens by publishing each lien at least once in a newspaper having general circulation within the county. Now, we have historically split between the Times News and Alamance News. It breaks up about 60% that goes into the Times News and about 40% that goes into the Alamance News. The advertisement cost is assessed to each real property parcel and is added to the unpaid tax bill. This means that the persons who pay their taxes on time do not foot the bill to advertise the persons that are delinquent. When we collect that delinquent amount, they pay an additional fee, and it's that fee that pays for the advertisement. The tax collector has determined a cost of $5 should be added to each unpaid real property parcel. Uh, that's been working well for us. It's very close into what we actually collect in and very close to the advertising costs that we've seen. Uh, obviously, bankruptcy law prevents advertising taxes uh, for bankruptcy parcels, so we will we'll not have those in the newspaper. And every year I also report the amount of delinquent taxes outstanding. Now ordinarily I would have come before you at the previous board meeting, and so based on the way the, the calendar falls, I give you the January number. So this is in my report. As of January 31st, 2021, total amount of liens against real property for current year taxes is $5 million. $259,966.04. As of this morning, that is down to $3,501,304.36. You can see the collections in the month of February. Give us that number again, please. That's $3,501,304.36. Now that is a collection rate of 96.69%. Now I want to point something out. I think it's worth knowing. If you look at last year, at the same time, our collection rate was higher. It was at 97.06%. That's 0.37% more than where we're at this year. Now, I would like to look at the previous three years. In 16, 17, and 18, 
we had 96.72, 96.79, 96.65. Well, that makes our 96.69 look right in line. So really last year is unusually high. Last year we came out of the gate charging. Uh, we've switched over to our mass enforcement model and it's much more efficient. Uh, I believe that when I showed my settlement, I showed the line of how collections had risen and then dropped off when COVID hit. How do you mass enforce? That sounds like you are in a war or something. What, is that, what does that mean? Well, so what it is, uh, traditionally, if I'm going to garnish somebody, I will research that one person that owes taxes. I'm going to find the employer. I'm going to prepare a letter, send it to that individual and say, look, I'm about to send the garnishment to your employer. This is your chance to settle this up so they don't have to do that. And there's a fee, statutorily, when I send that letter to that person. If they don't respond or if they don't want to pay it, then after a given amount of time, I make another preparation, I send it to the employer, there's an additional fee, and then the employer will withhold 10% of the income until it's paid. Well, that's very inefficient. We've got a database full of names and employer numbers, identifications, etc. So what we do now, uh, last year we had 2,200, this year we had 1,700. We press a button and it produces 1,700 letters. And we send them out. We say, okay, we need to hear from you, we need to settle this up, or we'll hit the button again and send to the employers. So that's what a mass enforcement is. Okay. Now it's, it's an advantage to us because we can produce much more than we could under the old method. It's also an advantage to them because the statutory fee can be split multiple ways if you send them together where they can't be split when it's individually served. So they end up paying the full fee for their notice, but a fractional fee for the employer's notice if that employer has any other employees. Mm -hmm. So it's really it's, it's advantageous to everyone. Ordinarily, we would send out these pre-garnishments in January, and by the beginning of February, we'd send out the real garnishment to the employers. We are just now sending out the garnishment to employers a month behind schedule. Beginning in December, we really started seeing the lag with the Postal Service. Ran all through December, all through January. We could open the day's mail and it would be postmarked 30 days ago. So now we have a problem. Am I going to send a garnishment notice to someone who paid the bill 30 days ago? And I'm just waiting on it to come through the mail. I don't feel good about that. That doesn't work for me. So we ended up having to postpone and push everything back to make sure that when we send them out, we reasonably can believe that they have not paid that bill. And at our normal schedule time, I didn't have that confidence. They were still coming in. Right now, we're probably about a week at worst. Uh, and, and it's a mixture. I don't want to say that all the mail was 30 days out. We get mail from two days ago and 30 days ago in the same batch. I, I don't understand. Uh, I did notice that it's more likely to be older male if they're from out of state. So uh, perhaps they have more stops along the way, I don't know. Uh, but for that reason, we are a little delayed versus last year, even though we're using the same methods. I do think that we're going to pull out ahead uh, so long as we don't uh, stop enforcement like we did last year. I mean, we'll work with folks if they have a hardship with COVID. But last year we totally shut down, and this year we're kind of resuming and getting back to a normal basis. How many do we have to actually, what percentage, for example, would actually move to foreclosure? Percent, tiny, minuscule, minuscule. Uh, we don't want the property. Oh. And uh, once we've exhausted all other options, so our standard is this, it has to be at least two years delinquent and at least $500 delinquent. And we have to have attempted every remedy that we have from garnishment to bank attachment to rent attachment to going after mortgage companies to pay the bill, anything we can do. When we totally run out of options, then we send to foreclosure. And what really happens at foreclosure, and this is where if I, if I brag on Robin for a minute in, in Clyde's office, uh, she does a terrific job. The vast majority of those get paid. They do not go to the court house steps. They get paid because she contacts these people. And when they get that letter that we're in process now, we're going to foreclose, amazingly, where they wouldn't pay at any other point, we figure out a way to come up with the money that the bill is paid. <laughs> and so it is very rare that we actually complete the process. But we do. We, we sell properties on a routine basis, but they're just a tiny, tiny amount. Good. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what I'm requesting today, and, and thank you for tolerating my little side trail there, but I, I thought you should know our situation. 
uh, is a motion um, to approve the tax lien advertisement for unpaid real property parcels for tax year 2020 at a cost of five dollars a parcel um, i'm recommending to advertise on march 18th uh, we traditionally do the third thursday of march and at this point since the mail has caught back up reasonably well i'm comfortable with that date i'll make a motion to approve second any further discussion and a motion and a second all in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. all opposed unanimous thank you thank you Good. Well, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, this item that I'm going to present to you at this time, uh, I want to make sure it's clear, does not require any action. This is an update. Give me a second. I got to fix it up. What's that? I got to fix something real oh, quick. Sorry. Uh, well, <laughs> as we wait. Uh, well, that don't happen often. We, uh, we, we, we did a facility plan for county government uh, back in 2018. Part of the reason why we did so was. Uh, we had a lot of buildings that were in disrepair. We had buildings that we had become owners of that were uh, actually uh, in such a condition that we were better off demolishing those buildings. And we were working hard on the education bond package to try to make long-term plans for education capital needs. And that's just one of county government's responsibilities when it comes to capital. The county is responsible, of course, for education uh, capital needs, but it's also responsible for the court system and for uh, county government itself. So we put together a plan in 2018, and I'm gonna go over it with the board today because so many folks may not have had opportunity to see it and ask questions about it. As I go through it, please don't hesitate to ask questions. There are some new facets to the plan based on things that have come up since the 2018 version. But just to, to quickly touch on the fact that we have a capital plan and we have a capital finance plan. So we have a plan that you will see on March 15th that is a document that has all of our projects, all court projects, school system projects. And uh, it, it's a little different from the finance plan. The finance plan is how we pay for it. That's where we calculate all our revenues, our interest, our debt, our pay go. You will see that also. We'll be talking uh, at length about it between now and the 15th. But the projects in the county, school system, and community college plan are all either debt funded, they're pay as you go, or uh, in the case of the county's projects, a number of them are funded by private dollars or uh, outside dollars. So what you're gonna see today, this list of county government projects, I believe they will all fit in our current financing plan. That means the dollars are available in the county's uh, financing plan right now to do all of these projects. That's through various mechanisms, debt, pay go, or the outside dollars that we currently hold. The Capital Oversight Committee received uh, a, uh, an overview of the most recent version of the capital financing uh, plan that we have. Commissioners, you will receive that same information on March 15th. The major thing we'll be talking about between now and that date, I'm gonna get on that date, is education bond premiums, right? That's a decision that the commissioners are gonna have to talk about and decide what's the best thing to do about education bond premiums. Because we'll be looking at uh, issuing $167,560,000 in education bond debt on April 5th. Uh, excuse me, the commissioners will be asked to vote formally to issue that debt, then on April 20th is when we will do it. You'll hear more about this in the next week and then again on the 15th, but uh, our projects are all a part, county government's projects and the core projects are also a part of this uh, uh, overall plan for county government. But what I'm gonna talk about today is focusing primarily on county government in the courts, really. So we've developed a, a plan of different projects, construction and renovation projects. This does not include annual CIP projects. So if we're uh, making repairs to elevators and buildings as we are, that's not gonna be a part of this presentation today. Our construction and renovation priorities that you'll hear about today include the courts, the county office building, EMS, elections, and then we have handful of alternative non-county funded projects that I'm going to go over. So, so when we started our uh, facility planning process two years ago, one of our major focuses was on downtown Graham. Commissioners are all aware this is one of our two major campuses. You got downtown Graham and then uh, Graham Hopedale Road, East Burlington area. We spent a lot of time focusing on uh, the downtown Graham campus and what we looked at 
Well, what's the potential for growth for county government, particularly without having to acquire new properties, right? If we didn't have to go out and buy new land. So we spent a lot of time looking at the property across the street where the jail and the J.B. Allen Courthouse are currently located to come up with a plan for that site to say, if you were maximizing that over the next 20, 30, 40 years, right? How, how would you build out that property? Because it's a pretty big piece of property, right? <coughs> so all the things you see on this uh, schematic for the property across the street at the jails and the court, some of these are quite some time down the road, right? Parking decks, a future building out off of uh, uh, Pine, Pine Street, the jail expansion, those are way down the road uh, projects. But we wanted to identify where they would probably go on the property across the street so we don't go over there and mess up the flow and build something that might uh, throw this plan out of whack. This maximizes that property in the future. There was really uh, two major projects that came to the forefront as needed and affordable and made sense to think about doing that. So uh, the first one is uh, a new court administrative bill. So we just recently demolished the old CSI building that had been the Board of Elections building also a uh, number of years ago. That building was sitting beside J.B. Allen where J.B. Allen's natural uh, completion was. J.B. Allen, my understanding, is only half of the original design building. So uh, we're looking at how would it be if we built a new court administration building. It would range between 28 and 31,000 square feet. Our budget talking point estimate is $11.7 million total to build that building. So our two-year plan called for the design work and the planning process, because this would be a process that would involve the judges, the district attorney, uh, the clerk of court, the sheriff for security reasons, as well as county government. We had an original plan to start that discussion last month. Obviously, COVID uh, last year derailed our, our plans. but. It's important that we think about it now because we're a little behind and we, we if we're going to proceed with this project, we should go ahead and start the discussions with the uh, court leadership about what it might look like. The financing plan for the county would indicate you would issue debt for this project in March of 2022 with construction starting thereabouts also and would project uh, the building being completed in June of 23. This is one of the few projects you'll see uh, in this that will add new operation costs if it were to be constructed, but what, what benefit would this bring? This would be strictly for administrative offices for the uh, Superior Court judges, uh, District Court judges, the District Attorney, clerk, and that would get all of their staff out of J.B. Allen. The, the gray building there between the two yellow, that's J.B. Allen Courthouse. It's designed to have room for about eight courtrooms in it. But the office spaces for these various court staff are in some of those slots. It's, they're all designed with like uh, uh, just template slots that are big enough for a courtroom. All those folks, all the office staff would move over into the new building, the new yellow building there on the left. Any court staff that are officed in civil court would move into this building as well as historic courthouse. This would be the court offices for all court related staff. So. Another way this would help, and the second piece of this project would be at that point to renovate uh, the J.B. Allen Courthouse. J.B. Allen's uh, about 41,000 square feet. We estimated it cost a little less than $2 million. Again, these are rough budget numbers. They're not dialed in. The design, if we were to take this project on, we'd start at the same time we were talking with, because it would be the same people you would be talking with, the judges, district attorney, sheriff, clerk, about how you would reconfigure J.B. Allen to get seven courtrooms in that building. I think that would be our ideal number. You would still leave space for the jury room, but then there would be seven courtrooms. So you would no longer have court and civil. Everything would be in one building. That has been communicated to us as valuable from the court's perspective to have all court in one building. One thing I will say, the courts have made very clear, they appreciate very much practicing in historic. It's an iconic building, so they like to go up there. They would never not practice in historic but the vast majority of core business would be taking place in J.B. Out. Uh, again, we would issue the debt for this project in March of 22, if we were to proceed with this. Construction in June of 23, and a completion projected to be in January of 24. These are planning figures, planning numbers, but they do fit within our capital finance plan. So these are the two key main projects for the downtown Graham campus. 
There's lots of other potential to build on the property across the street, but those are farther out many years in the future. The two immediates that we can see that we can afford uh, per our plan, as well as make sense and would be helpful to the court system and to county government, as you'll see in a moment, is the new uh, admin administrative office construction and the J.B. Allen renovation. So how would that be beneficial to county government? Because everything in civil would move out. The courtrooms in civil would now be in J.B. Allen. So there would be no more practicing courtrooms in the building right here beside of us. And all the court offices would be in the new court administrative building. So what we would propose to do is to renovate civil and make this all county office building. So you would combine civil court, county office building into one building. You'd have to do some renovation in both. Uh, the total square footage of those two buildings is a little over 45,000 square feet. Budget estimates are around $4.8 million to renovate these two buildings. Uh, and the goal would be to get as much of county government into county office building as possible. Right, so we try to move planning, inspections, GIS. Uh, we believe there would even possibly be room for the Register of Deeds to move into this office, and that could be beneficial from a tax and Register of Deeds being um, co-located. So we would, we would be looking at all county departments, not including health or DSS or environmental health. Those are just too large and on the other side of town. So the idea would be get everybody, all county government, into um, into the new new county office building. We'll be talking about the design for this could start in October of 23 with the debt per our plan and with, uh, affordably being able to be issued August of 24. Civil construction starting in March of 24 and the county office building would start in January of 25. Would pro if, if we proceeded with this, what would probably happen is you renovate civil, move some folks from this side over so you're not having to find too much alternative space and then renovate this side of the building with a completion uh, January to July of 25. So the goal would be courts get some new administrative office. All court, with the exception of what happens at Historic, takes place in J.B. Allen, and the county office building would consist of both county office and civil court combined into one, one county government site. With the um, J.B. Allen building, you're saying seven courtrooms yes. in that one building. Yes. Currently have two on the ground floor and one upstairs. Where in the world are you going to put seven courtrooms? So if you move the district attorney's office and all their staff out, they would move into the new um, administrative office building as well as all the judge's offices, as well as the clerks. Most of those clerks would move over into the new um, uh, office building, administrative building. Those spaces where the district attorney the judges' offices and the clerks are all the same dimensions as the courtrooms that exist. So you would just move all those folks out and go in and renovate it and have, I believe we have calculated seven courtrooms because you would still leave the, in fact, the jury room is the same dimensions as another courtroom. They're all just very, uh, the design was that this could be done. So once you get those offices out, you, uh, you, you could, I think you could get seven. So you'll have four on the ground floor and three upstairs. Yes. Sir. And a uh, jury room would probably remain where it is, where it is now. Uh, you would still, I'm sure, and, and this would all be part of the design process with the court's input. I, I imagine that the uh, clerk of court would still want to retain a window somewhere in the building to take, to take payments, right? But the majority of her staff would probably be in the court administrative building, not necessarily in J.B. Allen. So. There's so many efficiencies to be gained in this, and there's so many, so, so much stuff we covered last year. Um, you know, the, the clerk's office has to collect the fees, but they have to be transported from J.B. Allen down to the old court, court building. And so that's a safety issue uh, and an efficiency issue. So I think there, there might be some value from the sheriff's department's perspective in that all bailiffs would pretty much be in one location with the exception of if there are uh, if there is court happening at historic. So the prisoner transfer. I think would all be able to be done through the tunnel into yes, the sir. building, not so many prisoners coming here to um, civil court. And again, this is, uh, these are conceptual plans. And the dollars are conceptual too, right? So it could be more or less. We, we don't really know, but we think it would all work and fit about as close as we can get right now. So that's a very quick flyover of uh, the courts and county office building, but 
suffice it to say, I've been with county government a long time. There's been a lot of talk about having a county governmental center. This, this is probably without actually going out and buying new land and, and spending a tremendous amount of money to build a brand new county government complex. About the easiest way to do that, to have all of county government that can reasonably fit in these two buildings. That, that, and there's a lot of efficiencies from county government's perspective if, if as much as county government as possible is in the same building. So, and again. Brian? Yes. What is $4,860,000 worth of remodel look like in this building? So I think you'd have to, a lot of that would be spent in civil. Right now, civil is, I believe, three courtrooms. Uh -huh. So you'd be going into those three courtrooms. You'd have to, we would be talking with each department that comes in here. We, we have done space needs studies for all our county departments. So we'd be trying to figure out, okay, how do you take this courtroom? Are you cubing this? Are we officing it? Do we need to uh, adjust how the HVAC works in this building? It could result in the installation of a, another elevator, perhaps, or at least an elevator you know, one of the weaknesses of our current elevator is it does not open to that side of the building. So is there a way to install something in the same shaft that opens to both sides? Like the hospital does. Yes. Yeah. So I, I think uh, basically it could be close to gutting these two buildings, not like tearing them all out, but I would imagine that they would be reconfigured pretty heavily. And, uh, you know, we have some space like, uh, uh, oh gosh, I was trying to think, CECOM in the basement. What we'd like to do if this model happened, we would uh, bring emergency management in here and perhaps make that not just uh, CECOM, our emergency operations center would be uh, co-located with CECOM, which there would be some value to that too. Will we still meet in here? Well, I think what might would happen is we might would move into the second floor, uh, excuse me, second floor courtroom, so we'd pick up some space. So you know, if all the courts are gone, our design might be, I don't know what would happen to this, perhaps it becomes another office and uh, the second floor courtroom, I think, holds 135 people. So you could pick up a larger audience in this room for your meetings if you wanted to do that. But you still meet in this building. Now, uh, that to say, uh, Historic Courthouse has been set up to where if the commissioners ever wanted to meet at Historic, it's, it can be configured there too. So. Can we go back to the previous slide for two seconds? Yes. The yellow on the right hand side is what is that exactly? So on the far right, I don't have a laser, but th this one on the left, that's the new admin. Then JB Allen in the gray. Mm -hmm. The one on the far right, uh, the courts have indicated to us eventually there will be a need for at least one very large courtroom. I guess when they have traffic, my understanding is they'll have hundreds of people coming mm -hmm. to court. They don't have. Uh, a court facility, a courtroom big enough to That's handle right. the vast amount of people that they get. So there was some discussion about the possibility down the road, a future edition, where there would be uh, uh, courtroom space ample for large trials or traffic court. And that it might also be that the um, uh, jury room would eventually move there and then freeze up another courtroom. You know, I, you know, we've had some discussions with the court and they can't predict this, but as Alamance County continues to grow, and we could pick up another uh, district court judge here possibly. And if we do that, we're thinking offices and we're gonna uh, uh, try to keep the capacity up. So that's down the road. We don't have a timetable for that building. It was just identified as there is space on this lot to build where, that here. Where would your parking deck go? So we've looked at the, the, the conceptual design for the lot across the street is two parking decks eventually. I wanna make sure it's very clear we're not we're not at that point right now but the two parking decks that we have looked at is one that would be in front of the sheriff's department right out here where the big tree is where the commissioners park mm -hmm. a two-level deck that would be uh entrance from pine street and from elm street primary purpose for that deck would be for sheriff's office parking uh county employee parking court staff parking there, there has been some commentary from the court about the desire to be able to park in secure locations, right, uh, for the for the judges and the uh, district attorney staff. Then, if you look all the way over, yes, right there to the left, where Bruce is circling, uh, that that parking deck could be as many stories as the county decided at that time to make. There's there's ample open space there uh, that you could build a three or four deck parking deck. Eventually, that could be for all the folks that are coming to court. So. You're going to lose some parking spaces when you add the new office addition. That, that, that lot is currently used primarily by county employees, sheriff's office, and some visitors. So parking would be at a premium if we added that. 
but again, as I say, the other the other items here are, are further down the line. Has there been any discussion with the city of Graham about sharing space and or cost? There had been some. We were going through this process. Uh, there was some real interest from the city and I think from some private developers uh, about so our parking deck, for example, on uh, I believe that's Maple Street. Mm -hmm. Some interest in could that be done as some kind of public-private partnership where there would be a facade facing um, Maple that could be commercial, right? The deck is in the back behind that. I, you know, obviously, I can't tell you what those relationships might be or how could that benefit the county. The goal would be, can that somehow offset that cost or do something good for county government? But the idea was if it's facing Maple and it's a facade and there's commercial or food or something in there that people could walk up to, you know, I, would, I think we would certainly be interested in hearing those possibilities. But so we would then le they, we would lease the parking space then from the commercial entity, I guess? I think there's a lot of ways it could be it could be structured. It could be the county owns it and is leasing the space in the in the commercial, or it could be some other way uh, spun. But I do know the city was interested in that. The, the the perspective I got from the city when we talked about this plan was one, they're always interested in new development downtown. Right, that's a benefit for downtown Graham is if you're doing new construction. It's just a it's a catalyst, right? If you can do new construction that somehow accommodates a desire for retail or food that could that would only be done if it helps us too you know then yes i think the city would be very receptive to it one other good thing about this this conceptual plan is most of this property is already paved so you're you're not creating new stormwater problems by adding all these hard surface roofs just about everything over there is paved with the exception of some of the property down at the very far bottom left of the picture where I think uh, the houses are but that's good news for us too because um, it, it, you know you're not having to worry quite so much about storm water things like that because it's already already hold, uh, hard surface so uh, this this project this particular project for the human service center HVAC replacement project we're estimating uh, this is the heating system and cooling system for HSC is mostly original to the building we have replaced some portions of it but the majority of it is the original configuration for the hospital uh, we really we have several hundred employees that work in this building we we really do need to replace this HVAC system we're estimating 1.5 million dollars and we've already had the engineering completed on this project we were going to do a loan for this project uh, I think it was last year I can't remember time has flown for uh, those that are listening that's the old Alamance County Hospital Yes, that is correct. Um, we Our plan uh, has capacity to borrow uh, the funding for this project this October with construction starting uh, right thereabouts, and we estimate it would take about a year to complete. Now, those aren't old like what we hear, chillers and boilers. I think Buddy, Buddy or Buddy might can speak a little bit more to uh, what the idea of the replacement system would be. Well, we've heard that in the schools, the chillers and the boilers, like at Williams. Uh, it currently has one boiler. Mm -hmm. Part of that plan is to add a second boiler for backup. And the chiller was replaced in 2010. So it's good for probably another 10 years, maybe, with a few repairs and stuff. But a lot of it's to replace the all wear handler. Some of them date back to like 1953. It's in the building. <laughs> And update the controls to it, which we have no control. Airplanes don't fly in now. And also, the same day surgery wing part of it was configured as a surgery building. So it's decided right now is like 6% of the air goes to one side of the building to keep the area cooler. And the other side, so we have problems with heat and cooling in that building. There's a lot of work involved in doing this. Oh, yeah. We've already started on some of the stuff we had to do because we had issues with it uh, was included in this and it's just a work in progress and everybody over there would appreciate getting it corrected if we could and actually having the same temperature at one time yes. in one building <laughs> yeah plus you got right labs and yeah pharmacies and everything else over there that you got to make sure you have control over mm -hmm. but you're talking about one and a half million dollars correct yeah that's okay. the best test what would it cost to go ahead and get rid of the old everything and replace it? Uh, I have, 
I don't have an idea of the total cost. But some some of the systems are relatively new. Yeah, so like so ten, 10 years at, at minimum. Yeah, the chiller, that chiller would probably last, how long would you guess, Bo? They the say the average lifespan of a chiller is 20 years. So we've got a little bit of time left on that. And we have had to install, as Buddy mentioned, some different aspects of the entire system because they've either failed or they were so bad we had to do something about it or uh, they were, um, they've had to do some work specifically for some of the, the labs, I know, uh, yeah. installed specific systems for them too. So. I would do request you your, that you at least let you us know. Do you really cold? I'd want to know to what the cost would be for new construction as a pro or total replacement. If we're talking about a million, one and a half million dollars down and only 10 years left on the current system, uh, you know, we're gonna be revisiting this very soon. Well, I, this, this is one of our priorities at the end I'll cover, because out of this, the takeaway today I hope for you will be, uh, there are a few things we need to do if we want to proceed with this. If the board, you know, I don't have a vote today, but if, if you're in support of us continuing forward on this plan, there's a few points, and one of them is specifically about this, I think will speak to your point, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, this project is relatively new. Uh, we're looking at the possibility of adding a new EMS base in the Meadow area. If you look at this map, uh, the, the very dark uh, brown is the high, high frequency calls. Um, our GIS folks map out the EMS calls from uh, 2018 to 2019. So we have EMS bases near most of this. You'll see uh, Bruce, I don't know if you can put the mouse over Graham and Rudd Street. And uh, so there's the Graham base. You see the high frequency of calls. There's Rudd Street base, high frequency of calls in Burlington. There's the um, mm -hmm. oh, West Side. That's West Side over kind of near the hospital, right? So uh, we have our bases strategically what? placed uh, near where high frequency calls are. Uh, Bruce, can you go down and show them the medic unit in the south down at Sizemore? That's a medic unit, quick response, not an ambulance. <laughs> truck with a medic in it. Ossipi up top is uh, up in the north. Another medic unit, uh, quick response, not an ambulance. And there's a medic unit in Medvin currently. There is a medic, uh, I believe that medic unit is stationed at Medvin Fire Department. Yes, sir. So we don't have an ambulance in Medvin. You can see the high frequency of calls. Uh, we're looking at the possibility of constructing an, a new ambulance base and a garage. Our current garage is on Maple Street down near the Maple Street Center, the Recreation Center, our ambulances have completely outgrown that property. It is just, uh, if you watch Ken back in those uh, units out <laughs> in the middle of Maple Street uh, during the, the day, it's that, that facility needs to be relocated. We're estimating 10,000 square feet of construction, cost estimate construction plus acquisition. We do not own property in the city, uh, in the Mevin area, of a little over 3.5 million. I would suggest to the commissioners that uh, we have we do have an idea of a, of a location for this base, and we believe we could fund that acquisition um, with PAYGO, pay up front. So even if we, that's one of our priorities, you'll hear me say in a moment, even if we did that and bought it with cash, even if we delayed this project, we would at least have the site. Uh, we could issue debt for this in March of 22 with an estimate one year timetable to complete. One thing about this project, it does require the addition of at least one new EMS unit and, and uh, a new crew. It, it would be, it wouldn't make any sense to build this facility and not at least add an ambulance unit and the uh, supporting crew to work the Mevin calls. But I think Ray would testify that that would be a need overall anyway, but in the Mevin area in particular. Yes, sir. So Mevin Fire didn't have any room to park a bus where they are? I mean, uh, not right now. Um, you know, we've got the one room for our, our one person crew, but, but I think they're pretty full. And ideally, if, well, what our plan is putting out there is we put the EMS garage on the same property adjacent to or part of uh, the new EMS base that will be located in Madden. Now, does Madden help with that? Uh, they would not be required to. Okay. I don't. I don't think Mevin, or I don't think any of the cities have helped us with our construction uh, of uh, headquarters or Rudd Street or West Side. That's all been kind of good. I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, this this project too is also a little bit newer. Uh, you know, we we have identified the fact that we really need to add some additional Viper radio towers in Alamance County. If you'll remember, I think a year ago plus had some discussions about radio coverage throughout the county. This is a map 
of Piper radio coverage in Alamance, you can see the issues are up in the Pleasant Grove area, the Hall River Valley that runs right there through the center of the county, it's lowlands, and then down behind the count, the Kane Mountain Range in the Snow Camp small area, as a matter of fact. We would probably benefit from at least three towers. Uh, so we're, we're projecting that that would be a $3 million cost. We don't know that total for sure. Does that include the land and installation? It, we would probably try to find somebody that would let us put the tower on property, maybe school, something that's already owned. So it, the tower construction would be expensive. I am not sure that $3 million will get three towers. But $3 million would fit in our plan, uh, and we would get as many of them as we could possibly get for $3 million. That debt could be issued in spring of 23, and we're estimating it would take two years to uh, um, appropriately cite them and then bid them out, or however many we could get. But this is important. This is the this is the radio system that all county emergency services, as well as volunteer fire and uh, our police departments, everyone in the county, with the exception of the city of Burlington. Burlington is using the Tron system, so uh, everybody in the county is talking on this system. Between, uh, between Burlington and the county, how do they communicate? Do the systems communicate? So uh, they do, they can be patched through. It's not very convenient, but uh, it can work. I can get uh, Stephen perhaps to explain the details of that. They, it can be done, but it involves a patch. Sheriff, I don't know if you, you have anything to say about that. It's not the best system. It is not, definitely not the best system. Uh, give you a good example. We had a chase the, the oh, That's what I was week, thinking of, right. Uh, and it, it was almost a cluster because <laughs> couldn't, communicate with each other with uh, Burlington, Mebane, Orange County. What do Mebane and Orange use? Mebane's on Viper. Mebane and police are on the Viper system too. Orange, I'm not sure. I don't know if they're on Viper or if they have their own system for Orange County Sheriff's. Okay. So know. pretty much Burlington's the odd man out. Uh, the, the Viper system's actually the state's system. So our hope right. would be we would try to leverage any money we invest in the Viper system for the local use with the state because this is highway patrol and state emergency management too. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's what I'm saying that Burlington is the odd man out. They're the ones that don't follow what everybody else is doing. Is they're on the right? Tron system, yes. Mm -hmm. That's uh, the Guilford County system. Well the fact that you paused told me that it ain't working. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have to say no. You just went, oh. <laughs> Yeah. Well, the good, I will say is uh, we are working closely. Bruce and his crew and CECOM are working with the city on, uh, we're going to be replacing the CAD fairly soon, our, our uh, dispatch computer system. And we're trying to work with the city uh, in hopes that we make sure we all get one that talks to each other, right? So we can, we can communicate as best we can. That's huge. Uh, so this, this is another new item uh, that is going to be a, one of my priorities that I'll talk to you about here in just a moment. Medicap building. A little over this uh, 10,600 plus square feet. We estimate to acquire it and update. It's currently under lease. Uh, let me remind everyone. It's currently under lease. We started leasing this property primarily for uh, Board of Elections to use two suites. Uh, I don't remember when. That's been a year plus ago. They used two of the end suites for voting equipment storage. Then we started leasing the rest of the building and, we're and have been using it for the tax department for a drive-in window service, which mm -hmm. has been very effective. Um, it's leased until July 31st, 2021. So we do need to be thinking about what's the plan with this building. Do we vacate? Uh, do we extend the lease? Or do we think about purchasing and updating? We've been getting some good reports on that for convenience for taxpayers, oh, yeah. too. It is. It has been very convenient for the tax department. It's kept folks out of here from the social distancing perspective. But I think a lot of folks have just appreciated the fact they can do it through a drive through If they have issues, they still come in. You know, if they have a dis dispute, right. they do come in. Uh, we believe the acquisition uh, could be done with cash, no debt. Uh, we would be looking at debt to upfit it. Um, and if we were to do this, uh, we could issue the debt in October. Uh, we would do a reimbursement resolution and start construction in August and hope it's not much to this. We would really be looking at, there's not much to the construction, it's mostly upfit, moving offices around. Primarily we're looking at the Board of Elections going in here with tax. Board of Elections is in the current small building. They have pretty much outgrown that. Uh, if any of you have talked to Kathy or been a part of any of her recent uh, efforts with the elections, this has much more adequate parking. Uh, 
could possibly serve as an early voting location as well as their offices. I think it's possible we could get another small county department in here too, possibly. Um, the parking is excellent, excellent um, disabled parking access. So we're trying to think about county departments that might benefit from having good plentiful uh, disabled access parking. Um, can I just like plant a seed? Sir? Um, like that would be a really great veterans administrative office yes. because of parking for any kind of disabilities or anything like that location and um i'm just saying I, and actually, they would absolutely have they are in desperate need of one more staff member while i'm planting seeds i just thought i'd throw that out there well i think that would be a department that uh i believe could reasonably fit here so it's a low number of staff uh not a lot of staff vehicles or fleets or anything like that and they do need they do need a facility that has easy parking and easy access for disabled folks so these are possibilities for this building i, I will just say we're getting to a point where we probably need to make a decision about what we want to do continue to use it or or vacate just very quickly uh the, the petri building this is a building that is being completely funded with private funds most of you uh, remember mr ron petri uh, donated um, the funding needed to construct this building in honor of his sister Ann Petrie Ivy. New construction, uh, almost 13,000 square feet. Cost is uh, $2.8 million. The construction has begun. It's being built over behind uh, the Human Service Center uh, off of Rudd Street. We believe it's going to be uh, completed October of this year if the rain will continue to uh, <laughs> cooperate with us. And again, it is privately funded, but you know, it's a, it's a capital project. We haven't built a $3 million building in a very long time, and it's going to be nice. Open Door Clinic, friend, uh, Friendship Adult Day, and uh, a, a DSS Family Visitation Unit will be in this building. So. And I'd like to add, we as a county want to thank Ron Petrie. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. That's a tremendous gift to this county. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I absolutely agree. Uh, just a wonderful fellow and wanted to do something for Alamance County. And this was this was his desire. And it and fits very well. It'll be named after him. Will it's he? Ann Petrie Ivy. Okay. He, he, okay. Very unassuming man. So I yeah. think he was interested in his sister uh, getting some recognition. So. My first office desk that I bought for my law office came from Ron, P Ron Petrie. <laughs> yes, he, was, he had a very successful uh, office furniture business. Very, very successful. Uh, the dental clinic is another project. Uh, this, this project will be funded by dental program savings, so this is not coming from the county general fund or from our, or from our debt or our own cash. Dental has uh, funding in its own fund balance. This is a renovation project, a little over 5,000 square feet planning to do HVAC work and renovate the interior and the parking lot. Buddy's been working with the dental folks and the design has already begun. We do not have cost for uh, cost estimates yet, but we will have them soon. I just wanted you to know this is in the hopper and uh, dental, fund, dental savings are planned to pay for that. So. I think we're getting near the very end. Uh, the Elderly Services Building, which is located beside Family Justice on Martin Street, is slated now to be the Mental Health Crisis and Diversion Center, a little over 11,000 square feet. The budget for this project is 1.4 to 1.5 million. Mr. Petrie, uh, when he donated his funding for the Ann Petrie Ivy Building, he allowed any of that funding that could be carried over to be carried over to this building too. So it's possible we'll be able to use some of Mr. Petrie's dollars to help us with the Mental Health Diversion Center. The design has already started. We intend to use Cardinal Innovations grant of $1.2 million. We have, uh, I believe it's $200,000 of maintenance of effort funding that we will put toward this project, which is our mental health funds we're required to spend on mental, mental health. And then Mr. Petrie's potential funding. We, ha we did start the design process here. We identified some space concerns. Uh, this building's, as I say, a little over 11,000 square feet. May not be large enough for all the services that uh, the community has indicated they wanted offered in the crisis and diversion center. So we're serving, they've gone back to surveying the community that has been supportive of this to say if all services couldn't be here, you know, is, how important is that? So we've got, we're in a holding pattern with this project at this time. Mr. Hay, could you mention Cardinal Innovations? I've seen where several counties are pulling out of them. Is that a possibility that Alamance County could ever do that in the future? So I know um, Commissioner Turner is our uh, new Cardinal uh, Innovations uh, representative from the Board of Commissioners. Uh, he and I and uh, Adrian Day mm -hmm. attended a call recently with Cardinal to talk a little bit about uh, one of the major issues I've heard from the 
at least six of the 20 counties that are in Cardinals catchment area have been with foster care children, the placement of foster care kids with significant mental health issues. Adrian's indicated that while we don't have nearly the number of those kids as uh, Mecklenburg or Forsyth or Union County has, those are the ones that are planning to try to leave Cardinal. Whenever we do uh, have a child with uh, those severe mental health issues, it's a real difficult process uh, to work out for DSS and Cardinal. So while I am personally not aware of such a shortcoming in service from Cardinal that I would tell the board it's, it's time to, to leave Cardinal, that is a concern, but I was heartened at the uh, recent meeting where there was good dialogue between the Cardinal staff and the um, uh, DSS. So I don't know if you And I think they understand the shortcomings that have been perceived in the foster care area and are taking appropriate steps to increase those service levels. And I think Steve Carter was, uh, was historically on that board and has seen that. But I, I think they hear the concern, and I, I think it might make sense to give them more time to make sure that they. They've had some administrative they changes they've gone through over there to try and make themselves a little yes. bit more responsive. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing some good things out of them. They've done a good job for us in the past. but yeah. It's interesting how you mentioned foster care because um, we are the number three, count, number three county, no, number three area, yeah, Alamance, in the state of North Carolina for group homes. Mm -hmm. We're only behind Buncombe and Wake, which are pretty good size. And we have a lot of youth group homes here. And and um, at any particular time, you can ask um, our Ray Street uh, Academy principal that a lot of the um, group home children, which is just the ultimate breakdown for young people that are in Ray Street, the alternative school, are not from Alamance County. So they're not only near their homes, they're here in out of town home, and then they're going to another new school, and they got a lot on their backs they're carrying. And um, that is, uh, you was part of the group home task force, Lord have mercy. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the hours it takes law enforcement when they go to group homes, my sheriff can back me up, police chief, anybody with this type of behavior that goes on because um, a lot of these young people are at their wits end. They don't, you don't ask for what you grow up in a lot of times. and. Um, it's just unheard of what we're doing to young people. Children, we, you just, we just see it all the time, but group homes to me is a, is a we've got some excellent group homes, but um, I have high concerns about being number three in the state, because a lot of counties don't even have group homes, but they can't wait to send us here. My husband's had several young people from Charlotte, Mecklenburg, and not only are you in trouble here in this county, you have no family support, and you're staying with strangers. It, it's, it's, um, it's, we're going to see the results of this, I'm telling you, and it's going to be devastating. Indeed. It's a, it's a, it's a, yes. So I would say, uh, Commissioners, the takeaways from this, it's a lot. It's a lot to cover. Again, there's no action needed today. Um, our current financing plan that you will see over the course of this week, and again on the 15th of March, would indicate that based on these conceptual plan designs and just the budget talking point numbers, these are not hard quotes, would work through our current uh, county financing plan. And our financing plan is paid for with, we have put reserves in there, primarily from the sale of the peak resources property, that's where most of our capital reserves came from, as well as our debt step down. Uh, when we started this process, we, uh, we leave our debt step down funding in our capital plan now, rather than revert it over to operating. The reason we did that was uh, it made it tougher on the operating side, but there was just no way to ever get ahead on the capital side. Uh, if you don't leave that, that debt step down, that difference in capital. So um, the funding is there to pay for these projects as we know them to exist today. But there are some immediate priorities. I think uh, if, if the commissioners are still interested in trying to further this plan, we should go ahead and start discussions with the, um, the court leadership your, your judges, clerk, district attorney, sheriff, about how would the planning process look for a court administrative building in J.B. Allen, Reno? Do they still agree that that's reasonable? They did two years ago. If they do, then we need to be thinking about who would help us design that building and how do we get their input and keep it all within a budget, right? Um, that, that, that should be a step that we should take if we want to proceed th with those buildings. We do need to determine the future of the Medicap building. I would say if the commissioners have interest in looking at how would we purchase that building, 
might be something we could arrange uh, with Mr. Albright a uh, closed session to talk about just because we would be getting into some prices of property. I don't know, would that be appropriate, uh, Mr. Albright? We we're going to talk purchase price and those kind of things. Purchasing property, I don't think we can discuss that in closed session. No, okay. okay. Well, maybe we could have it out here then. So, uh, <laughs> I just have one question. What's the rent on the Medicap bill? It is. Uh, I saw it, but I did, didn't write it down. Six thousand. Six thousand a month for Suite A. Six thousand and ninety-two dollars a month for the Suite A. That's the large pharmacy piece that includes the uh, drive-in window, and then for B and C, which are currently being used for Board of Elections storage, three thousand eight hundred thirteen a month for both of them. So you're roughly right around ten k a month. Yes. For the whole building. That's correct. Well, if it's any consolation, one percent of one point seven million is seventeen hundred. So you're better off renting it than you are buying it. I'm just saying. Well. Yeah. These are, these are exactly. certainly points that we need to kind of be thinking about because the lease will expire soon. Mm -hmm. And if the commissioners want to continue to use it, I will say from a tax perspective, a Board of Elections storage uh, perspective, it is definitely worthwhile. I think even we could go in and update it if the commissioners wanted to do that to accommodate Board of Elections and possibly even Veteran Services and continue to rent it until you made a decision about buying it or not. All, all those options are on the table. I think. If we are interested in doing that, we should be having those discussions or let us bring you a couple of options to consider so we know we, we need to move before the um, July 31st lease runs out. We also, we do have an idea about property that could be available for the EMS Mevin site. We should be, if the commissioners believe that that is worthwhile uh, to, to proceed or to, to pursue, I should say, uh, we need to be negotiating that price. We do have the cash funds to be able to pay for that. Uh, and if nothing else, even if the construction is delayed, there is value in obtaining the site uh, because the one that we have seen is strategically valuable from a call volume. <coughs> and the final piece I would say that are priorities out of all this plan is to go ahead and get quotes for that Human Service Center HVAC project. That does need to be done. We've got the engineering design work done, but if the board is supportive and that makes that is a sensible project to you then buddy needs to put that out for bid so we can we can get some prices so we'll know exactly what we need to be thinking about that is a debt funded project i would imagine an installment loan of some kind i would very much like to have i'm talking both you gentlemen i guess um replacing the whole apparatus or call it whatever you like versus um Band-Aid? Yeah, the Band-Aid that we're talking about well, now. This here is replacing like 14 of the air handler units with new units. But you can still get parts for the others and use the air handler to last 20, 30, 40, some on 50 years. So the, we had engineers went through and looked at everything in there and this is what they came up with that needed to be done. And plus to put new controls on it so we can go online and be able to adjust temps in the whole building. And also, this corrects the airflow and everything in the same day surgery with a new duct work, new unit, and brings everything up, and then plus a backup board for the entire building. This is pretty, pretty thorough, a pretty thorough plan for the HVAC system for the building. And, uh, you know, obviously we would be bringing the quotes back to the commissioner. So if we, if we go ahead and tell Buddy to put it out there for quotes, that's because we're thinking, I think we had looked at this project is being debt funded in uh, October October of this year uh, we have the capacity to do that so if, if we put it out for bid I think what I've heard is the companies to respond because this is a pretty big project they would they would be interested in it but we would want to know we have a pretty good feeling going forward that we're going to do the project yeah because this is a big project to quote um, or come to come in and look at and price it have taken probably a month or two to price it together to do it. So this would in large part be replacing many of the components, just not the old the ten year old burner, a boiler rather. No, the boiler's not being replaced, this is adding an additional boiler. Correct. The boiler's fairly new for boilers concerned to how they last. The chiller was replaced when we did the T menu renovation back when they did the courthouse and the roofs. That was done back then. And it's Chillers have a normal lifespan of 20 years now, so you got should have another 10 years on to that before it needs to be replaced. And I think it was what 250,000, 270,000 dollars when that was to replace the chiller. 
10 years ago. <laughs> Is that the last time that you've done any maintenance on that building? No. I, wait, have you done any maintenance on it in the past two years? Yes. Uh, we just got through replacing the air handler unit of the whip. It was part, it was going to be included in this new thing, but it, it got to the shape that we had to go in and replace it. Mm -hmm. And now we need to put the controls on it so we can actually control it because right now the thermostat only runs the fan, keeps it going, but then the VAV boxes, which control the heating stuff, they're mm -hmm. not hooked up to anything. You have to mainly shut valves on and off, chill water, hot water, control the heat. And mm -hmm. That's in the lab area of WIC and part of it is, you know, where they see clients and stuff. Right. So the 1.5 million would bring all that up to date. Yeah, it'll bring the whole building up to date. It sounds like this uh, one piece that would be maybe medium life is the, the current chiller that's 10 years old now and should have at least another 10 years and was about $250,000 when we replaced it. That was 10 years ago, of course. So that, that would be something 10, 15 years from now we'd still be looking at. But I think this project would bring H, HSC into pretty good line. Uh, yeah, and so we could have control of the whole building. Which is for as many people in our new class they see <coughs> and what they do for kind of critical to be able to control people. Can I just ask you one yeah. question? Don't, don't, just stop it. Okay. It is going to be with Cliff and the Sheriff. It's about the stepping up initiative. This has been going on three years, right? About three years? Okay. And Brian, you just mentioned that the building um, that they're looking at over there possibly could not even be big enough for the services they're going to be doing. Now, right now, when somebody walks into your jail, Steve Kinter does an assessment, and it's determined if this isn't what they need. We need to get them services for mental health illness or whatever that looks like. Then they go over to RHA, right? Near the mall, back in the back. Okay, what's going to be the difference in that process as far as if you have this? So, right now these services that are being offered uh that are planned to be offered in early services are happening at rha over off of Aunt elizabeth drive near mm -hmm. um, the hollyville mall so rha is our vendor we've signed i think a three-year contract with them to be the crisis and diversion center uh service provider law enforcement can go there and drop uh folks off rather than take them to the jail or take them to um, the ed and i believe there's work afoot to try to do the same thing for ems so the EMS could drop folks off at um, the diversion center as opposed Correct. to taking to EMS, I'm excuse me, to the ER. So right now the services that are being provided, that could be provided here, are being provided at RHA. The thought when this project was started was if you could get RHA into a county owned building where there would be no rent, they wouldn't pay as much. We pay them with our own mental health money to offer that service that they could expand their hours. At the time, they were only Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Obviously, the community would like it to be 24 hours that you could do mm -hmm. law enforcement drop-off or walk-in if you're having a mental health crisis. In that, since that time, before they were able to move into this building, RHA worked with Cardinal. Cardinal, I don't know exactly how they did it, but they expanded their ability to bill, and RHA was able to figure out a way to expand their hours I believe they are now 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday and they're also open Saturdays and Sunday so before the, the thought was you move here you reallocate rent money into paying people to be there to keep it open more they already have gotten a way to figure out how to keep it open more and I think the sheriff's office just got a Bureau of Justice grant that for three years is going to pay for those hours to be extended till midnight every night so it's really becoming closer and closer to being 24 hours without going into this building, right? That's, that's good news on one hand. The RHA building is not the greatest building, if, you, if you're familiar with it. It's, I mean, if you've ever been inside of it, I've toured it a couple of times, uh, there's some value to me in just repairing it and painting it and making it nice. But I think they have some space issues too, although there is an upstairs part of that building that I don't believe is leased. So once we did the design work, we just did this a couple of months ago, did a walk through with all the RHA people, looked at the floor plans. Uh, we're using the same architect designer that's doing the Petrie building. And it was determined that you just, this place just isn't big enough to get the services in here. I don't, 
remember now if uh, RHA is going to lose services they currently offer if they move into here. But to me, the best news of all of this is they're going till midnight now. Right, the, the service has been expanded significantly, even without going in here, because Commissioner Thompson has taken a very long time to figure out how to get into this bill. But in the meantime, RHA has determined how they can expand the service. It it does have a connection with what happens in the jail, with the with the stepping up pro, pro, program in the jail. I'm not probably the best person to try to explain how what happens at the jail if they determine people have a mental health issue, how they get them over to the diversion center. I, I'm not well, sure. I know there was an issue with who pays for transportation, like Burlington PD, all the different law enforcement areas. I'm just saying if we're we're doing this, expanding hours, I don't, and you're saying, I, I would never vote to remodel a building that's not going to work for what you're wanting to remodel the building for. I mean, I just can't. I mean, I, there's no way because that's been done many times before. It's like talking about across the street. You cannot look at adding them to a courthouse and all that stuff unless it is absolutely the best possible way to spend your money. And you won't go, God, I wish we'd have done this. You just can't pick up a building and move it. So I have a lot of questions about that. I know the importance of this. Jake Harris and, and the other guy that go out in a plane car and do deal with this because this is this is not a jail situation but it's an accountability situation big time because there's usually a victim in this somewhere and i just um I, I just i don't like to spend money on something that i don't I, it's like remodeling one room in your house and you think this will be it and you look at everything else and, it, it, uh, and you end up doing the whole house i'd rather put that money wherever it's going to be done for that program to be done the way it was created to be done that half uh, halfway, I almost said something I shouldn't. <laughs> oh, uh, this mask has turned me into a radical, I'm telling you, because I can't breathe good. But the, just halfway of doing stuff is unacceptable because we don't have, I mean, there's the COVID ferry and then there's the tax ferry. And I, I can't ask when I hear about people, the difference in people struggling to pay their property tax, and then I hear the millions that they can't pay for the EMS somebody's not paying which means somebody else is really paying and if we're going to spend money on the backs of people it's got to be right and totally awesome and everybody wants to be part of it but i don't i'm not hearing it out of this building well i, I think once the rha is surveying the other stakeholders that have been involved in this project for a very long time which includes law enforcement as well as the, the other mental health people that are particularly on the jack committee mm -hmm. and that's what they're trying to find out is how would people feel if this building were renovated, but it really couldn't host everything that you want it to host. If, if, if we get survey results back that say we don't want that, then we've got $1.2 million in a Cardinal Innovations Grant that is specifically for capital, for a mental health diversion center. We can't spend it on anything else. We'll, we'll start thinking about what else, where would it be better spent? The, the maintenance of effort money, those are the funds that the county is required by law to spend on mental health every year. We have some that we have banked. So those funds will have to be spent on mental health services, either a program, my suggestion would be hold it with the with the cardinal money and see what happens is does RHA say we've actually found a better location right then maybe we could put the cardinal grant and our MOE money into that facility that would work better I'm not writing off elderly services because you know there's been a lot of work there's been so much talk about this building for for <laughs> probably four years plus yeah. I was on Jack and I'm yeah. thinking you know if you focus everything on to something just because it is just something then you still don't get what your big vision is sure. okay. well that, I don't I, uh, the I'm not, I, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer because that's not it I just <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I want this done right because mental health is a hot mess you're, you're and we have got people that are struggling and I mean, it's it's big, big time drug addiction in this county. I wouldn't want a drug courtroom. I mean, well, I'm making wishes because I'm just telling you, I, it's just got to be done right. I agree, and I think that's what we'll we'll hopefully hear from this survey effort. And it may not be elderly services, and if it's not, then we will bankroll our uh, our bank capital funds and and work with the community on wherever they want it to go, right? wherever else it might go. Um, again, I think. The, the questions that I'm listening to here, if the commissioners think are reasonable today, is should we should we organize uh, the court administrative group to start talking with us about what the what a planning process would look like for 
court building and JV out. Does that sound reasonable to the commissioners? Should we bring you back some type of proposal about a Medicap? Who should go in there? Will they fit? Lease versus purchase, right? And we, we would need to do that in time before July 31st. So we'll either renew the lease or look at purchasing the building. Uh, I can I will bring you back if you want to hear it. Uh, negotiated prices for the EMS Bevin site that I believe we have cash that is available to pay for that. And then we would uh, send Buddy out. This was a little bigger because if we send Buddy out to get quotes for HVAC, we really should plan to borrow the money to do the project simply because it is a detailed project. It'd be, it'd be tough to bring uh, companies in to do the bid and bid on it and then we don't do it. We don't have to do it, but we do have the capacity to borrow the money to do it. So. You'd bring that back when? At our March meeting or would it be April? I think the, uh, uh, the Medicap we could bring back in March. The EMS Bevin site we could bring back March 15th. I don't know that we could bring back quotes that fast because we have some requirements through Randy and purchasing to lay that out there that it might take 30 plus days to, to meet the statutory requirements because of that dollar amount. So I could bring them back as soon as possible, hopefully sometime mid-April, but uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Susan. I think I know there are some requirements for us to lay it out for bid for so long. So. And boy, I'm, I think we ought to have these that, these numbers. Do you agree? Absolutely. I agree. Do we have companies in Alamance County that can do what you're talking about? Uh, there's probably companies can do part of it. I don't know if they can do all of it. It's but just so important to use our county people yeah. with businesses. Well, we try the best we can, but yeah. something like this, it'll have to be advertised. Okay. So yeah. you'll get people from all over the state and probably other states depending on this project. Well, I know from my fellow. I'm just going to say I know from my fellow commissioners that you feel like you've been drinking from a fire hose today. We've had the benefit <laughs> to look at some of this over the last two years and, and in bits and pieces. Um, we've been trying to move a lot of this forward. A lot of it, it's all needed. And uh, um, well, you know what, Mr. Carter, if we didn't have a, a new high school to build, we'd have plenty of money to do this. <laughs> That's what I'm looking at. That was good. <laughs> if we didn't have a school to build, we could do all this and do it right now. Well, then we wouldn't be able to. Uh, that's that's a whole different legal. I issue, understand. <laughs> I understand. I'm just saying, like, you, it's like Miss Thompson was saying, you, know, yeah. you got to be careful about how you spend your money, mm -hmm. so you don't frivolously just throw it away. That's right. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Do you have a drawer? I didn't know you had a drawer. Yeah, that's that's essentially my question. Are we being careful? Uh, I'm not looking. <laughs> capital expenditure requests that are going to come from the school system both in this budget cycle and you know, two, three years out. Uh, are, we, are we considering those expenditures in addition to this capital expenditure plan? Yes, uh, our capital financing plan is three separate pieces. When we first started that process, we talked about combining everybody's money together. It was quickly evident that's not a good idea. So the county's plan is completely separate from ABSS, who is completely separate from ACC, and they've all been tailored to ensure that for the education pieces, there's enough money to pay the debt on the bonds for all $150 million worth of bonds that, uh, the, both, that the school system has proposed, as well as a set dollar amount for their PAYGO capital every year. And I think we've been working on a seven-year time frame. So the plan that you'll see between now and the 15th and on the 15th too will show you, for ABSS for example, our plan can afford to give them $3.3 million every year for PAYGO capital, right? So that's their cash that they can spend on they usually average spending a million plus just on fix-its around the school building, toilets and playground mulch and those things. They also have, that gives them some dollars for non-bond projects. And then the bonds themselves, the education bonds. Uh, yes, I, I believe the capacity is there. Our piece is completely separate from, from the school. But if we get a request from the schools for additional funding, we're going to have to fund that. Or we're making a decision about funding that versus this, perhaps. We have a choice of funding it. Right. That's true, and I think as we as we have these discussions about this, um, the financing plan for ABSS and ACC, some of the things we're looking at, like should we take a premium or not on the bond debt, uh, how much capital reserve, if any, do the commissioners want to have available for ACC and ABSS, those will be questions we'll be talking about, because I'll be listening for feedback from y'all about do you like premiums or not, do you want to issue all $150 million worth of debt or not, the premium may cover some of that. And then uh, as far as capital reserve, what's a comfortable amount to have in capital reserve? 
to make sure you know some of these funding sources in the ABSS uh, funding plan in particular are a little more volatile. It's sales tax and lottery funds, right? Mm -hmm. So you, it might be a good idea, and we'll talk about this, to have some capital reserve just to make sure if we start a recession we can still pay that debt. But it's, it, the board may also want to have some funding in there to pay for things they ask for beyond education bond uh, capital projects or their um, annual pay go. Those will be more, I think, philosophical questions for the board. How supportive you know, do you want to be of education capital? So our plan, I think, is going to, based on the fact we're seeing some great interest rates, really, really good interest rates, sales tax dollars are coming in, as you'll hear in a moment. So the, the capital reserves have the potential to build. If the commissioners really have the ability to say how much do you want them to build. Keep in mind, that additionally, that interest rates are likely to change and they're not going to change in a positive direction. That's right. Well, the price of gas has changed in the last five to six weeks. Well, the good news is we're issuing a significant amount of this debt here very, very soon. I mean, $167 million out of $189.6 million very, very fast. So uh, the interest rates we're seeing now are good. Our, our Davenport folks seem to think they're going to still be good come April 20th when it's time to issue. So that's all great news for us. I'm still hopeful that we'll get a credit rating upgrade. I think that's possible. I mean, that will help us. Uh, so, you know, again, I think when you, we'll go through this with you and show you how the capital plan might grow, but then the commissioners will have to direct me on how, how do you want it? Do you want capacity to do other capital for the schools, right? Or do you want to just hold it to $150 million, $3.3 million a year? Plus, they're, they're getting a lot of money for COVID, too. I think it's 34.5. But that has restrictions on what you can use it for. So. I'd like to, to that comment, I'd like to add, and this is just a request, but uh, school system will be coming before this board in April with our budget hearings. And I really want to know from the school system in advance of those uh, hearings how much COVID money, how much money they've had, where it went. I really want to know some particulars, and I assume the rest of the board would support that. Yes. If it's any consolation, uh, me and Commissioner Thompson sat in a meeting last time in which uh, they did produce those numbers for us to uh, show us. COVID numbers with and without. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that the school board will be um, presenting those to us. Yeah, uh, They have done it the way you asked. But I'd like to have it in advance of the budget here. Absolutely. I sure. agree with that. What, like maybe the next meeting? It'd be wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Mr. Hagan, I think you're next. Again. Well, if, uh, just, just to be sure, we're going we're gonna to organize a meeting with the court leadership I'm going to bring you on the 15th. At least two options for you to consider about Medicap purchase versus lease and who we might would put in there. We're going to uh, get on this Medin site, negotiate a purchase. And I'm, if, if I'm hearing correctly, I'm going to go ahead and authorize Buddy to release this HVAC um, quote process and get quotes for that project. Board, I agree. Is everyone else? I do. That does not. You're not agreeing, guaranteeing you're going to issue no, it. No, no. But I understand. I'll bring it back to you. But it does give us enough to go ahead. I'm good with it. I think we're all good on that. Thank and you. just to ask, Mr. Ambulance in the back, you are <laughs> you are right on for having Mebbin locations because I am. Don't you think having yes, you need a site? Yeah, we okay. need absolutely. Okay. okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, I've never seen you leave before a meeting was done before. <laughs> hey, Thomas, we'll take notes and send them to you. Don't worry. <laughs> what I, what I call Dan, Thanks to Scott Ward, I'm going to be able to watch it online. Awesome. I have a meeting in Burlington at 5, and the dog has been taking it all day. <laughs> I'd like to call the meeting back, I'd like to call the meeting back to order. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's great. Yeah. Thomas is good. He's the best. <laughs> little comic relief. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm going to go through this uh, this demonstration here for you today. This is a revenue forecast for fiscal year 21-22. It, it actually pertains to two of the budget amendments that are on the agenda for you to consider the Parks yeah, Athletics budget amendment and the occupancy yes. tax budget amendment. And I felt like it was appropriate 
to give you an overview of our revenue forecast. This is not only a report, this is the result of a significant amount of data mining and work by Andrea and Susan to look at lots of information behind the scenes in county government to try to give the commissioners what we think is going to happen this year and it's based on this moment in time. So please note, this forecast is our best estimate. There's a and $166 million worth of revenue, there's a lot of room for wiggling here. But this is what we think is best, and I think, I feel like this info will at least help us guide our decisions uh, going forward for the rest of the year, especially in some of these things that we're interested in possibly bringing back. Um, uh, our finance and budget folks usually are looking at trend analysis and prior year information uh, when it comes to revenues, and they get a lot of input from department managers. What are the department heads actually see and what's happening at the department level? They generally know best if there's a problem with revenue or if revenue's coming in really, really high in their department. EMS is a good example. So uh, just, a, just an overview of our big picture revenue. We budgeted $168,620,279. As of the end of January, we've collected a little over 126 million. That's about 75% of the budget. We're forecasting a total revenue at this moment, at this point, of $175,030,986. That is $6,410,706 in revenue over budget, more revenue than we had planned for. Majority of that is sales tax. But I'm gonna go through these different sources and I'm, I'm gonna try to move a little fast, but any questions? Uh, I will stop and get the two experts here that have really mined this data out uh, and hopefully between the three of us we can answer any questions that you have. So just this is an important point I think to take away. We budgeted 168.6 million. We're at 126.6. We are forecasting 175 million. That is 6.4 million more money but of that 6.4 please note only a little over a million of it is really unrestricted that we can do whatever we want to with. The rest of it is tied to lots of different things and I'll show you what those different things are. Something to think about, you currently have budget amendments that bring back 161 to 721 for occupancy tax and we'll talk about occupancy tax but those are from our uh, hotels and they have to be spent on tourism dollars. We budgeted a 50% decline it's running more 25 to 30 percent decline so as those dollars come in we want to budget so we can go ahead and pay them out if they come if they don't come in we don't pay them out so we're not we're not going to supplant them and the athletic program budget amendment for thirty thousand dollars this would use uh some of that new sales tax revenue so 30 what, what you're being asked to do at the budget amendment time is budget thirty thousand dollars in unbudgeted unrestricted sales tax revenue to pay for uh, youth athletic programs. Brian Baker is on the Zoom and will explain that at budget amendment time. We have some other future considerations that I think might be able to be considered April, May. Right now is not the time. Capital, our capital equipment plan, this was, uh, we normally buy a new ambulance every year. We usually buy uh, a QRV vehicle every year. We buy share cars every year. We have uh, mostly vehicles in that plan, 704000 Our $250,000 PAYGO CIP that, that has not been funded this year. We cut library books $130,000 this year, and we cut farmland preservation $75,000. I would suggest to the commissioners that if come April, May, these revenue trends are looking good, we may want to bring some of this back, but again, that all totals up to $1.1 million. That's too much. I, I just don't feel like that's a good move to make right now. We'll, we'll be back and we can talk about it, because all these are important. But here's kind of what happens to the flow of the revenue. Unrestricted sales tax, we're, we're looking at about $6.1 million in excess revenue. Real, uh, real property transfer tax, $367,000, and registered deed fees, $104,000. But on the downside, the shortfalls, we've got some shortfalls in Sheriff's Department revenues we'll talk about, parks and library fees, CECOM revenue, our investment earnings, which uh, Susan Evans will be talking to you about in just a moment, but that's, that's a big one. We do have a property tax shortfall that I will talk about here in just a moment. EMS, health department, and then the biggest one of all is unassigned fund balance, right? So when we, when we balance this budget, we budgeted three and a half million dollars worth of our savings to, to fill the gaps, to make the budget work, right? I would suggest to you that we should consider revenues cover that. We really don't want to spend our savings. So I, I've basically just taken that off the table. You take it out of the excess revenues. This is not, we have not looked at expenditures, please note. 
we usually cover that unassigned fund balance between what people don't spend and the extra money that we bring in. We have only looked at revenues. This is a rather conservative way of looking at it, but I would just rather say that three and a half million dollars worth of revenue should be off the table until later on in the fiscal year. We really don't want to spend that unassigned fund balance if we don't we don't have to. That's where you get the one million eighty four thousand two hundred forty four dollars in completely unrestricted uh, revenue excess of budget right now. The property tax revenue, uh, we budgeted $100, $100 million. That was about 3% higher than last fiscal year. In the January, we had collected 91.6, which is 91.53% of budget. And we have met that target. We're, we're at 91.5%. Uh, what I'm showing back here, though, at 400000 429 the 29 is from the forecasted amount, so that's really just very, very close to what we thought it was going to be. But the $400,000 shortfall, I had a discussion with Jeremy end of last week. He indicated to me that we had received notice from the state that because, and I hope I'm saying this right, and I bet Jeremy's watching, so he'll come <laughs> if I'm not, because the value of the real estate transactions that are actually happening in the county right now, property here is selling much higher than we have it valued right so crazy. right now this is a hot hot market and it has been even, even in Alamance County it has been for a while uh, this has bearing on how we the state taxes properties like railroads cell towers uh, uh, commercial gas type facilities so the state wants the county in order to encourage the county to revaluate they're going to take four hundred thousand dollars from us Right to, to pay back to these companies. That is my understanding. Jeremy, as you listen, if you hear me saying something wrong, please come up. But we've gone ahead and fact, we've gone ahead. Uh, do you want me to jump in? Is that Jeremy? <laughs> awesome. Jeremy. Yes, yes, please do. Well, so what this is, is the Department of Revenue, they track our values in relation to the sales prices every year. And this is the first reference year that they use to equalize the public service companies, such as your railroads, your telephones, your gas pipelines, power companies, etc. And basically, we've had just wonderful market growth. So that's that's a positive thing. That's a good thing. The downside is that that's going to cause us to equalize on these public service companies. They're going to try to adjust them to take into account that real property is is way below market. I mean, we're somewhere around 81 percent of true market right now, and it's not that we've moved; it's that the the market since rebound has continually grown. Uh, so that's going to create a shortfall for us every year off of the public service companies until when rebound resets that to 100, the public service companies would reset to 100. That's asking that What is the next reevaluation? Jeremy, did you hear it? We're scheduled for 2025. Uh, now, I don't think we're going to be at 2025 because one of the other things that this report does is it will accelerate revaluation cycles. So basically, they're saying that if your values get too far distant from the market, you need to go ahead and do one and catch up. And we are pretty much in that range. Uh, which is something I would like to, to address with the board at a future meeting just to talk about what our situation is there. Well, I was just looking at some numbers this weekend and they're projecting a 9.6% increase in Alamance County property values in the coming year. 9.6% increase. Jeremy, if we are so good, then why do some people want to take 400000 of our dollars? <laughs> See, I don't know. That That's a horrible thing. In all seriousness, what happens is that Personal property gets reassessed every year, and so they're always at market. Real property right now in Elements County is every eight years, which is why we're lagging behind. We're at 81% because our values have been constant even while the market's been growing. For public service companies, they're assessed by the state. We don't do it here in Elements. We bill and collect them here, but they're assessed by the North Carolina Department of Revenue. This is good because they can be consistent statewide. These are large networks of assets. Uh, problematically then, they're in different counties and some counties are at higher percentages, lower percentages. Uh, and, and one of the rules to kind of keep them somewhat consistent is if you get within, uh, by, by this year in the cycle, if you're at 90% and below, they go ahead and start making adjustments to them. 
to, to say that it's, it's not fair to them if one county is way over assessed, way under assessed, they make adjustments in either direction to try to keep them as close to that middle as possible. And who is they or them? They is the Department of Revenue. Mm -hmm. Oh. When they do their assessments, it will come out in September. They send us a file that we use to generate our bills because they assess the public service companies. It will already be docked. It will be reduced. I think last year, Jeremy, weren't we talking about moving from eight years to four years? That's right. And this is uh, really part of the discussion we had last year. This, this topic came up. And at that time, I predicted we would probably be reduced this year. And uh, it, it's not that I'm great at making predictions. It was just very obvious that we were right on the borderline. And, and unless the market crashed, we were going to cross it. So, so that's where we're at today. So I will say, commissioners, we have factored that four hundred thousand dollars into the one million dollar excess. So it's it's accounted for, but we need to be aware of it. We need to be thinking with Jeremy about should we speed up our reval process, and part of that will have a budget implication. But um, to just move on quickly, sales tax revenue. Uh, we have restricted sales tax that's specifically for school capital. We have Medicaid hold harmless that we do not budget. Uh, because it's one it's unpredictable and two we may wind up at the end of the year having to give it back so it's uh, money that we don't usually count toward our budget and then we have unrestricted it's sales tax those are those are dollars that we get to actually uh, budget and use for any purposes yes. that we want yes. so when you look at uh, when you look at sales tax we are currently at a 26.4 million dollar budget we've collected uh, 15.3 million we're forecasting 34.1 million. There was a typo on this slide uh, earlier that I shared with uh, the commissioners. So right now we're projecting um, 7.6 million dollars, almost 7.7 .7 million dollars sales tax to come in, and that is only through. We've only gotten in through four months. We actually got in this morning, I think, uh, the December sales, which I, I didn't really have much of a time to look at. I heard it looked good, but did it look very good? Okay, well, that's good news. So. One question I just read about Belks mm -hmm. filing bankruptcy yes. and just really pray they make everybody needs Belks. They're the anchor of every mall. I'm not hard, kidding. Hard to imagine that. I know, really that's just know. not going to happen. How does that, like, I'm seeing all this money and then we look at what we've gone through with the pandemic and I know everybody's ordering online or, or stuff like that. How does something like a Belks? How does that hurt us? I mean, that's a big hole. If that, God, I hope they don't have to go through that. I hope they make it. I'm sure there are business consultants and economists that are that are working feverishly for uh, private business right now, trying to figure that out. Because to me, as a layperson consumer, it feels like the market has shifted some to this online model. Maybe not so much brick and mortar, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, Amazon people. Well, that's why they went Chapter 11. They went for reorganization. They don't plan on closing. Yeah, yeah I just, I just hope they come out of this big time okay. Obviously, this is good news. We we adopted a budget that was 20% lower. As I, I've said numerous times, we we've, we've even made some mid-year amendments to unrestricted sales tax. If you recall, we hired the new sheriff's office positions and we reinstated the county employee merit program. These these were all came out of uh, unrestricted sales tax and have already been accommodated. So that's all been factored into this uh, million dollar excess revenue. So our current budget, 26.4 is the amended budget. Uh, so you don't look and see if there's anything really good to bring out of this uh, that you haven't already heard. I think this pretty much covers it. We, I'm sorry, for our forecast method, we used actual revenues from December of June of 20. So that's how we, that's how we're predicting. Our budget was 20% decline. To forecast, we've used actuals up till we had November, now we have December. And then we used 1920s actuals, not the 20% that we used for budget. So we may bring in significantly more money than that. We're on a trend, if we believe post-COVID trends, to bring in even more sales tax revenue than we did in 1920. Wow. I think we were at, with November numbers, we were at 11.7% higher than 1920 as opposed to a 20% decrease. So this is a conservative estimate. A million dollar total overall is conservative. It may be more, but we will track it and report as we as we see it actually develop. We uh, have revenue to come from other taxes and licenses. This is where our occupancy tax uh, comes in, as well as some others. I'll cover on the next slide. The bottom line: we believe we're going to have about a four hundred seventy-two thousand dollar excess uh, additional revenue overall in this revenue category. But again, these. 
particularly for occupancy tax and uh, vehicle rental tax to part, a lot of these revenues are ones we collect and pay back out. We do not supplant. If the revenue doesn't come in, like occupancy tax or vehicle rental, part and, uh, and the occupancy tax folks just get what we get. They don't, we don't add to it. Uh, the, real, the real property transfer tax is exceeding. Uh, part is not meeting its target, but they will get what we get for them. Uh, occupancy tax is, is exceeding, that, thus the, the uh, budget amendment. Uh, ABC and heavy equipment rental are exceeding, and franchise fee uh, is not. But overall, in this revenue category, 472000 and a little more excess revenue. So that's overall good news. Uh, again, please understand that I say good news. This is the projection. This is the forecast. Unrestricted governmental. This is a, a one-time dollar amount. Uh, that we get from beer and wine tax we usually get it in april uh, we have not received it yet but we believe that we will and our forecast is that it will go up i think mr thompson mentioned a moment ago about uh alcohol well, everybody's partying that's after sales yeah. <laughs> so, uh, that's, based on, that's based on that's based on 1920s actual so yeah. we're, we're going with the 1920 actual on this restricted intergovernmental this is one of our most complicated uh revenue sources the current budget uh and, and it's because it's it's either uh, state or federal programs or grants and we'll quickly run through it but again if any questions please please stop the budget is 27.2 we've only collected 12 million but our forecast is to collect 27.4 so we think we're going to collect a little bit more we're going to be very close on this uh, revenue source based on our forecast uh, and this you can see how each one of them break down sheriff DSS and we'll run through these quickly all these all these types but again, we're looking at about $224,000. That is right. That could be swing either way, but our forecast says we'll at least uh, be even or maybe a little bit to the good with restricted intergovernmental. Uh, this includes uh, COVID relief funds, but not CARES Act money. These are funds that have come to specific departments, I think like health, EMS, that we've had some departments get specific grants as well as FEMA monies. Uh, these are full reimbursements. So we're, while we haven't collected all of it that we budgeted, we expect to get every uh, every bit of it that we budgeted. Parks Department has a $1.7 million grant that's uh, restricted intergovernmental. They've only received 88,000 of it, but they've indicated to us that the remainder will be collected uh, before the end of the fiscal year. So we're forecasting to get those dollars too. Did you uh, say it was from COVID? No, no, this was a grant, uh, oh. a parks related grant. So it's, it's restricted intergovernmental because it can only be spent, I think it was uh, state funding that can only be spent on the specific project it was applied for. We just haven't received the reimbursement for it yet, but we expect to and forecast that we will. <clears throat> uh, the library, the library uh, had some restricted intergovernmental funds that we believe are gonna be short about $25,000. Those funds are from the state, if I'm not mistaken, and they go toward library operations and they did factor into some of our excess revenue. So. Uh, the state gives us funding based on the library's budget. If we reduce the library's budget, they reduce their funding. So we, we, we did factor that into some of our uh, uh, county revenues. We have some pass-through grants where we just get the funding and give 100% of it out that comes through restricted intergovernmental. Transportation and home care community block grant are those types. Whatever we receive, we'll give out. We're projecting that we receive we will receive uh, the 100% but if we do not, uh, you know, that'll be the, the misfortune of those, those agencies. Part of this ACTA and things of that sort. Yes, indeed. ACTA, ACTA is a transportation group. And then we have uh, family, family Abuse Services and Friendship Adult Day and several other groups in the Home Care Community Block Grant. And you know how important those are. Yes, indeed. Yes, you... uh, especially Meals on Wheels. I did a ride along with them at their invitation years ago and that was really something I've that's, never done that before. that's mind-blowing mm -hmm. until you're in that position you don't know how valuable that is we have to think about our seniors these are two other paths pass-through grants from uh, juvenile justice and PEG is our pass-through grant we receive that goes to the city of Burlington for their uh, TV station they do like a, a TV uh, public information type thing they do web and TV based so we give them a share of the um, grant money that we receive for that purpose Public safety SROs came in a little bit above where we budgeted. Uh, th these are some of the shortfalls that the sheriff's office is seeing according to our books. Court-related fees is a shortfall of $109,000 in restricted intergovernmental, as well as the U.S. Marshall Program appears to be down. 
Uh, but uh, the sheriff is making up for this in another way. I'll, I'll show you. If he's not holding U.S. Marshal folks, he's holding state misdemeanors. So sheriff works very hard to keep his revenues well, but they're two different revenue categories. So, Brian, uh, has the court-related fees down because of COVID and how court has been put off and put off and put off? That's That would okay. be my, my assumption. Continuations yeah. are just unbelievable. So the, we're forecasting those to not to not meet budget, right? Anything you see in red is forecasted to not meet budget. Anything you see uh, in black is we're either, we feel like we're gonna meet budget or be in excess. ICE program's a good example. It's a guaranteed revenue per the agreement. We haven't received it all. It's in this restricted intergovernmental category, but we know that we receive it per the contract with the, um, with the federal government. Uh, emergency management assistance, these are um, reimbursement grants that we expect to receive all of them. We do believe we will be a shortfall in CECOM. This has to do with the City of Graham leaving us and going to the City of Burlington. And then EMS, uh, EMS has a Medicaid cost settlement of $250,000 that we have not yet received, but we expect to, so we're forecasting to see that and it will be used to offset their fee shortfall also. Lot, question on the city of Graham issue with it leaving Seacom and going to Burlington. Burlington's on a different communication system. Yes. So how and Graham's on Viper, correct? Not anymore. Not anymore. They okay. they've left the Viper so they system they and are I think on the Tron system now. So they refitted everybody with a different radio system. I believe so. I, I, I believe that is the case. Wow. I know that. Uh, um, my understanding is when they left went to the city, they were going to Tron, and they had some concerns about the Viper radio coverage. So thus, you know, it spurred us to say, how is coverage? Hmm. So lottery funds, lottery funds are budgeted. Uh, we have them, but we have not recorded them in such a way that gives us credit for having them. We will do that, so we know we'll have those lottery funds. Uh, so they, and they are restricted in our government. Also, the health department uh, has some funding and restricted intergovernmental we think might be short, but that, we're projecting a shortfall in these funds of $61,000 plus for the health department restricted intergovernmental. But I actually think if we spent a little time with Jan, we would probably be able to drill that down. But Tony's staff has been quite busy. We've had a hard time nailing them down to talk about our revenue forecast. So, now, wasn't that in dental? Was that, do I remember correctly looking for the larger report, wasn't that in dental? We, there's another, another slide for dental. It's a, it's, it's a different, uh, it's a different um, okay. revenue category. Uh, sales and services, we're forecasting a shortfall in this revenue category. Um, a, little, a little over a million dollars EMS ambulance fee will be primarily that. A lot of that has to do with code. I was talking to Ray earlier today, especially early in this fiscal year. EMS uh, saw a drop in transports. Yes, sir. And uh, that all COVID related, once people became afraid to go to the hospital, the number of calls dropped off tremendously. So we, we believe there will be a shortfall Medicaid cost settlement will help with some of that. Uh, the health department fee, there's, the, there's your health department um, clinics are seeing a shortfall of 281,000. Again, that and the health department fees, we believe have to do with COVID, particularly the clinic. It was closed for a couple of weeks, but the clinic's dental revenues are still gonna um, exceed their forecast expenditures. They've been, they have been making money at the dental clinic uh, for the past several years. So. Again, all of these, all of these shortfalls in sales and services um, are accommodated in that overall figure. Well, the dental clinic self-funding, so it is. Yes, they do have their savings. So if they really fell short, if their if their expenditures were to go over their revenues, they have funding and savings that they could they could cover that. We do have some small shortfalls: passports, library, athletics, and uh, some DSS state way. But that dip, difference dip in the uses of of EMS um, due to COVID. So where were they going? The doctors or just instead of so, self-transporting the doctors? So we really don't know. So EMS revenue always operates on kind of a 90 to 120 day lag from right. the date of service. So stuff that happened in April, May, June had a big effect on our revenue, Right. you know, July, August, September. We've seen a, for December and January, where we were like 500 transports short for a couple of those months, we were running 150 transports more than normal. 
So we think as the fiscal year progresses, we will see an increase. Wow. But I don't think that's accounted for in this because it's, it's still just a little unpredictable in, in how that could be. So, um, so, yeah, it was kind of weird. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, nobody wanted to go. And then as it progressed, we saw that erase and it seemed like everybody needed to go to the hospital. And so that, you know, the hospital saw that as well. Mm. This is basically the details of the slide that I just went over, so I'm going to move on. This is where uh, Sheriff gained some ground on his detention fees. Uh, uh, his budget in, th in this particular revenue category, uh, we believe he will exceed uh, by about $183,000. Uh, this is his uh, state misdemeanor. And then we have uh, some parks and library fees that we will see the shortfall on, again, details. License and permits, building and permit inspection, we expect to see uh, additional, some additional revenues, but that is restricted to only being able to be used for the inspections department and the register of deed fees. We quoted it as one of the ones that's helping us in the bigger picture. Uh, with about $104,000 we're forecasting will be additional funding. Our investment earnings, if y'all can still last with us, you'll hear about investments <laughs> too. But shortfall, 581,000 investments, you know, we're required to be safe, liquid, and compliant. And there is not much interest right now on uh, on those type of investments. So Susan will speak to that. I will not dwell on it, but we accommodate that five hundred eighty-one thousand dollars shortfall uh, in our overall bigger picture. Miscellaneous revenue. There's like forty different things in here that range from a five, four or five thousand dollar pro, uh, projected amount up to about two hundred thousand. Suffice it to say that we are projecting that we'll be a little bit short, but that's still pretty pretty close and a lot of these revenues and miscellaneous are restricted also the last piece uh, the landfill uh, landfill budget uh, they're projected to be over budget with their revenues which is good news they've been very busy um, they're they have investments also that have also been hurt in the investment market and our health insurance fund and our workers comp fund these two funds are uh, uh, guaranteed by the general fund so for each employee, the dollar amount per month is in each department's budget and it gets added to the health insurance fund or the workers' comp fund, whether there's an employee in that spot or not. So uh, those funds, we're projecting those revenues will, will arrive as, as budget. So I know that's a lot of information and quick. I think the last, this is it, last line. Just to take away at this point, after a lot of analysis uh, and, and forecasting and projections of our overall revenues, I think the, the fact that we're bringing in 6.4 at least, that's a conservative estimate on our sales tax revenue excess. I think it will be more than that, but at this point, to forecast, we're using 1920 actuals instead of the 20% decline. I think we've got a little over a million dollars in unrestricted excess revenue. Understand that is taking 3.5 million out to cover our savings, to just ensure we don't spend safe. Thus, I would tell you, it's, it's in my opinion, it's safe and reasonable to fund the thirty thousand uh, dollar parks request to bring back new sports, and the occupancy tax dollars will go to the occupancy tax right. uh, funded groups, regardless. Right. Tell so, me what that is. So that's uh, we we tax folks that stay in the hotels, and 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 that county gets I think three percent I believe. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And then it's required by law. There's statutes that dictate where it must be spent. Uh, I can't remember now. There is a percentage of that revenue that must go to the Tourism Development Authority. And one third. Yes, sir. And the county takes a three percent commission for handling that money. Was it more than that? It is. It's one third for the county and two thirds for the um, TDA. And we take an administrative fee. Is it three percent? Three percent. Just, just questions. revenue, just for us handling it. Then, uh, as Susan said, a third goes to the TDA. Two thirds go to TDA. Two thirds go to the TDA. To now, what's the TDA? Yeah, I don't know you little deviations. Do you want me to explain it now, Brian, or when I present the budget amendment? Yeah, well, it's a, uh, go ahead, go ahead, please. Okay. So the Tourism Development Authority okay. um, was enacted <laughs> by legislation in 1987 that gave the county the ability to collect the 3% occupancy tax. Um, and through that board, they are tasked with marketing the county for overnight stays here. They were set up to have 3% of the collections go to the county for administrative purposes and then one third of the, that is for the county to invest in tourism related um, agencies. So our historical museum, you'll hear about these in just a few more minutes, but historical museum, the African American Cultural Arts Museum, 
as well as our textile museum now in Glencoe, they receive, in the arts museum, they receive a portion of um, the occupancy tax that the county has as the one-third share that funds their operations. And then the other two-thirds share then goes to the Tourism Development Authority for them to market the county and run their operations. So I bet if we had a Great Wolf Lodge, that number would really be a lot higher. Yes. Yes. It's another. We had what? A Great Wolf Lodge. Oh yes. <laughs> I don't so know how many times I got to talk about that? Go ahead. Just a final comment. I think at this point. I would not recommend that we bring back any of these other expenditures that we might consider later. Uh, that's just very close. That's making sure, I mean, expended, unspent county dollars will help with this too. But at this point, revenue only. I would say if the commissioners feel comfortable with the budget amendments, that's very reasonable. Those are fairly small amounts. I'm glad to see that we do think we're going to have this million dollars after we cover, particularly the fund balance. I never want to spend our budgeted savings, never. Um, so anyway, I think that's a, that's a good takeaway from this, uh, and we'll continue to monitor it, and we'll continue to report, although I'll probably summarize this down a little bit more uh, next time I present it to you. Mr. Hager, do you have items number 8, I think it's 8.1, 8.2 in our agenda. Do you want to do those while you're up? Unless the commissioners have any questions about this information that they've seen. Did the library get their book my bill? Yeah, uh, they did. They, they did fundraising, and I believe they got a, some grant funding too to pay for the bookmobile. Yeah, yeah the bookmobile is it's being built. It's any day now, they think. We just need a motion. Oh, okay. Just need a motion. Delivered. Just to plug for them, the library is like the I best kept no, secret okay, in a county. They one play one. so many roles. Yeah. I just always want them to be yeah, funded. To yeah, yeah. Here. Move them down there. Okay. He's not watching us. Um. Okay. Commissioners, we have the thirty thousand uh, dollars that was withheld by the previous board uh, last year because of the sales tax uncertainty and so forth. And Mr. Haygood, I think you're suggesting we put that back in so we can have sports, uh, juvenile youth sports uh, coming up this spring. Yes, and Brian Baker, I know you're with us. That's base that's baseball, softball, and did I read that was going to be a spring basketball program? Also, just real quick. Yeah, it's, it's basketball and baseball, softball. So the thirty thousand dollars that are that are that is in this budget this budget amendment, we are budgeting unrestricted sales tax, in the amount of thirty thousand dollars to bring back spring baseball and softball and a spring form of youth basketball. The, the youth basketball was ongoing. Now oh. uh, we just didn't have the money when we started it, and so we're hoping this works out. <laughs> Lisa's being honest, I love it. Brian, I love it. what was your million seven hundred ninety dollar grant for? That's for land acquisition for the okay. Creek Mountain Natural Area. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. That'd be great for basketball. Hey. <laughs> yeah, just just don't lose the ball down the hill. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> And folks, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, reinstate that thirty thousand dollars. Second, sports. absolutely. We have a motion, second. Any discussion? I do have a question. Yes, just minor. The thirty thousand—that's just that's uh, provided to pay for salaries for umpires and stuff like that, and facilities. I believe so. That's, uh, is that youth uh, right. officials and equipment? Yeah, the, the breakdown uh, for this season is a little different than normal, but most of that money is going to part-time. We really wiped out our part-time at the beginning of the year, so we ha are required to have field supervisors and gym supervisors at uh, ABSS sites, which we primarily use, and we weren't funded for any of those. There's also costs in there for equipment. We're having to take on some additional, you know, expenditures we need catcher's gear for every team whereas we used to share but with COVID that's not a great call so <laughs> some of that in there but primarily most of those funds will go to part-time at our facilities Brian that's the it. thing that you and I and Dr. Thorpe met about about um, after school with parks and recs mixing together is that just going to be next year possibly we're going to do a pilot program that has been on hold for some time because they've had their hands full and yeah. we have to do but mm -hmm. still on the table hope so any further discussion there being none all in favor signify by saying aye uh -huh. aye all opposed unanimous brian while you're there occupancy tax that's just another motion is it not it is um 
because I, Susan had that information. We're asking for it to be uh, occupancy tax dollars to be budgeted in the amount of one hundred and sixty-seven thousand seven hundred twenty-one dollars. Is that? That's correct. Mm -hmm. And this would be uh, we would pay these funds out as indicated in the budget amendment to the recipients that were approved as part of the original budget process for county government and for these funds. So um, if we receive less than this dollar amount, we won't pay out any more than we receive. So. And I would encourage, I'm sorry, I would just say I would encourage all the commissioners, if you haven't been up to the um, Textile Heritage Museum up at um, yeah. Glen Raven, yeah. be sure to go up there. The Knolls have done a fabulous job. Mm -hmm. They run a really sharp exhibit uh, and museum area and uh, stuff that it's really interesting. A uh, great place to take a child and let them see some of the history of Alamance County and what we produced out of here from a textile perspective. Well, do we have a motion? I got a question. Question. Uh, Mr. Haygood. Yes. I I'm just, I'm going to ask you a question and don't think I'm anal. I am just don't, don't understand. <laughs> uh, this occupancy tax, is it a debit or a credit to our ledger? I have to defer to uh, to Susan on that. So. Um, it would be both. What you see in the um, what would occur minutes, first? What would come first? What would what would occur first? The I debit was, or the credit? The credit for the revenue coming in, and then the debit with the expense going out. And we're just we're basically just giving this money back to them because we uh, collected it for them. Right. And now we're going to give it back to them. Okay. Just making sure. Uh, I just didn't see. Um, I just want to make sure that I know it's a sort of a dumb question. I apologize. I don't know the answer to that question. So. <laughs> but I know it doesn't matter. Question, I know it washes, but I just didn't know. I, it looked to me that the money would come here and then we would send it away. Yes. And it's a wash. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Mr. Turner. Quick question, uh, Mr. Turner. Is it the intent that the funds that we, that we send out uh, as a result of this occupancy tax? Is it sent to organizations which drive tourism for the county? Is that the intent? So I think uh, Brian could help us speak to this. <laughs> two, I think there are two facets to spending occupancy tax dollars. It's either spent directly on uh, something that helps tangibly drive uh, heads and beds, right? or something that could be considered yeah. okay. well, to just, accentuate those people's check. experience okay. while they're here in the county. So if you're uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, is that, is that accurate? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're right, all the funds are intended to be yeah. spent to drive tourism. And so the two thirds that go to the Tourism Development Authority, um, those are more focused towards advertising and promotion. The other one third that the county keeps, there's pretty broad discretion in how those are expended, but it is intended to drive uh, visitation. Is there any evidence that the recipients of these funds drive tourism? Great question. Yeah, so we do track their uh, visitation at all of these facilities. We ask them to provide that information each year when they apply, and how that one third of the county money, how that county money is expended, is a it's a board decision, and it'll be a decision you'll make in the upcoming budget. So you'll have an opportunity to look at those uh, attendance figures and see what kind of visitation they're driving, and make decisions on that basis. And obviously this year we projected this 50% decline from 1920, so we didn't invite anyone new and we kept it very, very uh, routine. In fact, the uh, groups that normally receive these funds obviously were very concerned because they use this for everything from salaries to program calls. So when they heard the county was projecting a 50% decline, that was, that was pretty spooky to them. But they will be back. Uh, at budget time, there'll be some of the outside agencies that come and present uh, during the April um, April dates that everybody will come before you. And that'll be their opportunity to explain to you what they do and how they drive business. And if we have any new ones that are interested in it, they would be able to come too. So. <clears throat> do we have a motion? Um, I'll make a motion to approve. This is for occupancy. Mm -hmm. right. uh, I'll second. Yeah, motion second. Any, any further discussion? Being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Unanimous. Thank you.
Oh, yes. <laughs> Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, my presentation this morning, uh, this afternoon, we're going to kind of <laughs> run through, um, but please, if you have questions, feel free to ask at any time. Um, so I'm presenting this afternoon our investment and cash report for the periods of July 1 through December 31st, 2020. Um, so where all of this starts is in North Carolina General Statute 159-3 that establishes our local government commission and they are established through the state treasurer's office to help provide oversight to counties and municipalities for annual budgets, audit, internal controls, debt management, pension and other post employment benefit reporting. And one of those re reporting requirements that the county has to follow is the LGC 203 report, which was established in General Statute 159-33.1. That requires the finance officer to submit a report of our financial information concerning the unit or public authority. And that's for cash and investments that are held on December 31st and again on June 30th. Our reports are due on January 24th and July 25th, I'm sorry, July, January 25th and July 25th, um, as set by the State Treasurer's Office. And for our December 31st, we had net cash and investments that totaled $138,561,107. Of our deposits, we maintain a central depository, meaning that Alamance County utilizes one deposit um, account for our general fund, our capital reserves, capital project, and special revenue funds. We have escrow accounts that hold our unspent bond and installment loan proceeds, and we have enterprise accounts, which is our landfill fund. Our total cash and deposits as of December 31st were $24.7 million, and that does include our certificates of deposit. Our bank utilizes a pooling method, which means that our depository is secures all of our public deposits collectively by establishing a pool of collateral with the state treasurer's office. So by the state mandating and setting up the LGC, there are laws in place that help safeguard our funds for counties and municipalities. So within that general statute 159-30, it gives the county, the unit or municipality, we can invest all or part of our cash balance of any fund. Um, finance officer is in charge of managing the investments and I follow the restrictions that have been set by the governing board which are found in our fiscal policies as well as looking at our cash flows. It is managed for liquidity, not necessarily a cash investment earning. So within general statute 159-30C, we are authorized, um, it gives the parameters of what counties can invest in. Um, but we take that one step further and look at what is the fiscal policy that the Board of Commissioners have approved. And per our policy, we are able to invest and have money that's on deposit with the North Carolina Capital Management Trust. We can invest in U.S. Treasury securities as well as U.S. agency securities, and some of those examples are on the screen, as well as commercial paper. Within our guidelines, um, they are to be invested with an emphasis on safety and liquidity and yield is also a second consideration. And no more than 50% of the county's investment funds may be invested in any particular investment vehicle with the exception of the North Carolina Capital Management Trust. And no more than 25% of the county's investments may be invested in one U.S. agency security. All investments have to mature in no more than 36 months from their purchase date. So we do not go for 10-year treasury bills and things of that nature. We stay to three years. So of our investments in December 31st with the Capital Management Trust, we had $72.6 million and that does include our landfill post-closure account. The reason why we like to have funds there is that any amount can be invested and it is the most liquid. It's not time restricted of having to have funds on deposit with them for say six to nine to 12 months. If we deposit funds say on Monday and we need them due to cash flow on Friday, it's very liquid. We can have those funds transferred to our central account and continue with business. Commercial paper, as of December 31st, we had $43.2 million invested there. Our restrictions there is that I can invest in no more than $5 million with one issuer. And it's moderate liquidity. It's normally within six, nine, or three months. Um, and I keep that kind of on a rolling 
um, method, and we'll get into that a little bit more. And with U.S. Treasuries, that's your long-term investments. It's more time restrictive, and normally go out for three years or longer. So our investment methods, we look at cash um, needs on a weekly basis, and we evaluate our current investments at that time with the amount that we have. We receive daily rates from our broker firm. We use uh, UBS Financials. And we look at commercial papers, and that's where I was talking earlier. We have it on a rolling method. So if I'm having a commercial paper that is maturing, say, today, I'm going to look out three, six to nine months at our cash needs of that time and just look at investing that same amount to roll forward. If it's a week where we have payroll that's due, then we would normally just keep those funds, leave everything else where it is in cash management and use those for our cash flows. So our investment earnings, um, we allocate those into the central depository and then based on the individual cash accounts of those accounts and those funds, we are dispersing those out. So for general fund interest, we had a budget of 700000 and as of December 31st, we had allocated $96,000. Um, we basically saw a steep decrease in our interest rates. It's kind of a two-edged sword um, where you want that low interest rate for our debt service and our debt needs that we were talking about earlier, where you kind of miss out on is in your investment earnings because low interest rate on a loan is not going to give you your high return when you have investments. So we did see a decrease there sharper than we thought that we were going to experience this year. Um, I will say that last year, we had invest we had a, an investment um, budget of seven hundred thousand and we actually brought in over 1.1 million in investment earnings so that shows you the impact that COVID has had on the county and investment earnings across the board so if there are any questions at this time i'll be glad to entertain them Everybody's looking over at Mr. Lashley. Well, I do. I do have some questions, but I don't want. I don't want. As best as I can. I, I think I've dug a hole for myself too much for asking dumb questions earlier. You have a calculator out. I don't have any questions. I'm, I'm fine. I, I, I have something, but I want to ask you later. Once, once. Uh, I was going to ask you. Why? Why do you um, choose to invest? Uh, in, the, in, in paper? It's a safe investment. Um, it is one thing that, and I will say this, on all of our investments, we have not lost any of the principal amounts. Um, so like this morning, I purchased a $1 million investment. We actually paid, interest rates are horrible right now, <laughs> but I mean, we paid less than, you know, a $1 million for that. So when it matures, we will gain that money. So we are not losing any investment. Um, and it's, it's safe. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's very low risk. Um, even in North Carolina, we are limited to the commercial paper that we can invest mm -hmm. in. So where we are normally investing in commercial paper are through um, either other governmental agencies have gone in with us with banks. Um, it's mm -hmm. more of a financial market or a larger utility company versus someone investing, say, in Apple with having a commercial paper. Um, we are looking more at, um, we've had in the past, we've had commercial papers with universities. We've had commercial papers with Exxon. Um, your stable Toyota Motor Corporations, um, stable things like that where they have their funding and their banking side so that we're looking at that financial investment. So you're basically, just, just for the public's uh, mm -hmm. interest, you're basically using these uh, this paper to um, to help you with your cash? That's correct. We are looking at that as a way to earn additional um, interest income for the county mm -hmm. um, and it's idle cash, so it's either you put it to use to, yep. in, to earn some interest back for you, or it's just sitting there doing nothing. Um, and commercial paper, we invest there because it does normally pay higher than the North Carolina Capital Management Trust, but you bear, we're able to still have that liquidity mm -hmm. with the Capital Management Trust. So I normally leave about 50% in cash management trust, mm -hmm. 
and then look at 50% to see how we can do with commercial paper or other vehicles of investment. All right, so you're basically just parking your cash until you need to use until it and you're it. putting your time frames out there. Okay, my cash comes due on this date, mm -hmm. I'll get out of the bar bond market on this date. Yes. Or paper part. Yeah, they can't take any risk. Well, I was going to say, if you want to start trading oil futures, we can start doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. How often do we how often do we look at different banks and and that sort of thing? Um, so a different bank as far as having a special depository is something that we look at anywhere from five to seven years. Um, it's it's a very long process for changing a depository and setting up new accounts, um, but that is something that we will probably look at in the next um, one to two years. When do we last look at that? I don't have that information before me this afternoon, but no. I can let you know. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I used to do some of that at the bank. Oh, yeah. You just said I spent $1 earlier yeah. than that. Like I just went to Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, did she say what I think she said? <laughs> we invested oh my a million. Gosh. <laughs> nice. Yes. Okay. Girl, you got a big checkbook. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Say good. Um, the budget amendment. County capital projects. Have you previously covered that, or no, no, Mr. Chairman? We do have one budget amendment left, and plenty of watch. I can speak to the to the details of this. So, uh, we had budgeted two hundred and seventy four thousand eight hundred and seventy dollars for the JB Allen courthouse roof project, and uh, that was completed for a cost of two hundred five thousand three hundred sixty two dollars. So we had $69,508 remaining. That project is completed, came in under budget. And we also had a project, a roof replacement at the historic courthouse. Roof was, uh, project was originally budgeted $174,208, but was completed for a cost of $146,903.60. And the uh, budgeted uh, remaining was $27,304.40. So what we're asking to be able to do is to take those two leftover amounts right, that were from those two roof projects, they totaled $96,812.40 to be able to use them at the HSC. A buddy mentioned a moment ago that one of those uh, we had to replace, uh, was it an air hammer, I think, buddy, yeah. for one of the areas in the building, was it Wick? Yeah, for the Wick So we replaced that. It was part of the 1.5, it was just so bad we had to go ahead and do it. We would use a portion of those $96,812 to pay for controls for that air handler. The remaining balance, which uh, I don't remember what that is off the top of my head, but the budget amendment lays it out, would go into a holding account for the $1.5 million HVAC project that we just talked about. So we take this two leftover projects, pay for controls at WIC, and put the rest of it in a holding uh, account for the HVAC project at HSC. Yeah, until we can get that done, unless something else comes up that's in line in that project and needs to be done before we actually get it bid out and the work ready for it. Yes. So this doesn't take any extra dollars from the general fund. This is taking two the leftovers from two projects and putting them toward the WIC project at HSC and the balance in savings to hold, to be ready to put it toward the $1.5 million project. Motion to approve. I got a question. Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, it's an easy question. It's just it's just a matter. I'm actually trying. I'm, I'm new to this job. I'm actually trying to get my ducks in a row here, and this is what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to point fingers at anyone. Sure. Uh, these two budgets that you have here for the uh, Allen Courthouse and the Historic Roof Project, am I right? Yes. Were these two projects were these two projects done with borrowed money? No. This was so. no. These were uh, we were. In, I think we were intending to borrow. That that's why I ask. I I looked at some notes that I found about something and I didn't quite understand it. That's why I'm asking the question. We had a, I think we had an original project budget of five million dollars. Okay. Yes, yes. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm <laughs> speculating, and the someone knows more. The reason is because we had a plan for five million, including this big HSC HVAC project, and um, it takes longer than you expect. COVID hit, but he had about $2 million worth of active projects ready to go that he could complete. So we decided to postpone the HVAC project 
and brought back to the board the $2.2 million as a possible loan. And the board at that time chose to designate or to use unassigned fund balance That's right. for that purpose. That's right. And because of that entire process, we may have one more budget amendment before it's over to clean up the, um, the way we handled the budget at that time. I so just mentioned that. Just to, just to clarify, uh, you borrowed the money from the, un, the, the, the balance, your, your, uh, your savings account. Yes. You chose to do that rather than go out in the marketplace and borrow the money. That's correct. Okay, so in essence, this money, this hasn't cost us anything mm -hmm. uh, no. to do this. Uh, just making sure, you know, because if we if we borrowed it, I would have a little bit of different uh, idea. But I, I think it's. Uh, I'm just asking a question because no, I looked at I looked at some notes before the meeting and saw something I didn't quite understand. And when you saw, I thought it looked like it was borrowed, but I, I couldn't see the back part. That's I think that I was our intent, mm -hmm. and we wound up paying cash. So. Okay, excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> I appreciate it. I'm good. Any other questions? No. You wait, no. No, not this kind of stuff, uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? We have a motion and second. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Who are these shocked that we have anybody holding on to sleep right now? Yeah, it's like 10 people. Do really? We have any? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, was say, I, I was gonna buy each of them a fifth of liquor. I just said I would be shocked if everybody was still holding on. I'm and just kidding. Oh. And just to add probably. to, hold on John, just one second. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Just to add about the court system and, and how you saw some deficits in red while ago for things like that. ABSS collects fines and forfeitures and that's sometimes about $750,000 a year that really goes. And if that's behind, that means those they're not going to the school system. So everything is in the same bucket. It really is. It's all connected. So we have to realize that. Sorry, John. Yeah, not a problem. You, you're indica you've indicated there are no public speakers. Right. Is that correct? <laughs> 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 uh, Tory. And commissioner's response to no speakers. I assume there are none. <laughs> well, I do have one uh, question for the sheriff. Sheriff, we, talk, uh, we had a, a, a statement by a citizen about donation of uh, surplus vehicles to ABA, uh, to, from, from the sheriff's office to the uh, community college. Can I know one of the issues that we have is uh, those cars, a lot, of, a lot of cases, need repairs and whatnot, and so uh, processing them through their, their mechanics department to be used as training vehicles for that and then donating them to the to the BLET program That's correct. to be used and for vehicles for training. Yes, sir. Those vehicles are vehicles that are, are basically worn out. Oh, yeah. Uh, and Crown and Vicks in a lot of cases, weren't they? Give them to them to train our officers and officers going through the BLET program. They have a mechanic shop over there that fixes, makes these cars safe and then they're used for a period of time. Uh, you know, in driving uh, uh, pursuits and stuff like that, training our officers uh, and officers all over the county. Any <laughs> prediction on what we, I, and I know I didn't ask you this in advance, so I, you may not know the answer, but any indication of what we might be able to market those cars for if we didn't use them this way? Oh, I'll be glad to tell you that. We've been sitting, you know, they sold the proof on Gov deal. We could have sold the car to the metal company and made more money than we made off of them buying them off of the Gov deal. Well, you've been generous before to give to DSS mm -hmm. too. Yeah. So yeah. You've been given to like social workers and stuff. You've been generous yeah. with well, DSS. The cars that, that are, are, are half decent, we you know we hand them down to other mm -hmm. agencies. They're just not uh, uh, good for high pursuit if we have to do high pursuit driving in dangers. And I assure you, uh, they're over hundred some thousand miles, and some of them two hundred and some thousand miles. So basically, we're taking a almost zero asset oh, yeah. and creating an asset. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's exactly right. Yes, sir. We'll see it. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Absolutely. You. I would like to make one additional comment. Sheriff, this is not yours. Oh, okay. um, over the um, moratorium and the hundreds of calls, emails, and everything else I've received, I started asking some of those folks that called in in, in the snow camp area, what about the snow camp drama? 
and the built the restaurant that burned down and the just crumbling nothing that's left out there for what used to be a really nice restaurant mm -hmm. and all that and I'm encouraging every any and everyone in the snow camp area start spending part of your efforts and you're so well organized put your organization together and rebuild that snow camp area and the drama and use it you have been using it in a positive sense and you've got dust now use it to rebuild your area and the historic value to that area a number of you talked to me about the historic value the uh, the just the history of that area and this county please use those efforts in a an additional positive sense to restore that you may have to form an LLC a nonprofit or something but find out what you can do and put your efforts together to recreate that it'd be a tremendous asset to this county anybody else it might get benefit from some tourism dollars yeah, yeah exactly. absolutely right. absolutely i just want to re re tell somebody you brian if you don't mind i had mentioned about um doing a retreat of all places the landfill i don't mean like a retreat <laughs> <laughs> and uh but like to do a orientation because I went out there for about three hours I'm gonna ride in that thing it goes back and forth across that track that is amazing oh my gosh but I think it, it's the most amazing place I've ever seen and Richard Hills just he's a real rock star and, and everybody out there that works and that's a real proud moment and time for our county what it does for our county when brings all kind of stuff here so as soon as you can get I know only two of us can do it at a time and I've already been out there and he gave me the royal tour mm -hmm. I would love for all of us to know just how great they do a good job sure. they're real leaders and they're a financial producer they bring money into the county yep. well right now when they inhale you they say you smell that and I go well, yeah go, no that's money <laughs> so they got a whole different mindset Hey, county commissioner, commissioners, uh, managers, excuse me. It must be late. <laughs> yes, I have, I have no Is this a record? I, 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 think I probably believe it's one of I've think. been here. Our historian emeritus, Tim Sutton, should be able to give us some insight into that. <laughs> He's not here today, and he wouldn't have waited this long. No. He might have. Uh, the question is, where's the Tim when you need him? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Um, Do we have a motion? We, we I'll a make a motion that we go home. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a county manager's report? Or he said no. Oh, no, no. Good. Okay. Good. I did have one question about the uh, some comments that have been made about the SROs. Um, I said when I first got elected that I wanted to see an SRO in every school before I before I retired, and it looked like last year we might be getting close to that, but we're not there yet, are we? Uh, I was told that uh, as far as the county schools uh, that is supposedly in the budget for the full far out elementary school, we can put an SRO in every school. But that's, that's all I know. I can't speak for anything else other than what I've been told. We well, heard was, four at the meeting. They're, they're serving up four after they said 17. Okay. Right? Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Sheriff. Yes, sir. How many elementary schools need SROs? Four. That's it? Yes, sir. That's why they chose four. What other SROs in the high schools would you choose? I mean, what high school need SROs? We got SROs in every one. Every high school. And, and the, I'm talking about as far as what the sheriff's office cuts. Right. That's what I'm Can't missing. speak for the city. That's right. the four in the county. That's the four in the county. Yeah. So we probably should have to do, should we ask the uh, folks in the city? I mean, well, that will come up at budget time. Well, their high schools are covered. Williams is going to have two just because of the logistics okay. of that building, and that's from PD and middle schools, too. But um, elementary is see, the younger you start building relationships with law enforcement instead of hearing stuff on TV or, or movies or anything like that, it's just so much better to build those relationships Absolutely. and with the families as well. And the biggest part is the safety. Mm -hmm. So. So those would fill out the county then with the four they're proposing? Yes, sir. 
but well, they're not full time. Right. Like some of the elementaries are not full time, right? They're not right now. Right. With those four, they yeah. will be. Yeah. Good. Okay. So if they cover them, my jurisdiction. And commissioners, we'll we'll all face that at budget time. Sure. People. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. Thank we you have all. a motion on on the table and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye and leave. Aye. Aye. <laughs> aye. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on Local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.